Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see title. What if Naruto rivaled the Romans and conquered the ancient kingdom of Rome? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. The crew had been walking inland for some time in search of a city, a town, a village, anything. In total, there were 30 men. 17 stayed back at the ship to guard and repair it, while the others embarked on an inland exploration. Six of them were armed, four were responsible for carrying barrels and sacks, and one was dressed more formally, while the rest resembled typical sailors in ragged attire. After looking around for a while, the group stumbled across a dirt path. This was good, as the path probably led somewhere, and they started following it. They walked along the dirt path for about half an hour. The midday sun's heat drenched them in sweat, and the scent of damp earth filled the air. It appeared that it had rained here while they were enduring a storm at sea. Thus, they walked, until one of them gave an exclamation of joy. They had spotted a city. Seeing the city, the group hurried to the city gates. But they were stopped by people who appeared to be guards, and they were questioned. What is your business here? One man, who appeared to understand the language, whispered to another man who seemed to be the leader of the group. After a moment's thought, the leader whispered into the other man's ear, who then spoke. We are explorers and merchants, we seek an audience with your lord. The guards laughed at this and replied, Well, why do you, strange looking people, think the daimyo will want to hear you? One of the guards replied mockingly, eyeing the ordinary, dirty clothing of most of them. Once again, one of the men whispered something to the leader. The leader smirked and gave orders to the men carrying the sacks and barrels. The men came forward and laid in front of the guards all the items. Precious stones, pearls, and spices were stored in the sacks, although not in large amounts. There was also a barrel, full of a red liquid. The guards examined the items. They had seen such precious objects before, but these were still different, especially the red liquid in the big jar. The guards nodded at the group, and one of the guards led them to a large, well decorated, and luxurious building at the center of the city. As the group made their way to the palace, they couldn't help but notice the people in the streets staring at them. It was probably due to their strange clothing and looks. Everyone in this land wore different clothes, and the merchandise in the market was also very different. Inside the palace, the daimyo of the land of earth sat on his throne, leisurely eating fruits from a golden platter. The daimyo was a slightly obese, short, clean-shaven, and was about 40 years old. Around him sat his secretaries, advisors, and ministers in their respective places. When a guard entered the chamber, and informed the daimyo. There are some visitors who wish to see you, my lord. The daimyo told the guard to let them come, the latter bowed and left the chamber. A moment later, some thirteen men entered the court. They bowed respectfully to the daimyo and one of them spoke. Greetings my lord i hope you're not annoyed by our sudden appearance the daimyo nodded the man continued these people are explorers my lord and come from a distant country they've also brought some gifts for you the four people carrying the sacks and jars came forward and placed the items in front of the daimyo the latter stepped down from his throne and began to examine the gifts there were precious stones some jewels pearls and fine silk clothing one of the foreigners who was formally dressed, opened the jar, in which was kept a red liquid. The daimyo fetched a goblet and filled it with the red liquid, then proceeded to taste it. The daimyo put the cup to his lips and drank the red liquid. His expression told he liked it, and took another cup. The daimyo was pleased, and asked the group. So, where do you people come from? The daimyo looked at the leader of the group, a staunch, tall man with a mild beard and light skin. One of the men, who had speaking the whole time, came to his aid. These people come from a distant country called Rome, my lord, they can't speak our language. The daimyo then asked. How come you know our language? I am from here, my lord, a fisherman. They rescued me after a storm, and I soon learned their language. So I can help them. The daimyo was satisfied with the answer, but curiosity could be seen in his eyes, he commanded. Your leader and this man, who knows both our languages, may come to my private chambers to talk during the evening. The guards will escort you there, but until then, enjoy my hospitality. 
Saying this, he walked out of the chamber, while several guards took the party to a guest house, where they were given food and water. The strangers found the food odd, rice and meat, with many local vegetables that were unknown to them. Moreover, they were given two pieces of stick to eat the food. Some tried to use these two sticks, while others just ate with their hands. They were also offered a white colored drink, but the group couldn't decline. The drink was intoxicating, and they were told by the fishermen that this was called sake, an alcoholic drink. During the evening time went by, and soon evening came. As agreed, the leader of the group, and the fishermen who could work as a translator, made their way to the daimyo's private chambers. The lord of the land of earth sat on a sofa, with some fruits in front of him. This part of the palace directly overlooked the city and its walls. The daimyo invited the two inside, who bowed in respect and seated themselves. The daimyo first spoke. Let's start with a formal introduction. I am Lord Asahi of the Land of Earth, and you? The daimyo looked at the leader of the group. The fisherman spoke to the leader in his tongue, got a reply, and answered on his behalf. This is Captain Marcellus, commander of our ship and here to represent Rome. Talks soon started, I will narrate this like a direct conversation between both the captain and the daimyo. So, what is your purpose in coming here? We set out from Rome to find new lands on this side of the world. Be assured, my lord, Rome only desires trade and good relations with your people and you. I am only the captain of a ship, so I can't speak much on behalf of the Senate, but I can tell you about our nation. The daimyo nodded. I am interested. We have completed our objective of finding this continent, my lord. I will inform the Senate of your decision. We request your aid to prepare for our journey across the sea once more. The daimyo nodded and gave his word to help the foreigners in any way he could, as part of his hospitality. Before parting, the daimyo also presented gifts to Captain Marcellus. By the way, what was the delicious and intoxicating red liquid you presented to me back in my court? The daimyo asked as the captain and the fisherman were leaving the chambers, the captain and fisherman whispered to each other, and then the latter spoke. It is an alcohol, my lord, called wine. The daimyo was satisfied, and the captain and the translator left to join their party. The following weeks were spent preparing for the journey back to Rome. The foreigners bought provisions and supplies for the long journey ahead and also spoke with the daimyo, telling him about Rome. Finally, the day came when they were to sail away. The thirteen men, who had enjoyed the daimyo's hospitality for so long, bid farewell to their host and made their way back to the ship. The thirteen men were walking back to the ship along the same dirt path they had walked the day they had reached this land. It was morning, and summer's heat had not arrived yet. The weather was cloudy, it seemed as if it would rain. The party walked past an open field, where they witnessed two bands of warriors fighting. But then suddenly, one of the warriors jumped up into the air, and below him, the earth itself raised to the sky. Some other warrior spat fire from his mouth, another altered the earth itself while the others did extraordinary things the men had only heard of in tales and legends of old. The group was amazed and terrified at the same time, and they hastily made their way back, but even on the way they couldn't keep their eyes off the fighting shinobi. The party reached the ship, where they soon prepared to sail away, but before that Captain Marcellus questioned the fishermen. Who were those warriors we saw while on the road? The fishermen answered. They are local warriors known as, shinobi, I had only heard about them. This was also my first time seeing them with my own eyes. They possess extraordinary abilities as we saw, this is as much as I know. The captain was amazed by this but soon made his way back to the ship, the fishermen will stay here. As the ship sailed to the horizon, all the crew only had one thing in mind. What a strange land! While back in the palace, the daimyo of the land of earth anticipated the arrival of more foreigners and tried to paint a picture of the distant land they called, Rome with the information he had got from these explorers. One year had passed since the foreign explorers arrived in the land of earth, and their memory had started to fade. But then one day, as the people of Hitsuma, the capital of the land of earth, were going about their daily business, there appeared several dozen ships on the horizon. As the ships got closer, it was clear they intended for the city's harbor. But as the ships got closer, they abruptly stopped just outside the harbor. From one of the ships, a boat was let down, and in that boat was a man clad in armor, his helmet had a red plume, and a sword hung from his waist. The boat alone made its way to the harbor. Meanwhile, the daimyo had been called and informed of the situation. 
The daimyo recognized the ships and was soon present at the harbor to welcome the men on the boat. The small vessel reached the docks, and from it stepped out several soldiers, with one man who looked to be their commander. The soldiers all wore the same armor, a mail cuirass with leather straps, a helmet made up of different pieces interlocked together, and leather sandals. Their shields were tall and cylindrical, with the same patterns on them all. They also carried short swords. While two of these men wore plate armor over chainmail, and a helmet that completely covered their heads, leaving only small holes in the front for seeing and breathing, they also had metal shoulder pads and were covered head to toe in armor. They carried two handed swords that were currently resting in their scabbards. The daimyo greeted the man in a friendly manner, and both went into a private chamber to talk in privacy. The ships were allowed to harbor in the city's docks. The private chambers were quite luxurious, with candles lighting the room, platters of fruits, and a jar of sake placed on the table in the center. Incense burned in one corner of the room, while the walls were decorated with paintings. The Roman commander and the daimyo sat down facing each other, near the table. All the servants were dismissed from the room. The daimyo started the conversation. I am Lord Asahi of the Land of Earth, and you? I'm Commander Vitellus, here to represent the Senate. I must say, your palace is quite beautiful. Vitellus answered, glancing around the room. He was a tall, compact, 35-year-old man with a light beard, and weed-colored skin, and had a commanding presence. The daimyo chuckled and replied, there are benefits of being a daimyo. The commander nodded in agreement, the daimyo continued. Coming to business, what do you intend to do here with so many ships, Commander Vitellus? The latter replied. We wish to trade and explore this continent, my lord, and don't wish to start any hostilities with you. The daimyo looked out of the nearby window that directly overlooked the harbor, and folding his hands, replied. Well, why have you brought troops then? Well, to trade we need to establish some presence here, the commander continued. For that, we plan to establish a colony here, in your city. Don't worry, it's only made up of some ambitious merchants and a few artisans, you'll be comfortable with them. We also want free harbor for our ships in your ports, for now. The daimyo looked hesitant to allow this, and asked directly, What's in it for me? Commander Vitellus briefly closed his eyes and nodded to himself, a genuine question. Then, leaning forward and joining the tips of his fingers, replied. Wealth. Lots of wealth. You see, trade is important for income. The merchants that come here have many connections in the wider world, and they can easily expand your trade connections to the far ends of the world. Moreover, we are ready to pay you 50 kilograms of gold in stipends, throughout the year. And if that is not enough, the soldiers we have brought here are always present to aid you in any defensive conflict. The daimyo was impressed, and asked, any other demands? Yes, we have heard of mysterious warriors in this continent, called shinobi. May you tell us something about them? The daimyo thought for a while, and then began to speak. The shinobi are warriors who can utilize a special energy inside us called chakra. This chakra is very powerful, it can heal almost any wound, but it also has a very destructive power. There are many shinobi clans, where the members are related by blood. These clans are made up of professional warriors, and the children in these clans are trained from childhood in the art of war. Moreover, each clan has its special abilities and specializations, like how the Inazuka make use of trained hounds in warfare. Many clans also have special abilities exclusive to their bloodline, like the Hyuga's Baikugan, which grants the user extreme visual prowess to even see through solid objects, or the Uzumaki's healing abilities and chakra chains. These shinobi clans were essentially mercenary clans that anyone could hire to fight for them, until now. Vitellus raised an eyebrow, until now? The daimyo nodded, and continued. The Uchiha and the Senju, the two most powerful clans in the continent, have banded together to make one political entity they have named Konohagakir no Sato, in short Konoha, which means, village hidden in the leaves, which is situated in the land of fire. Fearing the combined power of the Uchiha and Senju, Many clans have opted to join Konoha, while others have decided to band together and create their shinobi villages, like Kumogakure, Kirigakure, and Omegakure. These villages are essentially made up of local shinobi clans. The formation of hidden villages has completely knocked off the power balance in the continent, as the shinobi clans you could once just hire are now only loyal to one nation. I plan to help establish a shinobi village here as well. 
Vitellus took a bite from the apple in his hand and spoke. A shinobi village here as well? That is good, we can help you with organizing the village. The daimyo smiled and replied. Well, that is very nice of you people. I have a location for the village in mind, and many clans have also agreed to join the village. But, the daimyo went and opened a drawer in the room, took out a map, and laid it out on the table, pointing to an area in the far north of the land of earth, he continued. This area is governed by a local warlord, who used to owe his allegiance to me, but has rebelled with the help of some mercenary shinobi. I currently don't have a force to counter this rebellion, but if you could, you'd receive many benefits. Vitellus looked at the daimyo with keen eyes, like what? I don't know, perhaps tax exemptions for the colony you're planning to settle here, free access to all the cities in my land for your merchants, and perhaps help you introduce yourselves to the other nations in the area? Vitellus took a sip of the sake that had been served to him prior, and commented. This thing is intoxicating but too bland. Anyways, I am ready to help you squash this rebel warlord if you'd grant us all the privileges you mentioned. The daimyo laughed, well, it is agreed then. There is some empty land on the outskirts of my city, it is good land and has not been settled yet, so your colony can be built there. Vitellus smiled, thanking the daimyo, bidding him goodbye, and going back to the ships. Somewhere in the northern land of Earth Lord Hiroshi sat in his villa, leisurely eating some grapes. He was an old man, with an average height, lean, with a mild beard and mustache, and the roots of his hair were now getting white. He was the warlord who had rebelled against the daimyo and was very confident in his ability to win after getting no response from the daimyo. Hiroshi's city was nestled between the mountains in the northern land of Earth, near the coast, and it was only connected to the outside world through three mountain passes each going in the opposite direction. Suddenly, a guard came running inside Hiroshi's room, panting. What's the matter, boy? The young guard, after catching some breath, replied. Th there is an enemy army made up of strange looking soldiers outside the city. They're at least 1000 and wear odd armor. Hiroshi straightened his back upon hearing this, but then again leaned back on his chair and commanded. Just send the mercenary shinobi to fight, they'll teach Asahi's army a lesson. The guard bowed and rushed out of the room. Outside the city, the shinobi assembled on the walls to confront the Romans. The latter had the city surrounded and were preparing for an assault. The shinobi rushed at their foes. But they were met with heavy fire from the Romans, who took out a good number of them. The rest of the shinobi, fifty in total, halted before engaging the enemy and took cover behind trees, rocks, etc., and then slowly moved forward soon engaging in melee combat with the roman knights who were in the foremost ranks the knights were an equal match for the ninja with their physical strength and swordsmanship their armor was also of a superior quality seemingly impenetrable by the shinobi's weapons and attacks it was winter time and the snow on the mountains was reddened with blood the shinobi's attacks seemed to have no effect on the romans whose armor withstood all blows and their knights cut through the shinobi moreover they were greatly outnumbered being fifty and having to face one thousand, so most were surrounded and cut down. Soon, the legionaries were at the gates of the city, battering them down with siege weapons. One of the guards rushed to tell Hiroshi of the shinobi's defeat. The latter was shocked out of his wits and proceeded to the walls. The Romans kept pushing to the walls, some tried to scale them with ladders, and others tried to break the wooden gate with siege weapons. War cries and shouts of pain and agony filled the atmosphere. The mercenary shinobi had been defeated, and the remaining recruits from the city were no match for the disciplined and trained Romans. They slashed, stabbed, and hacked their way forward with swords and spears, brandishing their weapons against their shields and armor to intimidate the opponent. The city was soon overrun and Hiroshi was captured and sent back alive to the daimyo. The latter was greatly impressed by the Romans' fighting capabilities and fulfilled all the promises he had made in the agreement. The Romans had successfully established a presence in this new land, and what was needed now was to discover and interact with the other nations. Governor Marcus Julius Brutus sat down on his desk and took out one of the notebooks on his office shelves. The office was a spacious room, with only a desk, and several shelves filled with records and documents, some paintings adorned the walls and the room was lit by electric lights and bulbs. The governor himself was a young man, probably thirty-two years old, with an average height, lean, relatively small, black hair, a light beard that had begun to grow, and a light complexion. 
his face and keen eyes spoke of his experience as a military man, and he looked the type you seriously don't want to anger. Several decades had passed since the Romans arrived on the continent, and only in a few years, it was clear to everyone that they were here to stay. The governor himself had started his extraordinary career a decade earlier when he first arrived on the continent alongside his legion as an optio. But with extraordinary talent and higher connections, he had managed to raise himself to the post of governor of all the Roman territories in the Shinobi continent over the previous decade, and today was six months into his post. Today, his last task of the evening was to compile all the records of the Romans' activities and actions in the continent for the past decades and send them back to Rome via sea, as was customary with all provinces. They didn't have to note every single day-to-day -day paperwork and only tell of the major events, which were many here in the Shinobi continent. So Marcus Julius began to write narratively. In 1354 AD, Commander Vitellus established a merchant colony in Hitsuma, the land of Earth's capital. Vessels and representatives were also sent to surrounding nations to explore, navigate, and establish relations. In a few months, a decent map of the northern and eastern Shinobi continent is created after exploring the coastline and gathering information from the local nations. First contact is also made with Shinobi while fighting against a rebel warlord in the land of Earth. In 1356 AD, the Roman Republic went to war with the northern land of Snow, winning and acquiring many islands and islets. A city is also established on an island near the coast of the land of Cones, which is named, Byzantium, after the old name of Constantinople, and the city is currently serving as the province's capital and where I now sit. A fort is also established on the coast of the land of Cones. In 1359 AD, by now our legions had taken all of the northern land of Cones, while the south either fractured into petty factions or was conquered by neighboring powers. The First Shinobi World War starts, and we stay neutral but talks of an alliance with Konoha start. A puppet ruler is established in the land of snow, and the land of rice fields becomes our protectorate. In 1362 AD, the northern coast of the land of frost was acquired. While a skirmish with some Kumogakir shinobi causes relations to deteriorate, the first great ninja war rages on, but we remain neutral, only selling weapons and provisions to either factions. The Hokage of Konoha, Hashirama Senju, dies in battle. We work to strengthen border security after several cases of infiltration by Kumo Shinobi. Due to worsening relations, a diplomatic meeting is called with Kumogakir, but nothing happens. In 1364 AD, more Roman citizens started moving to the continent. Most of these are veterans, with their pension due where they had been promised land after retirement and artisans. However, the majority workforce in the province is still made up of locals. The first great ninja war comes to an end and we host the peace talks in Byzantium as a neutral but powerful force. There are major border changes. Even though no village could be called the clear victor, Suna can be said to have benefited the most from this treaty. According to it, all occupied land must be returned, and Suna will get access to a major lake that will solve all their water supply problems. The land of storms and Omegakur has helped in its establishment, to act as a buffer state between three major shinobi villages, Suna, Iowa, and Konoha. In 1366 AD, several new towns were established in the conquered territories, and Roman migrants were encouraged to come and live there. The primary goal was to increase the amount of ethnic Romans in the province and add a pool of Roman citizens from which recruits and conscripts could be drawn. An alliance is signed with Konoha, and soldiers are provided temporarily to Konoha in exchange for shinobi. Further information is collected on the continent. In 1368 AD, all the coastal territories of the land of cones and the land of jungles were taken after a brief war, in which the shinobi from Konoha were of great help. The territories finally became big enough to be recognized as a full-fledged province. In 1370 AD, the first local legion was recruited from the migrants who had settled in the province, increasing our military here to three legions, 15,000 men. Another shinobi world war breaks out, this time also joined by Uzushiogakir. In 1373 AD, the short yet gruesome Second Shinobi World War came to an end, with Uzushiogakir destroyed and no major changes in borders. Rome starts to align itself with Konoha but maintains neutrality. In 1376 AD, the previous governor visited Konoha during a diplomatic mission. A mutual non-aggression pact was signed with Kumogakir. In 1380 AD, an agreement in signed with the great ninja villages, 
where Rome would help track down any rogue shinobi in its territory. In 1384 AD, the city of Byzantium expanded. Its defenses are improved, with two new sets of walls, ballisti, and the very first two cannons in the shinobi continent. After fully integrating the land of snow, the Romans took a defensive stance and considerably reduced their previously aggressive policies. In 1389 AD, another great ninja war broke out, but this time we joined Konoha's side. We maintain a defensive stance but help out our allies in operations and campaigns. No major offensive takes place, except for a campaign deep into the land of earth, that doesn't occupy any territories but brings back a lot of loot. In 1391 AD, the Third Great Ninja War soon ended, after a Konoha shinobi named Minato Uzumaki single-handedly wiped out a force of 1,000 Iwagakure shinobi, forcing a peace treaty, quite an impressive feat. The peace talks end, but the war isn't beneficial for any side, except we get dominion over three islands off the coast of the Land of Lightning. In 1394 AD, the Hokage, Minato Uzumaki, dies while fighting the rampaging Nine Tails after it managed to escape from its Jinchuriki we send our condolences. Governor Marcus Julius finished writing the letter and gave it to one of his assistants to be delivered to the latest ship going back to Rome. The governor stretched his legs, and was leaving his office when one of his secretaries hurriedly came to him. What is it now, Lucius? Well, sir, there is a delegate from Konoha who wishes to speak with you. His name is. The secretary looked over his papers. The governor, in an irritated tone, replied. No need to try and pronounce his name. The language of this continent is strange. Anyways, where is this delegate now? He is currently in the waiting room, and will shortly be coming to meet you in your office. The governor sighed in frustration, this job was too much work. But he nevertheless went back into his office, rearranging some things and sitting down on his chair. Waiting upon the delegate. The delegate promptly arrived, he was more or less fat, and short, but clever individual probably 42 years of age. He was dressed in Japanese formal attire and carried an air of respect. He seated himself on the chair opposite that of the governor and began to talk with a formal greeting. Good evening, respected governor, I hope my sudden arrival hasn't caused you any inconvenience? Marcus, following the etiquette rules and not his heart, replied. No no sir, it's okay. You may freely talk about what you intend to. The delegate adjusted his posture a little, and then started. The subject of conversation is the recently decided exchange of hostages. Marcus knew what the delegate was talking about. Over the decades, both Rome and Konoha had developed a practice of exchanging soldiers and shinobi temporarily. These men were highly skilled individuals and also worked as hostages to keep the alliance on both sides. But they were hostages only in name, for they were given every freedom, and soon integrated into Rome, Konoha's military system and society. This time, it had been discussed that the governor's six-year-old nephew, Julius Maximus, would be provided as hostage. There were some major changes though, Maximus wasn't a temporary inhabitant in Konoha but was gonna live there as a full-fledged citizen. Maximus had been chosen for this as he was the nephew of a governor, thus an important individual, and he was among the very few Romans who possessed chakra, large quantities of it. The delegate continued the conversation. We wanted to know when Maximus was going to arrive so that the necessary preparations could be made. Moreover, we may need some files about his personal information. The governor nodded, and promptly took out a file from his shelf and handed it over to the delegate. The latter looked over the file, and seemed satisfied. Very well then, Lord Governor, I have fulfilled my task and will be taking my leave. It has been a pleasure talking with you. Of course, sir, our time has been worthwhile. With this, the delegate walked out of the office with the file. Soon Marcus could see him walk out of the city with his escort of Konoha Shinobi. The governor remained in his seat, the meeting had reminded him of the hostage agreement, and he pondered over the subject. It was not like he didn't like his nephew, he loved him. But this was something important to do. Danzo, one of the counselors of Konoha, caused suspicion to grow among the leaders of Konoha that the Romans had a part in the Nine Tails rampage as one of the Roman hostages had only left the village two days before the attack. Maximus was an orphan, and moving him to Konoha wouldn't do any harm as he would be taken care of and receive companionship. But in the end, the future was in the hands of the gods. With these thoughts, the governor left his room for his house, which was a fairly large two-story building. 
There was also his young nephew, a young boy with blue eyes, snow white hair, and a lean figure. Marcus tried to talk with him. The Konoha men will be coming tomorrow to fetch the boy and take him safely to Konoha, he must be mentally prepared. Marcus woke up in his bedroom. The rays of the sun fell on his bed from the side window, while the scent of the flowers on his bedside table filled the air. His bedroom was made up of a bed, a lamp, and many shelves filled with books and memoirs. Marcus got out of bed, he was an early riser, as his time in the army had taught him, and went straight to the washroom to ready himself for the day. In about an hour, he was standing at the gates of his residence, dressed in a black suit, shoes, and a white undershirt, as was his usual outfit, which he rarely changed. The governor glanced over his wristwatch, it was eight o'clock in the morning. Marcus was expecting the Konoha ninjas, who were coming to fetch his nephew. Last night had been spent packing his things and telling him of the situation, and today he'd be going away to Konoha. Thus did Marcus think, and waited upon his nephew who was getting ready. The Konoha shinobi could be here any minute now. Maximus finally came out, dressed in casual clothes, with Marcus's housekeeper behind, bringing the luggage and other things. The shinobi slightly bowed to Marcus, the latter returned a nod, and the Konoha ninja took Maximus and his luggage with them. In Konoha Maximus quietly walked alongside the shinobi. They were inside the village, in the residential area where flats and houses were lined in a row. The marketplace was bustling with activity, vendors calling out customers, shopkeepers busy in their daily routine, and possible customers chatting among themselves. Maximus and the shinobi walked past the marketplace, towards the Hokage Tower at the center of the village. They walked into the Hokage Tower, where Maximus was led into the Hokage's office after a short briefing between the shinobi escorting him and the receptionist. Maximus met the Hokage, an old man with white hair, no beard, wrinkles all over his face and around his eyes, and the Hokage's hat on his head. The Hokage casually smoked a cigar and started speaking. So, you're Julius Maximus, young man? Maximus gave a nod, Hiruzen smiled and continued. You'll be staying in this village from now on, you know that? Maximus again gave a nod, Hiruzen continued. We will provide you with a decent flat, and a helper for some time, if you are comfortable with it. Moreover, you will be attending the Ninja Academy in a month, is that clear? Maximus nodded and replied, There will be no need for a helper, Lord Hokage. I am accustomed to living by myself. Hiruzen gave a puff from his cigar, and laughed softly. Very well then, young man, you may do as you wish, but remember, if you need any help just come to me. This shinobi here will now escort you to your new flat. Maximus gave a nod and started to follow the shinobi escorting him. Maximus and the shinobi soon reached a decent building on the outskirts of the village. The shinobi took out some keys from his pocket and opened the lock of one of the flats. The door opened, and inside was a decent, clean, and spacious home. The entry opened into what could be called a living room, then there were separate rooms for the kitchen and bedroom and a bathroom. All the furniture was already in place, a dining table with chairs, a single bed, a sofa, three cupboards, one empty shelf, and a desk. The kitchen was filled with cooking items. Now, the only thing Maximus needed to do was organize his luggage and settle down. The shinobi who had come with him helped him with that and then left after giving him the keys. After having organized everything, Maximus finally sat down to rest. His new home was quite spacious, and it was comfortable enough. But it still couldn't feel like home, at least for now. The next day at the Konoha Academy the academy was a quite large property, with separate lecture rooms for every grade, a training field, and a storeroom filled with spare furniture, tools, weapons for demonstration purposes, etc. and at the entrance of the academy was painted the symbol of the land of fire. The students appeared at the academy as usual. After some 15 minutes, the gates of the academy were opened and all students walked into their respective lecture rooms. Every lecture room had its accessories and was customized. For example, the lecture room of the six-year-old first graders was decorated with charts explaining chakra flow, manipulation, and taijutsu exercises, while that of the twelve-year-old seventh graders, who would soon take the graduation exam, was filled with articles explaining or related to elemental chakra, genjutsu, taijutsu, and some very basic sealing techniques. The sixth graders weren't much in numbers, thirty in total, they didn't even fill the lecture room. The majority of these 30 students were from civilian backgrounds, but you could find children belonging to shinobi clans here and there. They each sat in their chosen place, 
chatting amongst themselves until Uruka Amino entered the lecture room. Everyone, please maintain discipline. Uruka's voice was not very loud or commanding, but still authoritative enough to get the attention of the students. Uruka first turned on a few lights in the room and checked through some files before speaking again. Today, there is a new face among us here, a new student. His name is Julius Maximus. The children's attention was quickly grasped with this. For the past month the whole village had been talking of the Roman kid who was gonna live here and mentioning him quickly started a whole conversation. Uruka continued. Yes I know, you may know about him. And from today onwards he'd also be studying here, alongside you. I expect you to welcome him, and be friendly with him. When Uruka had ended, Maximus entered the lecture room. He didn't look at the rest of the class, only talking with Uruka over some things, but he could feel the entire class eyes on him. After that, Maximus quietly went and sat in one of the middle rows. After another announcement regarding this year's graduates, Uruka started teaching the students about chakra manipulation. Maximus paid close attention, his eyes were concentrated on the blackboard and the flow of the chalk in Uruka's hands, creating a new letter or figure each passing second. Perhaps Maximus was too concentrated because he didn't even notice the girl sitting beside him. Maximus only became aware of her presence only when she tapped on his shoulders. Maximus glanced to his right, seeing a girl with bright red hair, blue eyes, a lean body, and three whisker marks on either of her cheeks resembling a fox. Are you okay? She asked. Maximus cleared his throat and answered. Yes, why are you asking? Oh, it's just that, you were looking over so blankly. I thought something had happened to you. Maximus gave a slight smile. No, I'm fine. Who are you, by the way? Maximus asked with a curious look, the girl replied. Well, I am Naruko Uzumaki, and you're Julius Maximus? Maximus gave a nod but then saw a piece of chalk land on his desk. You too, pay attention, you can chat after class. With this, Uruka resumed writing with another chalk. Naruko and Maximus heeded him and focused their attention on class. In the afternoon the classes had ended, and all the students were going home. Maximus sat on a bench in the nearby park, thinking over the lessons today. The power of chakra fascinated him, it granted the user such powers as he had only heard of in tales and legends of ancient heroes. Thus did Maximus ponder over the lessons, when Naruko came and sat beside him. Maximus glanced at her. You noticed me quickly this time. Maximus chuckled and replied. Well, yes. Naruko smiled and started, so, who are you living with here? Me? I live alone. What about you? Naruko replied. Well, I have a younger brother called Naruto, who's four years younger than me. We also have a caretaker, she's very friendly. Maximus smiled, and then briefly looked over the Hokage monuments. Soon he left, after bidding Naruko goodbye. As Maximus walked down the streets, he glanced over the Hokage monuments, where he saw the fourth Hokage Minato Namikaze portrait. Immediately, the image of Naruko appeared in his mind. For some reason, she looked strikingly similar to the fourth Hokage, what could be the reason? But as Maximus walked down the street, the thought quickly faded from his mind. The Konoha Academy was bustling with activity as usual, but today was different. Today, the graduation exam of this batch of students was to be held. The lecture room was filled with students who were to take the exam. They were being called one at a time to an office where Uruka was seated and tested directly. Each student went one by one when their name was called by one of the staff, some coming back with a Konoha headband and a smile on their faces, while some weren't so lucky. Time passed, and soon a voice came out. Julius Maximus. Maximus stood up, gave a nod to his classmates, and walked towards the office. Maximus first slightly opened the door and took permission to enter, and then stood with a straightened back in front of the seated Uruka. The room was lit with electric lights, the walls were painted green, and the floor was of wood. The only furniture in the room was a desk, upon which sat Uruka, with files stacked in one place on the table. Uruka looked up at Maximus and greeted him. Good day, Maximus. I hope you're prepared for the exam? Maximus gave a nod. Well then, let's start the exam. First, I will be asking you some bookish questions, then we'll move on to the practical. Maximus nodded again. Uruka went over the question papers, each was designed differently for each student to prevent cheating, 
and started reading out questions after coming across the question paper with Maximus' name on it. What is the necessary chakra affinity to be a good Genjutsu user? Yin Chakra. Can you explain the process of how we can walk on water using chakra? Chakra can be used to create a solid surface over liquid water to walk upon, it only needs a base, however liquid or solid. Aruka seemed satisfied after asking a few more questions and noted down Maximus' grade, then continued. Now we'll be conducting the practical test, can you perform a clone jutsu for me? Maximus stepped back and formed a hand sign, smoke covered the room for a brief moment. When it cleared, there was a perfect copy of Maximus standing by his side. Aruka smiled took out a wooden board and continued. Now, can you break this wooden board with chakra enhancing? Maximus chuckled, and took his hand behind, preparing for a strike on the wooden board. Slowly, his hand began to slightly glow with chakra, and when the glow had become quite visible, he struck. The board fell in half, and Aruka was impressed. After a few more tests where Maximus was to perform basic techniques, Aruka concluded. Congratulations, Maximus, you've passed with flying colors. Aruka took out a Konoha headband from his drawer placed it on the table, and continued. Here is your headband. You may go home for now, information regarding your genin team will be provided after a few days. Maximus happily took the headband, slightly bowed to his former sensei, and left the office in a joyous mood. As he left the room, he saw Naruko go towards the office. He nodded at her in a friendly and encouraging manner, Naruko also replied with a nod, and both went their ways. Konoha Council Room The prominent people in Konoha, the Hokage, the elders, the rich merchants, representatives of the civilian class, etc., all sat in the room around a rectangular table. The Hokage, Hiruzen Serutobi, sat at the width of the rectangular table, opposite him Danzo Shimura, the others sat near the sides. Today, a representative from Rome was also sitting amongst these respectable Konoha men. The topic of discussion was the recent Hayuga incident where the supposed ambassador from Kumo who had come to discuss peace terms after the last war with Konoha had tried to abduct Hinata Hayuga, daughter of the current Hayuga clan head and belonging to the main branch, but was prevented and killed by her father Hiyashi Hayuga. Hiruzen started the talks. The purpose of today's gathering is the recent Hayuga incident, of which you all know so I won't go into telling about it. Today's discussion is on what to do over this matter. Kumogakure is demanding the head of Hiyashi the man who killed their representative. How shall we proceed on this matter? Danzo Shimura cleared his throat and began to speak. Their claims are ridiculous and outrageous. Both sides know that they were the ones who started this by trying to abduct Hinata Hayuga. Kumogakure doesn't have any special Keke Jenke of its own, so they are trying to acquire the Bayakugan with trickery and deception. This is now a matter of Konoha's pride, and we can't simply bend to their wishes even though they are the ones guilty. Hiruzen took a deep breath and answered, Pride, pride, pride. What is this pride you speak of? Pride in killing thousands during the wars, or pride in superseding other villages in war crimes and aggressiveness. Keep this in mind, all present, that if we go Lord Donzo's way, it will only lead to further conflict. It is easy to talk of pride, honor, and strength while sipping tea in the meeting room, but remember that thousands will die and many will suffer. One of the rich merchants, who was also a representative of the civilian class, spoke after a brief moment of silence. I agree with Lord Hokage. War is bad, and it is even worse for business. We should try to resolve this matter through discussions and not arms. Danzo scoffed and spoke. I know you'd speak as such, but if we bend to Kumo, other villages and daimyos will perceive us as weak, and it might even affect the missions we receive. A strong argument followed between those who supported Hiruzen and those with Danzo, the former was a minority. The diplomat from Rome was an old person with a white beard, light skin, and a slightly bent posture, his hair was white and he was balding, he wore white clothes and had a face that spoke of his experience and wisdom. The diplomat sighed and rose to speak. You may do about the matter as you please, after all, you people control the fate of Konoha, this is only friendly advice from an ally. Deal with this matter through talks, offer to recompense Kumo with something else like money, and choose open conflict only if it is the last resort. After this speaking, the diplomat rose from his chair and proceeded towards the exit. However, the diplomat turned back and spoke, if Konoha opts for war, then Rome will be more than ready to join its side. You may make the decision yourselves. 
Saying this the diplomat quietly left the room with his guards. After he was gone, debate again started among the counselors. The pro-war faction stated that now that they have the support of Rome as well, they shouldn't fear war. While others appreciated the diplomat's advice of recompense, and choosing war only as a last resort. In the end, Hirazan proposed a vote to be held to decide. In the end, going to war was won by popular vote. These were the winter months, and snow covered all of the land of lightning. In the northernmost regions, ice caps could be seen floating on the shore. Cutting through these ice caps came dozens of ships and transport vessels, all filled with soldiers. It was snowing lightly, but the weather was calm, and the ships made their way to the coast. The shore was rocky, but there was a strip of land ideal for landing, and the ships sailed towards it. The ship made a landing, and out of it marched thousands of soldiers. The equipment and supplies were carried off the ship and taken out, while other soldiers pitched tents and made a camp up on a nearby hill. The hill was very large and barren with rocks and brown black soil. The hill was 500 meters inland, but you could still see the shore from the top. There were currently 5,000 Roman soldiers on the beaches of the Land of Lightning, setting up camp on the barren hill. The Romans could not proceed with their invasion immediately after the landing, as the soldiers were tired from the long journey, so it was decided that the campaign would continue tomorrow. Today, they'll rest and draw up plans. After about one hour, the Roman camp was fully set up and bustling with activity. A temporary palisade was also set up to give the camp a boundary and make sure that the horses, dogs, and some beasts of burden didn't run astray. This would seem too much for the commander of any other military force in the world or the shinobi continent, but this was a daily routine for a Roman soldier. They built this much or more anywhere they camped, and would tear everything down the next day in a matter of half an hour before moving on. Several hours later the Roman camp was all quiet now. All the soldiers slept soundly in their tents, while the one selected for the night watch struggled to awake, working in shifts. Quintus Germanicus, the general leading this campaign, sat in his quite spacious tent which also consisted of a small but proper bed, as compared to his soldiers who used bedding and slept on the floor. The general was an old man, probably fifty-nine, and had a mild beard and small hair, a mix of white and gray. He wore casual clothes, for now, he had few wrinkles but a stern face that emitted authority and command. As for the name, the general had done nothing in Germany. It was now just the family surname after their ancestor Germanicus, who had received the title after several successful and decisive campaigns against the Germanic tribes. The commander sat on a desk, studying a map of the land of lightning and surrounding nations under candlelight. The map mainly focused on the land of lightning and was very detailed. As Quintus studied the map, thoughts, and rough ideas began to form in his mind. They were currently on the northern coast of the land of lightning. It was not so cold here, but if they go inland the winter will get the better of them, so it's safer to travel along the coast. Not to mention the rough roads and mountain passes that will be inhabited by a populace hostile to them. There was also a medium-sized and two other smaller islands just across the coast here. But conquering them is fruitless, as they serve no strategic purpose to the campaign, have provisions to sustain their population barely, and will only buy Kumovikir more time to assemble a counterattack against Rome. If they go along the coast, it will be a better path and they can also be provisioned by Roman ships coming from their provinces here, due to Rome's naval superiority, so it's the most viable option. The news might have reached the locals about the Roman invasion, so it is best to move at lightning speed through the lightning country to catch Kumogakir by surprise. Quintus had also heard about Turtle Island, or Genbu, as it was called in the local language. He had heard from the officers here that there was a huge turtle on this continent, that was large enough to fit several hundreds of humans, other animals, and man-made structures on its back. The turtle was kept by Kumogakir and actively taken care of, and in return the turtle allowed Kumogakir to use its back as a training ground for the toughest of its shinobi. If the latest reports are right, Genbu is currently located off the southern coast of the Land of Lightning. If Quintus can capture this turtle, then it can be held hostage and used as a tool to end the war on favorable terms. Thus Quintus swirled around his thoughts and ideas, attempting to form an excellent strategy that would win the war, earn him fame and glory, and his soldiers some plunder. The general was thus thinking when a soldier entered his tent, he saluted the general and spoke in a worried tone. Sir, there seems to be a large contingent of enemies just below the hill. They all have torches and seem to number roughly the same as us. 
Quintus looked surprised and sat up straight on his chair, he thought for a while and answered. Wake up the men, tell them to put on their gear, and prepare to defend the position. I will join you outside in a minute. The soldier saluted Quintus again and hurriedly went outside to spread the news. Quintus meanwhile, changed into his armor and prepared himself for the task at hand. Below the hill where the Roman legion was camped was lit up by thousands of torches, that didn't seem to move. But the noises coming from down the hill told me these were people, hostile at the least. The Romans were now also awake, hurriedly putting on their gear and taking up their positions. They were all panic struck in the heart, but their body didn't dare act as such after years of rigorous training. They simply did what was ordered with indifference and prepared to meet their foes. Quintus came out of his tent, clad in armor, and made his way to the raised platform in the center of the camp. The different centurions were running about, addressing the soldiers under their command and issuing them orders. Quintus called the Primus Pilus, the best and most skilled centurion in the legion, who also led the best 120 troops in the legion, and tried to formulate a rough defensive strategy with him. Quintus' eyes ran around the camp, searching for any possible advantage. It was already good that they were stationed on a hill, so the attackers were at a substantial disadvantage, having to climb up the hill before even engaging in combat. The palisade around the Roman camp was just about nine feet, but it was quite sturdy, and the attackers didn't seem to have any tools or siege weapons to break through the palisades, so they would probably concentrate their forces on the two entrances at the east and west each. The north and south parts of the hill were very steep and rocky, so Quintus didn't expect the enemy to come from that direction. If they did, they would have to face a rough climb and will be defenseless against Roman projectiles, so it is already safe if the enemy commander is a sane man. The enemy will concentrate its efforts on the entrances, and some might even try to climb the palisade with each other's help, so they must focus their attention on the eastern and western parts of the camp. As Quintus thus thought out a defensive plan, he felt the Primus Pilus hand on his shoulder. Sir, the enemy is advancing up the hill. Quintus snapped out and spoke to the centurion. Order all the Hastaci to defend the entrances, place the princeps and triari at the flanks and around the palisade. The enemy soldiers may try to scale those pieces of rotting wood. The Primus Pilus nodded and hurried towards his soldiers, shouting orders. Quintus himself looked down the hill, which was a little steep. The enemy was advancing up the hill, their torches in hand. As the enemy warriors crashed into the gates and palisade, it seemed like a wave of light had hit the dark, dim walls of night. The legionaries braced for impact, each centurion at the head of his century. As the enemy warriors got close enough, the legionaries took out their javelins and threw them at the enemy in three volleys, as every Roman soldier carries three javelins with him. These volleys were enough to deter the zealous enemy warriors, who slowed their charge and now advanced with caution, giving the Romans more time to prepare their nerves and minds for the combat. Some of the fresh recruits in the front row tried to get back behind the safety of their other comrades but were pushed back to the front by other legionaries who insulted them for their cowardice. As the enemy was just a few yards away from the Roman line, they put in front their shields and weapons and resumed their charge. The Roman soldiers held their shields tight to absorb the impact of the charge. The battle was happening in the night, and the mood was tense. Soldiers and warriors on both sides were bathed in sweat out of nervousness and not heat. No matter if a warrior is a newbie or a veteran, every soldier briefly doubts his decision to go to the battlefield just before entering combat. The enemy warriors collided with the Roman line and started combat. The Roman soldiers fought defensively, trying to maintain their formation and hold back the enemy, while the latter were far more aggressive. The unit of archers at the back shot arrows into the dark with only as much force so that they might hit the rearguard of the enemy force. Some of the warriors tried to scale the palisade with makeshift ladders or with each other's support but were kept out by the princeps and triari using spears. Quintus, who was still on the raised platform and encouraging his soldiers to fight on, could now clearly see his foes. Most of them didn't carry shields, but a good portion of them were heavily armored and carried slightly curved, single-edged double-handed swords. Quintus could also see the leaders of the enemy forces who were at the back, judging by their extravagant armor the iron masks they wore, and how it seemed they were also issuing orders to their subordinates. These must be the samurai warlords Quintus had heard and read about before the campaign. These were exceptionally trained warriors who were more than experts in single combat, while the Romans relied on discipline, willpower, and teamwork. 
Quintus had heard about the honor code of these samurai, according to which these warriors were expected to fight till the last breath, and cowardice was punishable by death. In some extreme orthodox versions of this code, samurai were allowed and even encouraged to kill their comrades who ran away from battle. Overall, these warriors did not easily give up on the battlefield. He also saw some lightly equipped troops among these exceptionally trained samurai. Quintus knew these lot, who were common among all the armies of the world. Peasants and common men were handed weapons and told to go and fight. These conscripts had poor morale and would begin to waver as soon as the bodies started piling up. But Quintus still couldn't find those he was looking for, the famed, shinobi, of this land. Quintus had heard about their inhumane abilities, being able to shoot out fire from their mouths, bend the earth to their will, and send out sharp winds that could cut through anything. Quintus was more interested than terrified in meeting them on the battlefield. As he ran his eyes around the camp, looking for any ninjas, a kanai passed just by his face, inflicting a slight cut on his left cheek. A kanai flew by Quintus' face, inflicting a slight cut on the left cheek. The general held his cheek tight with his hands and gasped in pain. The fifteen knights who were assigned as his bodyguards immediately came to cover him. The general wiped the blood coming out of the wound and looked around the battlefield, but couldn't see his attacker. This was the thing about these shinobi, they had great power but were too cowardly to face their foe head on, or Quintus thought. After half an hour of fighting, the enemy did an orderly retreat back down the hill. A brief moment of silence ensued, with both sides expecting each other to attack once again. But nothing happened, for a while. As the Roman soldiers nervously awaited the enemy's second assault, a bright energy that looked like lightning flew toward them at great speed. It took the life of one soldier in the front row, but the rest narrowly dodged the attack. The lightning went through the camp, killing one soldier, burning through tents, and finally disappearing after having burned a small hole on the opposite side of the palisade. The Roman soldiers had been informed about ninjutsu before but were nevertheless both amused and terrified. Quintus glared around the camp and after a while whispered orders to the Primus Pilus. The latter went away ordering twenty soldiers to follow him. After a while, those twenty troops came back, with a leather bag on their backs that was connected to a metal pipe in their hands, whose ends were sculptured like the head of a dragon. The unit was also very heavily armored and wore metal face coverings. The unit made its way to the front gate of the camp, standing foremost among the front row. During this time, the enemy also launched a second assault up the hill. This time accompanied by warriors who wore Kumo headbands on their foreheads, six in total. They advanced foremost among the enemy warriors, getting ever closer to the Romans with great speed. One could not see properly in the night, but this was soon resolved as another bolt of lightning came flying towards the Romans. The latter were prepared this time, and the lightning bolt missed its target. After that, a giant boulder came rolling towards the Romans, but they stopped it by immediately placing iron stakes at the front. The earthen boulder stopped, and because the hill was steep it started rolling backward on its users. The shinobi easily dodged it but some of the common warriors weren't so fortunate. The shinobi quickly advanced towards their opponents, eager to engage in combat. But as soon as their outlines could be seen by the Romans in the dark, they disappeared. The Romans looked around in shock, but could not find them. Just then, one of the shinobi who covered his face with a mask and wore the Kumo Chunin attire, appeared behind Quintus and attempted to stab him, but narrowly missed. And a second later, when the element of surprise was gone and the knights had noticed his presence, he was cut to pieces, given no chance of escape. The other five shinobi appeared from behind and tried performing some jutsu, but were prevented by the soldiers who rushed to engage with them in melee combat. Fighting ensued inside the camp, and just then the common warriors outside also charged at the gates. They were once again filled with confidence, thinking that the chaos and fighting in the Roman camp meant the enemy commander had been killed. Shouting war cries, they advanced towards the gate, only to see the twenty soldiers with the odd bag and pipe carved like the head of a dragon. When the enemy soldiers were just about twenty meters away from the Romans, the twenty soldiers aimed the pipes at the front. They pulled a trigger where the pipe connected with the bag, and flames shot out of the metal pipe, it truly looked like a dragon vomiting fire upon humans. The flame went far, sticking, to many enemy warriors. The vanguard of the enemy force gave cries of horror and pain as they and their comrades' flesh melted because of the flames. 
Nothing could put out these flames, whether it was water or covering the fire with sand and dirt, it just kept on burning even on water. It even went right through the armor of the samurai, melting it as well as the flesh. The enemy warriors were in terror, and chaos erupted among their ranks as the warriors engulfed by the flames desperately tried to save themselves, giving horrific cries of pain and agony. While others were scared out of their wits, and pushed each other away to get back and avoid the flames, this single volley had caused chaos and disorder to erupt in the enemy ranks and broken their morale. It took the commanders of the army quite some time to reorganize their force and go for another assault. But it had given the twenty soldiers enough time to reload their weapons with the sticky black liquid. The warriors gathered their courage and once again advanced uphill. But their repaired morale and will to fight was crushed again as the Romans launched another volley of flames, killing many this time as well. This time, the commanders could do nothing. The army was in total panic, they had lost more than half of their force to the fighting and those flames, and the samurai had forgotten about their honor code. The army did a disorderly retreat down the hill, and in the panic, many fell or were crushed to their deaths. After that, the army quickly vanished into the darkness of the night and did not return. The Romans now directed their full attention towards the shinobi, three of whom were left and fiercely resisting. They were all talented but massively outnumbered by the Romans, who had them surrounded and striking from all sides. Two of the shinobi perished this way, and the third surrendered, falling unconscious due to blood loss soon after. The next morning the Romans rested and recovered after last night's attack. They had been able to fend off the attackers, but couldn't pursue them. That might count for much. But for now, the Romans were preparing for their march forward into enemy territory. Quintus was sitting in his tent, with the captured shinobi in front of him, hands and feet bound. He had recovered from his fatigue and was in the condition to talk. So, what is your name? Quintus spoke to the shinobi while casually taking a sip from his glass, the shinobi looked amazed. You speak our language? Quintus lightly chuckled and replied. Well, it is useful when communicating with deserters, bribing enemies, and general communication. By the way, answer the question, what is your name? Taka. Quintus raised an eyebrow. Not because of the shinobi's name, but because of his voice. It sounded young, perhaps too young. His physique was also small, but not the same as some small and skinny men. He had tanned skin, blue eyes, and a short height. His face was covered with a mask. The shinobi had refused to take off his mask. Quintus approached him and took off the shinobi's mask. Quintus looked very surprised, to see a boy of approximately age 13. Quintus asked the boy. Were you really, told, to fight us? Of course, that's what orders are. The boy seemed to be trying to act mature, but his childishness was visible in his manner and voice. Quintus rubbed his eyes in thought, then spoke with a stern face. Do you know anything? About what your village is going to do? The boy flatly refused. Quintus sighed and sat down in his seat. It would be a waste of time trying to persuade or torture this kid for information. He is just a newbie who probably doesn't know anything about his village's plans. But he couldn't be simply let go, as he might leak information about the Romans. Listen here, kid, Quintus spoke. You know that you are in a hostage situation, right? The boy nodded with a stern face. You can't give any information useful to us, and we too can't simply let you go because you might leak information about us, so. The kid surprisingly didn't need further explanation, and his face saddened. He looked down at the floor, on the point of breaking down. Quintus pitied the boy. Your life ending just when it began, was a cruel thing. But this was reality, fate is in no man's control. Quintus tossed his short sword over to the kid. You can either use this or jump down the steep, rocky hill, the choice is yours. Saying this Quintus left the tent and was joined by the Primus Pilus who spoke. So, did you get any information out of him? Quintus looked irritated and replied. Do you seriously expect a ing kid to know about battle plans and the strategies of his village? The Primus Pilus paused for a moment and then spoke. So, what do we do with him? Quintus walked on and replied. I have given him two choices, ask him what he chose. There has been no sound from inside the tent, so it is probably the hill. The Primus Pilus nodded and began going towards the tent, but Quintus spoke again. By the way, what were the previous night's casualties? The Primus Pilus stopped and looked back. We haven't properly counted sir, but it may roughly be 100 men on our side. 
most of these casualties were because of the shinobi. Quintus nodded and walked away. A few moments later, he heard some slight screams and sounds of struggling from the other side of the camp, then it all went silent. Quintus casually lit a cigarette and gazed away into the horizon. Gods, I ing hate this continent. Hiruzen Serutobi quietly sat in his office, reading a few reports. It had been a week since the declaration of war, and the report was a detailed one of the Romans' campaign. Hiruzen had despised the council's decision to go to war. But now as they were in a conflict, Hiruzen must do everything to win and end this war quickly. The Hokage casually puffed on his cigar, reading the report. It seems the Romans had repulsed a night attack by local samurai, and two Kumo shinobi teams stationed there. Hiruzen was also told of the pipe-like weapon that, vomited, flames like a dragon, and that the flames couldn't be put out by anything, it even worked underwater. After repulsing the night attack, the Romans marched along the land of Lightning's coast, storming a few towns and plundering. They were being supplied by their ships, and there was nothing that Kumogakir could do about it with no naval force at it. Shinobi can walk on water, but they can't run miles on water searching for ships that will blow them up with artillery batteries as soon as they appear on the horizon. Surprisingly, however, the Romans didn't meet much resistance on their march through the land of lightning. And now, they were only about 160-170 kilometers away from Kumogakur which was further inland. This was very odd of Kumogakur. As Hiruzen knew from previous wars and conflicts, Kumogakur's policy had always been quite aggressive, and it was weird to see them doing nothing about this incursion into their territory. Recently, Rome had also sent one cohort, roughly 500 men, to Konoha to help their allies. Hiruzen noted that the Romans didn't have any special abilities, but their strength was extraordinary teamwork, discipline, advanced technology, and physical abilities. There was also a company of 150 knights that had arrived. These were superb fighters who were trained since childhood to be masters of single combat but also had a fair amount of discipline. Unlike the samurai who worked as single killing machines but had little unit cohesion, these knights were small in number but formidable fighters. After reading the report, Hiruzen laid it at one corner of his desk and resumed some of the paperwork that remained unfinished. As Hiruzen took up his pen and was reading through the documents, an Anbu suddenly entered the office and bowed before him. What is it now? Hiruzen looked up, message from the border guard, Lord Hokage. The Anbu handed over a letter to Hiruzen and then vanished. Hiruzen unfolded the letter and started reading it. Two, the Hokage, Minamoto, John and Shinobi. This is an urgent matter, and I request you the Hokage, to quickly react upon it. I am a shinobi stationed as part of the border patrol on the northern frontier with the land of hot water. This morning, at roughly 10 feet o'clock a large force of shinobi appeared near the border. At first, we thought these were Takigakir shinobi here for a drill or military exercise, but after some moments it appeared to not be the truth. The shinobi came ever closer, and as they were just about to cross the border we tried to confront them. At that point we twenty men realized that these were Kumogakir shinobi, and immediately prepared for battle. It seemed to be a single battalion of about thirty Kumo shinobi, but after some time there appeared many other teams and contingents, that can easily go into the hundreds. At this point, we realized that we alone couldn't defend against this attack, and with almost half of us dead or dying, we quickly retreated to a nearby town, from where I am writing this letter. The Kumo ninja didn't follow us here, and I am thankful they didn't, or else all of us would be dead. But they headed straight forward, towards the direction here. I have warned you, Lord Hokage, now it is your task to defend the village. Hiruzen went almost into a state of total panic, but years of experience told him to remain calm and think. If the enemy shinobi crossed the border at 10 am, then it would take them two days at least even if they travel at full speed. The first course of action must be to recall all shinobi out on missions back to the village. Defenses must be prepared to withstand the attack. But first of all, a meeting must be called for the council to inform them of the situation. It would be purely a waste of time, as the precious one hour spent discussing the matter would only lead to the decisions Hiruzen would take. Call all the shinobi back, prepare defenses, etc. Only that one-eyed Danzo will suggest something extreme, but no one will be in his favor not this time at least. In the council room all the councillors, including the legate of the cohort from Rome, sat in their respective places, eager to know what had happened to call this emergency meeting. After a moment, 
Hiruzen also entered the council room and went to his place. But he didn't sit down, and instead started speaking. This emergency meeting has been called due to an urgent threat. Our border guards on the northern frontier with the land of hot water have reported a large number of Kumo shinobi, going up into hundreds, are carving their path into the land of fire and towards Konoha. It will take them two days at least to get here even at top speed. I have already sent an order to recall all shinobi away on missions to return to the village. We are gathered here to discuss the course of action to defend against this invasion. Immediately, there was whispering among the councillors over the topic. This continued for some minutes, until Homura, one of the three village elders, spoke up. Lord Hokage has done right to recall all the shinobi back to the village. I suggest that an emergency be declared, and none except shinobi should be allowed to leave the village. We must also dispatch scouting parties to know the enemy shinobi's location. They seem to be a large force so spotting them wouldn't be hard. Everyone in the council room seemed to agree with Homura's suggestion. Then, Danzo got up. But the real question remains, how shall we deal with this attack? We still have a few days, and we must use this precious time to draw up plans and strategies. And what might be those plans and strategies? One of the civilian representatives questioned. We should man the defenses, repair the walls, and build a set of defenses in the forest surrounding Konoha. Moreover, a route should also be created, perhaps underground, for fresh supplies and water in case of a siege. The legate finally spoke up. The councillors laughed at him, and Shikaku Nara, the advisor of the Hokage and head of the Nara clan spoke. I mean no offense to you or your men, sir, but what you are saying is flatly impossible. We only have three to four days at the most to prepare for the impending attack. Even if we put the entire working class in the village to complete such a project, it wouldn't even be quarter complete before the enemy arrives. Please, suggest something practical. The legate, a well-built man with a mild beard, slightly brown complexion, dark hair, and a tall height, chuckled. Well, that might be the case for your laborers Lord Nara. But my soldiers are different. I can assure you that we will complete this project in three days. And the resources? Inoichi Yamanaka asked, hoping to checkmate the legate. My men will collect the wood and stone themselves. No need for Konoha to trouble itself. We will look after the repair and construction of defenses. Hiruzen smiled. Well, if you can do that then go forward, we will see how effective Roman legionaries are. The rest of the council and the clan heads approved of this. Since Konoha would not be spending labor or resources of its own on this seemingly impossible project, the Romans would do it themselves. The legate smiled at the councillors and left the meeting room to prepare for this seemingly impossible task. As for actual battle strategies, a large force of Konoha shinobi was also sent to confront the Kumo invasion force. They weren't expected to win as the Konoha force was smaller, but to at least deter Kumo from advancing for some time. After some time, the discussion was over and the councillors began to get off their seats. But Danzo Shimura again spoke up and told the individuals to sit down. Hiruzen was annoyed as to what his ex-colleague had to say now, but sat down to listen anyway. There is still one more matter, that I think requires the council's attention. As you all may know regarding the Nine Tails rampage six years ago, and the suspicions on the Uchiha. Danzo was quickly interrupted by Fugaku Uchiha, who knew where this was going. Alleged, suspicions. Danzo looked at him with an irritated face but ignored him and continued speaking. So, alleged suspicions that the Uchiha were involved in the Nine Tails rampage, as a Sharingan wielder was controlling the beast with its dojutsu. The Sharingan is only wielded by the Uchiha and there have been no reports of a non-Uchiha shinobi possessing the Sharingan as a spoil of a war or battle, save for Kakashi Hitaki. So what are you suggesting, that we should go and massacre the Uchiha? Hiruzen was angered, and Danzo remained calm in his attitude. No, of course not. Not while a war is going on. I only suggest that the restrictions and monitoring of the Uchiha's activities be kept on. Hiruzen protested strongly, and due to that the restrictions were loosened quite a bit. Right now they were in the middle of a war, and causing a rift inside the village and dividing it into different factions wasn't a good idea. The session finally ended and the meeting was dismissed. Hiruzen also left the meeting room and went straight to his home. It was night now, roughly 8 feet o'clock. All the necessary work that could be done in today's time was completed. Many shinobi had already returned to the village before sunset, others hadn't. 
as Hirazan lay down on his bed, all alone, he could only wonder. How will the Romans manage to do what they claimed to? They weren't even working on this project and slept soundly in their tents on the outskirts of Konaha. So, this means the legate was bluffing right, he was bluffing, right? Maximus woke up quite early this morning, at 5 o'clock. Due to excitement, they will be assigned to Genin teams and provided with their John and Captain and Tutor today. But mostly due to the loud noises outside. The Roman cohort had started working on repairing and constructing defenses roughly one hour ago, and they were making a lot of noise. The biggest victim was Maximus, who lived on the outskirts of the village near the Roman camp. He could already see trees falling and stones being mined from the hills a bit farther away from the village. His alarm clock was still two hours before ringing, and Maximus tried hard to put himself to sleep. Maximus woke up after two hours, at the ringing of his alarm clock. He slowly got up, rubbing his eyes. Sunlight came into the room from the window near Maximus' bed, and the noises of the Roman soldiers working continued. He quietly went into his bathroom and prepared himself for the day, taking a bath and cleaning his teeth. Today was special as they will finally get out of the Shinobi Academy and become full-fledged Shinobi. The Shinobi Academy's timing was 8 o'clock, so there was still one hour. After having eaten a light but filling breakfast of eggs and curry, Maximus put on his usual clothes. His clothing was quite modest, with a grey half-sleeve t-shirt, a cream-coloured sleeveless jacket on top of it, and black trousers. He also tied his Konoha headband on his left arm and wore the standard sandals of Konoha Shinobi. This outfit suited his light but not pale skin, and his thick snow-white hair. After having thus readied himself for the day, Maximus locked his apartment door and left for the academy, where it would be his last day. Maximus strolled through the streets and could see the vendors and shopkeepers already busy with their businesses. While many Roman soldiers sat in restaurants and food stalls, having a quick breakfast before heading back to work. Maximus still couldn't find out what was going on on the village's outskirts, but that was not his concern at the moment. He only wished to see the Roman soldiers when they tried to eat using chopsticks, a hilarious sight it would have been, just like him during his early days here. Maximus thus strolled through the streets, on the path leading towards the academy, and after some fifteen minutes, he reached his destination. The academy was bustling with activity as always and Maximus was quite eager to find out what his team would be. He entered the academy alongside many others and made his way to the lecture room of the twelve-year-olds. Inside the lecture room Maximus sat in his casual seat in the middle row, near Naruko Uzumaki. The entire class was engaged in conversation regarding today's work. However, the class felt smaller today. Many civilian kids did not belong to clan backgrounds, or simply didn't have enough chakra reserves or capabilities so couldn't graduate. They were given the option to either attend this grade again or drop out. And many chose the latter. The classroom was filled with kids from clan backgrounds, all instilled with pride in their bloodline and abilities. Even Naruko belonged to the famed Uzumaki about whom Maximus had read. But for some reason, she didn't know about it herself despite being quite smart and curious type. Maximus too belonged to the Gens Julia, a Roman patrician family that had existed since the time of the Roman kingdom, about 1500 years ago, and is mythologically believed to have descended from Eulus, the son of Aeneas, Aeneas who is descended from the goddess of beauty Venus, and the ancestor of Romulus and thus all Romans. But his lineage had no connection with the Shinobi continent whatsoever so why does he have so much chakra? As Maximus continued to ponder on this topic, he for some reason felt out of place, just like how he felt on his first day here. Maximus thought about his time here, since the day of his arrival six years ago, he was surprised at the thought that he, a pure Roman, had large amounts of chakra and even managed to graduate from the academy with flying colors. But these thoughts quickly faded from his mind as Aruka appeared in the lecture room with a list in his hand, everyone knew what the list was about. Aruka addressed the entire class. Good morning, students. I think you already know about today's proceedings, so I will be cutting it short and announcing your teams. After a brief pause, Aruka continued. Team 1, Arashi Akamichi, Sumi Yamanaka, and Kato Nara. Team 2, Tenku Fuma, Sora Uchiha, and Kenji Serutobi. Team 3, Julius C. Maximus, Naruko Uzumaki, and Hayato. This was all Maximus wanted to hear, and after this, his attention drifted away from his teacher and toward his soon-to-be teammates. 
the three looked at each other and smiled. After spending several hours in the academy on their last day, the students were starting to be picked up by their Jonin captains. Over several more hours, most of the Jenin teams had met their captain. Why so much delay? It was because of the war, as many Jonin had been assigned to long missions or patrolling the border. By the time Maximus' team was picked up by its Jonin, it was already three o'clock. Their captain was a lean, well built man in his twenties. He had a clean shaven face, straight, brunette hair, black eyes, and a sharp jawline, and wore the standard Jonin uniform of Konoha. His name came to be Asahi. The team was led to a training field on the outskirts of the village and was soon seated on top of a few rocks in the middle of the field. The training field was not well maintained, looking more like a meadow with all the random vegetation and uneven terrain. Only now did Asahi start the introduction, pointing at Maximus, he started. You start, tell us about yourself. Your name, age, strengths, weaknesses, habits, and goals. Everything. We'll be a team for a long time so knowing each other is necessary. Maximus straightened his back and spoke. My name is Julius C. Maximus, I'm 12 years old. My strengths are in taijutsu, ninjutsu, and weapons. My weaknesses are in genjutsu and sealing. As for my habits, I like reading and writing. And my goals, I'll see to it. Asahi was perplexed. We'll see to it, yeah, sir. At first, it was settling as part of this village, and then it was graduating from the academy. Now, perhaps it's to be a chunin? And after that Jonin? Asahi chuckled. Okay, your goal is to get stronger and stronger. Now, what about you, girl? Asahi pointed towards Naruko, the latter spoke in her calm manner. My name is Naruko Uzumaki, and I'm 12 years old. My strengths are in ninjutsu and some genjutsu, my weaknesses are in taijutsu and sealing. My habit is training, and my goal is to protect my younger brother. Asahi gave a nod and signaled to Hayato, who was a short, lean child with long black hair and black eyes, and had a very light brown complexion. My name is Hayato, age 12. My strengths are weapons and taijutsu, my weakness is in genjutsu and sometimes ninjutsu. My habit is also training, and my goal is to be an anbu. We'll see how you handle the bloody missions, Asahi muttered to himself, and then spoke. Okay so now that we have been introduced to each other, let's start the training. I have read your academic reports, and it seems team 3 would be classified as a heavy assault team. Maximus, Naruko, and Hayato looked puzzled. Asahi began to explain. Well, today's conflicts are at a relatively larger scale as compared to the small scale warfare between individual teams, as during the times of the previous Hokages. A usual battle may consist of 15 to 20 shinobi on either side, so the Konoha leadership has decided to categorize different teams for different tasks and make them specialize in it. There are heavy assault teams tasked for open combat, sensory teams, Tracking teams tasked with hunting any missing nin or separated enemy shinobi, or support teams that are skilled in medical ninjutsu but also have other skills to support the main force. Asahi continued. As for you three, I have concluded that your capabilities, chakra reserves, and opportunity for growth will make you a great heavy assault team. Maximus is skilled with taijutsu, weapons, and weapons that are very useful in open combat. Naruko is weak in taijutsu and weapons but has vast chakra reserves and Hayato is the son of a former Anbu so he already has had much training and skills related to this task. But don't get too full of yourselves, thinking you can capture an enemy stronghold on your own. This classification only means that there is a direction for growth, and what you may become capable of. Maximus, Naruko, and Hayato nodded. As for now, I will be testing your abilities, because of the war. Konoha has temporarily stopped accepting missions as no shinobi are allowed to leave the village unless because of direct orders. See these? Please try and destroy one of these pillars each. Use any method you like, ninjutsu, taijutsu, or genjutsu. But remember, these are infused with my chakra so they will be extra tough. The students gave a nod. Hayato went first, infusing his hand with chakra and punching the pillar with all his might. A loud noise came but it only caused a crack on the pillar. Seeing his technique working, Hayato kept punching the pillar, creating new cracks every time, and it seemed to be working. When the pillar seemed to be near its breaking point, Hayato stopped punching and sat back on the ground, panting. 
He had used a lot of chakra and energy and seemed to be tired and unable to continue. Asahi told Hayato that he could continue after a while, and called Naruko. The latter took a deep breath and weaved a few hand signs. She put her hands forward, and wind chakra rushed towards the pillar at great speed. Asahi could sense that the chakra was uneven and not controlled very well, but even this was very skilled for a recent graduate. The wind chakra hit the pillar, causing a cut to appear on it. Also noticing that her method can work, Naruko kept performing the same technique over and over, until the top half of the pillar cut off from the rest of the stone and fell backwards on the ground. Naruko was panting and exhausted, but happy as she had been successful. Asahi gave a small clap. Impressive, Naruko. Even though it is uncontrolled and uneven, you can use elemental chakra. That is quite a feat for a recent graduate. Asahi then continued. Now, it's your turn, Maximus. The aforementioned smiled and stood in front of the remaining pillar. Maximus smirked and told everyone to get back. He pulled out a paper bomb from his pocket and stuck it onto the pillar. He activated it after reaching a safe distance. The explosion happened and the pieces of stone that used to make up the pillar lay around the training field. Asahi chuckled and gave Maximus a slight thump on the back. You're the smartest in this team, it seems. Maximus smiled at the compliment. Asahi now spoke to Naruko and Hayato. Now, you too. Your methods did work, and you managed to break the pillar. But as everyone can see, it took all your energy for that simple task. You learn about paper bombs in seventh grade, yes. Why didn't you use that? Naruko and Hayato gave a nod, Asahi continued explaining. Then why should we use all our energy trying to do it the hard way, when we can do it smartly? Here is the thing, dear students, smart work completes a task, not hard work. Naruko and Hayato looked down as if calling themselves idiots for not knowing such a simple thing. Asahi smiled and spoke. Now, don't blame yourself. It is getting dark now, go back to your homes. We'll start your training tomorrow. Saying this Asahi turned back and started walking towards the training field's entrance. His three students followed soon after, chatting among themselves. The sun was setting, and the yellow rays of it fell on the roofs of the many houses that were lined along the streets of Konoha. As they walked towards the interior of the village, Hayato raised a question. By the way, Maximus, what does the C in your name mean, Julius C. Maximus? Maximus cleared his throat and replied, Well, in Rome it is common practice for men to have their father's name as their middle name. My full name would be Julius Cornelius Maximus. But I only use my middle name in short form, it feels odd to speak up, Julius Cornelius Maximus every time. Hayato giggled, and replied, What would be my name in this format then, Hayato e Musashi? Maximus ignored him and soon left the group when his street on the outskirts came. Naruko and Hayato's houses were in the interior of the village, so they walked on. In Maximus' flat Maximus walked up the stairs, as his flat was on the second floor of the building. It was almost dark now, and the stairs and corridors of the building were dimly lit today. Maximus quietly walked along the corridors, until he arrived at his door, only to find it already unlocked and the lights turned on. Maximus became cautious, taking out a kanai from a pouch, and slowly approached his flat. Maximus slowly entered the flat and into the living room. The lights of the living room were on, and on the sofa sat a man with black hair, a lean body, and tall height. The man was dressed in black trousers, and a black coat over a white undershirt, and black shoes, and he seemed to be reading something. When Maximus entered the flat, the man turned to look back. Uncle, Maximus was surprised, and these words left his mouth. Marcus smiled, and got up from the couch, greeting Maximus. Good evening, dear nephew, I hope the last six years have been comfortable and good? Maximus smiled and replied. Yeah, I've been good. But what brings you here? Maximus replied as they both settled in the living room. Marcus studied the room with his eyes while replying. Well, political matters. But while I was here I thought of meeting you. The Hokage has given me a duplicate key to your flat, so I can evade your privacy whenever I want. Maximus and Marcus chuckled at this. The latter continued. You know, this is our first proper meeting in a few years yeah? We have been exchanging letters for a while now. Maximus nodded and replied. Yeah, it is good to see you. Marcus made himself comfortable on the couch and spoke. I have reviewed your progress as a shinobi, 
and although I am no expert with this as compared to your mentors in the academy, as a former military commander I can easily say that you have been doing good, you're quite talented with this. Maximus gave a smile and thanked him. Marcus looked at his wristwatch and got up. I must go now, Maximus. We may have a proper discussion tomorrow. The governor walked towards the exit, but as he passed Maximus he put his hand on the latter's shoulder, and leaned down to whisper something in his ear. I have also been told of your teammates, they seem all talented. Well, good luck with that redhead girl. Maximus blushed and spoke loudly, it's nothing like that. Marcus just chuckled and walked out of the apartment. It was a chilly morning in early December, and there was very light snowfall. Weak rays of the sun illuminated the area. The Roman camp in the southern land of Lightning was all quiet. They had marched almost 200 kilometers across the coast of the land of Lightning in nine days. The path wasn't easy with numerous skirmishes and minor battles with local samurai, feudal lords, and shinobi garrisons. But the path was easy to traverse, unlike the rough and mountainous terrain you'll face immediately if you go inland. The soldiers in the camp were already awake, but not doing much. Some made campfires to combat the cold, others cooked stew on the fire, and some were busy tending to their damaged armor and gear. The camp was on an easily defensible but large plateau, that directly overlooked the seashore. Quintus Germanicus was also busy in his own right, heading a meeting with all the centurions in the force. The meeting was held in the commander's tent, which was heated by a fire whose smoke could be smelled in the entire tent. They had recently been provided with reinforcements, consisting of 1,000 units, 500 auxiliary horse archers and 500 light cavalry, to be exact. The meeting's topic was how the campaign should proceed. Titus Superbus, one of the prominent centurions, spoke. Yesterday evening, as we all know, arrived reinforcements from Rome in the form of cavalry, which were crucial for our campaign. We have also received news that we would soon be joined by more Roman troops and Konoha Shinobi to mount a full-scale assault on Kumogakir. Thus, I propose we should remain still and wait for further reinforcements. Another centurion scoffed at this, and replied, Wait and be sitting ducks for the Kumo Shinobi? Please, Sir Titus, our enemies are not the usual field armies of the battlefield. These are professional spies, saboteurs, and assassins, that are trained just for that since childhood not to mention their abilities with chakra. I suggest that we divide our forces into smaller contingents and march through enemy territory while ravaging the countryside and capturing towns. This will cripple the enemy's ability and will to fight. But the centurion was opposed by Quintus himself, who finally spoke. Our advantage against the shinobi lies in our discipline, teamwork, and sheer numbers, that we can easily surround and overpower the shinobi who are in much smaller numbers. The mountain passes that lead inland in this nation are pretty isolated, and any passing force is very vulnerable to ambushes. If we divide our forces and march separately, that is if we even march inland, then they can easily finish us off one by one before the contingents can meet again. The enemy's economy is dependent on its vast number of coastal towns and ports, through which it has access to and controls many trade routes by sea. I suggest that we send the 1,000 cavalry we received to ravage these coastal towns and the countryside around them. While we shall march to capture the Turtle Island, which has been located not far from here and is vital for Kumogakir. There were a few whispers here and there among the centurions, but all seemed to agree with their commander. The Primus Pilus, who was the best centurion in the legion and commanded the best 120 men, as well as the right hand man of the commander, spoke. I support General Quintus' idea. We aren't yet capable of mounting an assault on Kumogakir itself, but we're still powerful enough to capture this Turtle Island. Soon, we will also be equipped with two cannons and several trebuchets from Byzantium, that will allow us to capture the fortified coastal settlements of the Land of Lightning. I am in favor of the general. There were murmurs and talking among the centurions and tribunes, but no one objected. Quintus finally spoke calmly. So it is decided then, we will march over to the Turtle Island and capture it, while the cavalry, aided by the artillery we are soon to receive, will ravage the Land of Lightning's villages and towns. After a brief pause, he continued. I am appointing Tribune Publius Agricola as the commander of the cavalry force. The rest of you, assemble your men and inform them of the decision. We will be marching off after lunch. After this, the meeting slowly dispersed, as the centurions made their way to their respective centuries. The Roman camp was all of a sudden full of activity, as the soldiers were ordered to pack up their belongings and dismantle the buildings and tents, 
save the cooking tools. The soldiers weren't too happy to know that they would be marching during this cold, but orders were orders. The most essential pillar of the Roman military is discipline, and it must be maintained at all costs. It took several hours to completely pack everything, and after taking their midday meal the soldiers were off once again. At approximately six o'clock, near the border of the lands of frost and lightning. It was a blizzard. The strong and cold winds were howling as they hit the many armored soldiers who were somehow making their way through the snow. The entire surface was covered with snow, enough that an average man's entire foot below the knee could get stuck in it. The soldiers marched in disorganized but identifiable lines, one after another, using their spears as support to get through the deep snow. But while the common soldier struggled, it wasn't easy for the higher officials either. Although they had been granted a horse to use, the steed also found it quite hard to traverse the snow and blizzard. The eyes of the mounts and pack animals had to be covered with leather straps to protect them against the strong winds, while the soldiers tilted their helmets downwards as well. Quintus Germanicus marched at the front of the column, while the Primus Pilus, who was Janus by name, rode at the back with a small personal retinue of soldiers to help any stragglers and those struggling. There had been rumors and sightings of marauders and robbers around the snow covered flatland, who kill the soldiers that wander too far away from the main column and rob them. Cruel weather, this is. One of Janus' retinue spoke. Janus replied in a low tone while blocking the wind with his left hand. Yeah, this is going to be a difficult march, another of the soldiers agreed. Quite right, sir. This continent is quite strange, we're facing blizzards and snow up here, while there lies a desert in the south. The Primus Pilus raised an eyebrow. Really? Well, this is an interesting land then, I suppose? Janus was interrupted by a soldier in the front, who called for everyone's attention. Look there, it seems to be a group of men. And indeed there were approximately ten soldiers, resting around a warm spring covered in their thick portable blankets, with their javelins planted upwards in the ground that formed a circle around them, and a fire lit nearby. Janus approached them, and spoke to them. Get up, you all. If you don't catch up with the rest of the line, the robbers may get you. One of the soldiers replied, These men are too tired and sick to continue in this blizzard, sir. They need rest, I am healthy and merely here to watch over them. Janus thought for a while, and replied. Well then, let them rest. I will send another man here to watch over them with you. We will send a scouting party in the morning to come and fetch you. The resting men weakly smiled, and one of them spoke in a weak voice. You are very kind, sir. Janus merely rode back to his retinue, where he commanded a soldier at the back of the line to go and watch over the sick men, and then continued on his way. Janus and his retinue slowly continued on their path, watching for any potential dangers, but suddenly, an uproar was heard at the front of the line. Janus became cautious, drawing out his blade and leading the riders to the front with some difficulty over the snow. But upon reaching the vanguard, the sight that greeted them was one of joy instead of danger. There was a village in front of their eyes, but not an ordinary one. These were burrows dug inside a large hill, with a few huts out in the open. The soldiers were celebrating, as they wouldn't be sleeping out in the open during this blizzard. Janus also sighed relief, when he was called over by Quintus. The Primus Pilus trotted over to the commander, who greeted him. Ah, Janus, isn't this a relieving sight? It will be dark soon, and we will at least have a roof over our heads. Janus looked at his commander and replied. Well, we will have to speak with the inhabitants here, Quintus nodded and pointed towards the village. Let's go over and talk to them, then. Saying this, the general rode towards the village, followed by Janus and their bodyguard. Inside the village the inhabitants of the village watched the Romans closely from their small, circular windows. There was only one entrance into the village. On the outside, it seemed as if the burrow like houses were stacked on each other but in reality, a system of tunnels and paths connected the numerous rooms and houses. As Janus and Quintus got closer with their horses, they could see the figures of three men outside the village's entrance. Upon coming closer, both of them saw one old man who used a simple walking stick, and two younger adults waiting for them outside the walls. The two Roman commanders dismounted their horses and slightly bowed to the old man in a show of respect. The old man returned a nod and spoke in a frail voice. Greetings, strangers. May I ask about your purpose here? I am the headman of this village. Janus looked at the old man. He was probably in his sixties, short, lean, 
and a shaven face with wrinkles all over it. The old man had red hair, that was probably brighter during his youth but had lost their color, he leaned on a walking stick he held in his left hand, but his back was straight. The other two younger men also had red hair and looked identical to the old man in facial features. We are an army from Rome, village elder. We only seek shelter and food for the night, if your village can provide that. The old man looked behind Janus and Quintus, and after a brief moment spoke. I doubt there will be any food left for us for the winter if we go on to feed your army, Quintus replied with a friendly gesture. Don't worry about that, sir. We have our rations of food and wine, we will only need a little fraction of your food to properly feed our men. Moreover, we also request that you shelter our men through this harsh blizzard. The younger men were annoyed at the suggestion, while the elder raised an eyebrow, and replied. Well, why should we do that? We are willing to pay you for your help, about thirty-five pounds of gold and silver. I can conclude from the size of your village that if each house can adjust with six men for one night, all will be well. The three men were shocked to hear the payment they had been promised, but the elder kept negotiating. We demand that the payment will be done beforehand. Of course, we accept that. Quintus quickly replied and commanded three of his men to bring the payment. The higher officials of the army were invited inside the elder's house for discussion. The soldiers were assigned where they would sleep today, followed by the centurions and other higher officers, and now only Quintus and Janus remained in the room with the elder. The chamber was lit up by flickering torches and candles, while the blizzard could be seen raging outside from the window. The room had an earthen smell and no proper walls as the hill did the job while the soldiers outside seemed to celebrate, eat, and drink. Your men make a lot of noise, the old man commented. They're just jubilant about having got out of the blizzard. Janus, sipping on some tea that had been served to them replied. The old man adjusted himself on his seat, and then spoke, grasping both Janus and Quintus' attention. Now that we have a deal and are on good terms, it is time for a proper introduction. My name is Hikaru Uzumaki and these two young lads here are my sons Inari and Kido. Quintus raised an eyebrow, Uzumaki. Why, is there something wrong? The old man asked calmly. Well, we thought the clan was all wiped out. Hikaru sighed and briefly looked down. His face looked normal, but it seemed he was grieving on the inside. If that's what you think, then you men have been misinformed. Janus and Quintus showed interest in the topic, Hikaru continued. I suppose you may have heard about the fall of Uzushiogakur. The two Romans gave a nod. It all happened during the Second Shinobi World War, which lasted three years. It was between the forces of Iwa, Kumo, and Kiri on one side, while Konoha, Uzushio, and Suna on the other. Uzushiogakur at that time was a growing power, not recognized as a great village but likely to soon become one. The specialty of the Uzumaki was in their sealing techniques. The clan is even believed to be the creator of Fuenjutsu. We also had exceptionally high life force and chakra reserves, much more than even our Senju cousins. I was a young lad back then, probably 16 or 15, Chunin. We were assigned alongside another squad to aid Konoha in an offensive. I do not remember the objectives well, but we were fighting with Iwa Shinobi. We were successful in the attack and returned to Konoha triumphant. Me and my team stayed there for a day after which we headed off back to Uzushio. As we approached the island, there was black smoke rising. We were alarmed, and made our way to our village, only to find. The old man paused and seemed to almost whimper. One of his sons gave him a glass of water and after a brief pause Hikaru continued with his narration. Only to find it in ruins. From some nearby villages, we gathered that the attack had happened three days previously, while we were away on a mission. Okami. Oh, the destruction we witnessed. The tall stone buildings were brought down. The water in the moat that surrounded the inner village was so mixed with blood that we refrained from drinking it. And what had they done to the central Azukaja's tower? It could have been said that the building never existed had the base of the structure not survived. We could see the corpses of our kith kin. They didn't even spare the children. At this point, it seemed the old man was on the verge of breaking down but the wounds had probably been soothed after all those years, and he continued with a sad voice. After that, me and my teammates were given an offer by Konoha to join that village, alongside many other surviving Uzumaki and Namikaze clan members. I might have forgotten to tell you, but the Namikaze also used to live in Uzushio. They were a minor clan, 
related to the Uzumaki by blood. It was like the relationship between the Uchiha and Fuma clans, except our relationship was much closer as the clans lived together. The Namikaze clan was also blessed with large chakra reserves but had no Keke Jenke like us. Nevertheless, they were like family. The small number of surviving Namikaze clan members accepted the offer and migrated to Konoha, where according to my knowledge, they mixed with other clans and the civilian shinobi and quickly ceased to exist as a distinct clan. While the surviving Uzumaki scattered in the different parts of the world. I settled in this remote village, and have been here since. We had heard from the other survivors of the attack that the clan would have been completely wiped out, had it not been for an allied force of 500 Romans and their commander, Lucius Julius Calidus. Although they weren't many, they fought heroically and are one of the key reasons the survivors were allowed to escape the slaughter and the clan survived. For that, I am eternally grateful to the Roman state. There was silence for a while in the room, which was broken by Quintus. Yes, from previous records I've come to know that there was a Roman cohort present to defend the village. It almost dragged Rome into the conflict, but it was soon resolved with negotiations. Hikaru nodded, and got up, anyways, I have told you much. It is time that you rest. You're my guests, so I have arranged for separate rooms for you. My sons will accompany you there. Good night, lords. After having finished their tea, the Primus Pilus and Quintus were escorted by the two young men to two small yet spacious rooms, with a comfy bed, table, and a few candles lit around. Quintus' room was on the exterior part of the hill, and out of his glass window, he could see the blizzard outside. It was still raging on, the general wondered how long it would last. The snow will probably be a few centimeters deeper when they move on in the morning. Quintus was anxious about the campaign plans, and how would they proceed tomorrow. But he put these ideas to rest along with himself, as he turned and rolled around in the bed, trying to fall asleep. It was a foggy morning. The blizzard of last night had subsided, and all seemed quiet. The soldiers were beginning to emerge into the snowy plain surrounding the village. They were preparing to set off again, after eating breakfast, of course. Quintus and other higher officials were provided their rooms by the village elder. Rank comes with its benefits, and they were preparing at their own pace. Quintus had gotten up early the previous night being a sleepless one. He couldn't pinpoint a reason for that, perhaps anxiety? But overall, he didn't look as active as usual and seemed tired. He quickly drank a cup of Japanese tea that had been served to him, he found the taste odd, as compared to the usual tea they had back home. But it did the job of arousing his sleepy consciousness, to some extent. It was impossible to take a bath in this cold, so Quintus just washed his face with water so cold it had pieces of ice in it and adjusted his hairline. He took a modest meal, that was prepared by the village's cooks for his today. The food wasn't much but filling, rice, vegetables, some meat, and wine. But the, silverware, was weird, with two small pieces of stick for him to use, he preferred to use a fork and spoon instead. After getting into his formal clothes, Quintus, along with Janus and some other very high officials, met the elder of the village for the last time. The soldiers were just about ready for their march again, and Janus had sent a scouting party on horseback to fetch the ten sick soldiers safely back, and they had returned with nine alive and one dead due to the cold. Quintus greeted the village elder and spoke. We are grateful for your village's hospitality, sir. I hope it wasn't much inconvenience? Hikaru weakly laughed and replied. It wasn't at all. After that big payment, Quintus also laughed and got on top of his horse. Very well then, dear village elder. We march off once more, it was a pleasure talking with you. The elder gave a nod, and Quintus rode away towards the army with his officers. Couldn't we just take over the village for the night with our men? What was the need for such a hefty payment? The Primus Pilus questioned his commander when they were some distance away from the elder. Quintus looked at Janus and replied. Yes, we could have done that very easily, but having a good name with the local population is better, or else we'll find it difficult to obtain food supplies and shelter for our men. Thirty pounds of silver is a large amount for these villagers who'd never left their remote settlement, but it's easy to obtain through taxing, tribute, and take. Besides, I've also read that this region used to be a part of the land of frost, but was lost to the land of lightning in some previous war. So the population here already despises Kumogakir like us. The Primus Pilus gave a nod of satisfaction, and then quickly rode to his designated place in the marching column. The soldiers were now prepared for the journey ahead and were organized to march in columns of three lines for each cohort. 
Today's weather was clear and favorable, and the grassy flatland encompassing the border regions between the lands of lightning and frost was completely white and covered with snow as far as one could see until land met the sea on the coast. Quintus placed himself at the helm of the army, marching foremost ahead of the soldiers with the camp prefect, who was responsible for taking care of logistics and supplies, beside him. As well as the Aquilifer, who carried the Golden Eagle standard of the legion, and also managed its finances. Janus was at the rear as usual, with his retinue of mounted soldiers. In this formation, the army marched off with a slow but steady pace over the thick snow covered plains, and the villagers silently watched the world's greatest battle machine roll off into the distance from their windows. At the Turtle Island, several hours later, the Turtle Island was currently floating near the coast in the south, as it always did. The coast was rocky and rough as usual, it had a valley like terrain because of a large gap between two cliffs near the coast. Currently, the giant turtle is present roughly 500 meters away from this coast. It was midday, and the light rays of the sun illuminated the area during these winter times. A cold breeze was blowing, which produced whistle like sounds as they passed and hit the cliffs and rocks. There was some snow on the clifftops, but not as much as back inland. A long column of Roman soldiers came marching down the slopes of the hills. This terrain was easy to traverse, so the legionaries marched in a tight formation each cohort marching separately. The Aquilifer marched at the front, carrying the Golden Eagle standard of the legion. Beside him fluttered the banner of the Via Laude, the banner consisting of Legio V written on the top, the symbol of an elephant in the middle, and Laude at the bottom. The legion was quite old, established almost 2,000 years ago, and was famed to be the legion led by Scipio Africanus against the Carthaginians, and had thus received the elephant as its symbol. Now, this legion was here to snatch the Turtle Island from Kumogakir. The soldiers stopped at the coast, and across the waters sat the Turtle Island in front of their eyes. But to reach there they must build boats, but that will take time, so for now they set up camp. Their tents were large, as each one was purposed to house all the eight men of a contraburnium, but the centurions and other higher officials had the privilege to have their tent. In no time the Romans set up a camp on the spot, while the thirty engineers in the legion were called to start working on the boats. A quarter of the legion was sent into the surrounding woods to collect wood from the pine trees. The Romans were encamped in a valley like terrain, with mountains and hills on all sides, and only a rough dirt path leading down into the plain. There were two sea cliffs on either side of the valley, which formed an opening like route into the sea. The cliff's summits were plain, and a rough path led to the top. The engineers were at work creating rough plans for the boats to be built, when suddenly Quintus came, briskly walking towards them. What are you all doing? Quintus asked, the chief engineer greeted him formally and replied. Well sir, as you can see, we are building the boats to reach the island. Who said we're gonna go there? The engineers seemed confused, Quintus smiled and continued, pointing toward the two cliffs. You see those cliffs, they are plain on the top. I will send the wood and raw material but you must assemble two trebuchets each on those two cliffs. I believe the artillery batteries would be able to fling the boulders there, right? The engineers seemed confused at first but obeyed and started to make their way up the cliff, while several dozen legionaries were sent to assist them. As the engineers cut the wood and hammered the keels, Quintus stood on the seashore, gazing towards the Turtle Island. He was lost in thought when Janus approached him from behind. I heard you've ordered the engineers to assemble siege engines on the cliffs. Quintus slightly turned his head towards his subordinate, and replied with arms crossed. Yes. It is not necessary that we must rush the island while taking hundreds of casualties. We'll just force them to attack us with barrages of artillery fire and trebuchet shots. But how long will this take? Janus questioned, Quintus replied while gazing forward. Probably two days, at most. Janus was surprised. But, that seems too much. We are only giving the barbarians more time to mount a counterattack. Quintus finally turned to Janus and replied. The ninjas will be forced to assault us if we just bombard them with artillery pieces. If they don't, the island will be nothing more than rubble. So they must fight on our terms or die a disgraceful death. Saying this, the general made his way to his tent. But, Janus was quickly interrupted by Quintus, who spoke with a stern voice. There's a reason I'm your superior, Janus. So trust me, and do what is ordered. I assure you, we won't take more than fifty casualties at most. Quintus left the beach and into his tent. 
Janice didn't speak again and merely gazed at the engineers and soldiers working on the clifftop. On the Turtle Island the Kumo Shinobi on the island watched intently, what was going on on the seashore for the last two days. There was a lot of activity, and the Shinobi knew that this was no friendly force. Killer B was also present there, currently in his twenties. He was still training to control the eight tails sealed inside of him. He was still skilled enough and granted he was the brother of the Rakage, he came to be recognized as one of the leaders of the Shinobi on the Turtle Island. The Shinobi were meeting in the island's central building on how to address the issue of these attackers. There were roughly 120 ninjas present on the island, very small numbers but also one of the most skilled in Kumogakure. The central building was wide, with many rooms on the ground floor, there was also a basement used as a storeroom, and a tower-like structure projecting upwards and accessible with stairs from the inside. The building was made of brown mud bricks, and pine wood, and looked old. In the interior, a central hall could be accessed from the entrance, while there were rooms on the left and right, mainly serving as the residence of the most skilled shinobi present. The central hall was choked with people, all wearing the kumogakure headband and talking amongst themselves. Inside the hall, there was also a raised platform on which stood Killer B and some other, intimidating shinobi. One of them, with tanned skin, gray hair, lean, and an average height came forward. He had covered his head with a piece of cloth, on which was sewn the kumogakure headband, and there were also some scars on the left side of his face, his left eye was covered with an eye patch, and he had a goatee. He gathered everyone's attention, and announced straight to the point. As all of you know, there is an enemy force at our gates. They are encamped on the seashore but seem to be doing nothing. What are your suggested solutions for this? Killer B replied. Why don't we attack them first? We are small in numbers, but quality beats quantity. If we can take them by surprise, their entire force will be annihilated. Another high-ranking ninja chuckled and replied. It's not as simple as that, Lord Killer B. We can't just rush at them and expect them to be shocked out of their wits. I believe we should escape without any precious casualties, by commanding Genbu, the giant turtle, to sail away. The gray-haired shinobi scoffed and replied. We are no cowards, we don't need to run away from these civilians who can't even use chakra. I am in favor of Lord Killer B's idea, only if it gets a more refined strategy. The shinobi argued thus, and voices began to be raised in the hall as the previously peaceful debate broke out into something similar to an argument. Suddenly, a loud crashing noise came from the outside. The turtle also gave a cry of agony. The shinobi in the assembly hall rushed outside, only to see volleys of burning stone flying towards the turtle island. The stones hit the many buildings and structures on the turtle's back and even its exoskeleton. In the distance, on the sea cliffs, could be seen about six large machines flinging these stones at the island. The hails of burning stone hit the turtle island with deadly accuracy. The six large machines run day and night, each one requiring over a dozen soldiers to operate it. The trebuchet was like a giant sling. There was a strong wooden base and one long pole, with heavy weights on one end and the other connected to a sling. Large stone boulders coated with Greek fire were loaded on the sling and lit up, the sling and the wooden trebuchet were coated with damp leather hides to prevent them from catching fire and the large weight on the other end of the pole was lowered at great speed to hurl the boulders to a great distance. So, these huge machines and their operators worked for long hours and mounted more and more pressure on the bombarded enemy to retaliate. Quintus slowly ascended the rough path leading to the top of the sea cliff, where the engineers were operating the machines. He was a middle-aged man now, and climbing such paths upward was seemingly a challenge to him, but again, it was his brain that brought him to this position, not his muscles. This was another distinction between the shinobi and Romans, Quintus thought. He had come to know that most of the shinobi of this continent were organized into villages, the exceptions were rogues and independent mercenaries, mercenary bands. In the villages, the leader was chosen based on his prowess as a warrior, and in many villages like Sanagakure and Iwagakure, a dynastic system was followed, and the same bloodline has been ruling over the village since its founding. This was in stark contrast to the Roman system, where capability earned someone a position. Individual combat skills were good, but they didn't matter much as the Romans mostly relied on manpower and teamwork. Moreover, leadership and administrative skills were what mattered, if you can lead then you will find it easy to climb the hierarchical ladder in the government. Most of the prominent figures in Rome's history were no great individual warriors, 
who could slay 100 foes at once, but it was their brain and charisma that led them to greatness. This difference was also probably the reason that the Shinobi continent was plagued by bloody conflicts for most of its history and had never experienced a true age of prosperity. The leader in these villages was chosen based on how many he could kill on the battlefield, whether he was related to the previous leader or not, whether was he from a clan favored by the village, was he on friendly terms with other clans. Not on the fact that he could lead the village or not, and can he handle the administrative and civic duties. The shinobi villages were too dependent upon conflict for their survival, it was their livelihood, so a steady supply of war was necessary. The leaders of the villages talked of pride, power, wealth, glory, etc. in their ventilated meeting rooms, sipping on cups of tea, while the common civilians and peasants had to bear the brunt of the conflict. In this constant tussle, even entire clans and bloodlines were eradicated, like the Uzumaki and the Yuki clans. Suna was distant but not one to spare, Kiri was ruthless and cold-blooded in its massacres of entire families and clans, Iwa could go to any level to achieve what it desired, Kumo was the most aggressive, and always on a cold war with the other villages. In this political structure, Konoha seemed the most morally approving. But again, Quintus thought, their, will of fire, was just another example of nationalistic propaganda, aimed at somehow justifying any conflict in the eyes of its populace. As Quintus thus thought, he finally reached the top of the cliff. He suddenly came back to the present and didn't seem to be aware himself why he was immersed in such deep thoughts. But he promptly remembered his original purpose here and slowly walked towards the engineers operating the siege engine. The soldiers were busy with their work, some bringing the giant boulders to be used, some operating the machine itself, while others brought Greek fire from the main camp. They didn't notice Quintus at first, and the latter also didn't say anything, merely gazing forwards at the Turtle Island, now subject to bombardment from six giant machines, with cold eyes. Quintus only turned his face to look at the trebuchet beside him when it was about to fling another giant projectile. At this point the soldiers finally noticed their commander and abruptly stopped their work to salute their superior formally, Quintus merely signaled them to continue working and called Janus, who was directing the soldiers there, to him. So, how is this work proceeding? Quintus questioned softly. Well sir, as you can see the plan is proceeding well. The machines are running smoothly, but they are giving a rough time to the enemies on the island. Quintus smiled and put his hand on the Janus' shoulder. It is astounding how something so destructive as this can be built in two days, right? Well, I am assured that the plan is proceeding well. Janus gave a nod, returned the small smile, Quintus continued. I want you to lead 3,000 soldiers to rush the island tomorrow night. Until then, tell the engineers to start building a small flotilla. I doubt there would be many of them left after this bombardment. I would like you to follow me and devise a refined strategy on a map, yeah? Janus nodded and went back to the soldiers, commanding several of the engineers to go and start working on boats. Quintus stayed on the cliff for 15 minutes, casually watching the siege machines rain down havoc on the island and hearing the shrieks from the turtle itself. After this he silently trekked down the cliff with the same difficulty, but no personal reflections this time, only the pain in the knees. Janus followed the general but with no difficulty. In Quintus' tent the tent was large and quite spacious, lit up by torches on the corners. There was only a single bed that was pushed to one corner, and a large square wooden table in the middle, on which was spread out a detailed plan of the area, courtesy of the Roman scouts and there were also several bronze candlesticks lit up on the corners. Janus and Quintus were seated beside each other, in front of the table. Quintus leaned back on his chair, while Janus used a long stick to point out and explain his plan on the map. Now, as we can see this island is very close to the coast, so small boats will be enough to ferry the soldiers across the waters. However, we must make the landing of all the soldiers at once. Doing so in turn will leave us very vulnerable to any attacks from the enemy. Quintus gave a nod in understanding, but replied calmly. Well, we all know you are gonna assault the island with boats, but how exactly will you do it? I suggest you send the boats filled with archers and skirmishers at the front, they will clear any visible danger on the coast and make a beachhead for other troops to land. Janus smiled. Again, you forget. These are not the standard field armies we used to face back home. These shinobi are stealthy warriors with extraordinary abilities. However, they only emphasize individual prowess, a lot more than coordination and discipline. They are only 120, 
and we are 3000. Okay, even if we go by your tactics, these are the best 120 warriors our enemy has to offer. However, Janus remained adamant. No doubt we will take some casualties, but we are still at a big advantage. You see, since we will be assaulting the island from all sides, even this force of 120 shinobi will be spread thin around the island's perimeter. And if even one section breaks, as it inevitably will, it'll allow us to easily flank the others and eventually cause the enemy force to collapse. We can't just use those effective but slow machines to force the enemy out when there can be a relief force from Kumobakure closing distance with us every moment. Quintus thought for a moment with closed eyes, and then spoke with a smirk. Well then, you're quite the impatient type for a military commander, but your strategy is excellent. Very well then, I permit you to assault the island tomorrow evening. Until then, command the engineers to build some boats. After hearing this, Janus saluted his superior and left the tent. Quintus stretched his body a little and laid down on his small yet comfy bed, taking a short nap. Two days later it was almost midnight, and the full moon and stars shone bright in the sky, casting their reflections on the sea. The atmosphere was cold, and cool winds sent chills down one's spine. The entire area was enshrouded with darkness, and only torches were able to grant visibility. The Roman camp was noisy at this hour, with some heating themselves with the campfires, and others cooking food but most were busy pushing the vessels into the sea. It had taken the engineers and their helpers two days to build these ships, but the time taken was worth it. The ships weren't large, but still able to carry 250 men each. They had no sails, as the intended target was close enough to row there. The ships had a typical Roman design but were essentially mini-versions, and were essentially 12 in total. The Roman soldiers pushed the galleys into the waters with some difficulty and then proceeded to man the boats. Each soldier took up his place beside an oar and prepared for the commander's signal to row. Janus and Quintus watched them from some distance, the former getting ready to step on board himself. Quintus was in his usual gear, but this time Janus was wearing a helmet with a white plume, a decorated cuirass, a red cape cloak that hung down to his knees, and he had a spatha hanging down from his waist. Janus walked towards the ship, ready to board it after the soldiers when Quintus spoke to him. You are wearing your best clothes today, all shiny and decorated, Janus looked back and smirked. Who knows, perhaps I'll die in the battle. At least I'll be looking like a great warrior who has fallen. Quintus smiled back, and taunted. You look like a bride, all decorated and beatified to go to her new house. Janus wasn't offended, and instead replied. Well, we were married to battle the day we signed up as legionaries, and the battlefield is our in-laws, Quintus said no more and just folded his hands and watched Janus board the ship and the vessels sailing away towards the island. As the ships neared the island, the soldiers prepared for a landing. The ships landed safely and in the darkness, hundreds of torches descended from the large wooden vessels and started to organize themselves in columns and battle formations. After approximately 20 minutes or so, the ships were docked away at the beach. While the 3,000 soldiers almost surrounded the entire coast of the island with their sheer numbers. The soldiers marched in tight rectangular formations, with their shields in front of them, and the centurion commanding his soldiers from the front, and at the back, his optio encouraged the men forward. Each century was organized separately, this was to elongate the Roman line and allow for easy flanking. Janus himself was personally leading forward his 120 men, who were the best in the legion, and he was also aided by a personal bodyguard of 10 knights. There were archers at the rear as well, ready to provide support. The soldiers slowly marched up the coast, into the island. There was little visibility beyond a range of 20 meters, but the soldiers could witness the great destruction the trebuchets had rained down on the island. Buildings lay decimated in ruins, while even the grass had large burned patches from the Greek fire. There were also several burned and crushed corpses of humans, even the shinobi weren't lucky sometimes. The soldiers were strictly told to look where they were stepping, as the shinobi might have laid traps. While marching inland, small squads of soldiers were also sent around to set fire to any supplies or houses they found. This was to destroy the enemy's resources and also as a psychological weapon. After the Romans were a fair distance away from their ships and inside the island, a sudden attack occurred, as hundreds of canai came flying towards the soldiers. However, the Romans' large cylindrical scutum shields easily blocked the projectiles, with only a few soldiers getting slightly injured. 
Immediately after this attack, the centurions started shouting orders around, and the men became alert and braced for any other incoming attack while chanting battle hymns in Latin to not let their morale and confidence drop. The archers took positions in the ruins, providing good cover, and were ready to rain arrows in any direction. The Roman columns suddenly halted, as the soldiers prepared for any incoming attack. And an attack did come, with a second volley of canai. But this time, there were paper bombs attached to the projectiles. The canai started exploding, and the Romans soon realized what was going on. Some soldiers panicked but were pushed back into formation by their comrades in the rear and the centurion's words. The Roman formations became tighter than ever, their shoulders touching as they braced their shields against the explosions. But the paper bombs weren't strong enough, and soon the Romans resumed their advance. Trumpets resonated throughout the battlefield. This was a signal system for simple commands like halt, retreat, or advance, the command determined by the number of blares. Cries of both war and agony rang throughout the island as the Romans and Shinobi finally clashed. The latter created many clones to make up for their numerical disadvantage, but all the clones were dispelled after one volley of javelins and arrows from the Roman side. The Shinobi kept making clones and even attempted to get behind the Roman lines stealthily and flank them, but again, it wasn't possible with the sheer number of enemies they faced. The Romans slowly advanced, grinding through the clones. No major technique was undertaken by the shinobi up till now, but it soon would be. Among the clones, there appeared a figure with shady eyes a grey beard, and an eye patch over his left eye. The shinobi formed two clones around him, and the three of them formed yellow lightning spheres in their hands. After the spheres had been formed, they were shot at the Romans, and when the lightning spheres hit the heavily armored Romans and exploded, it caused quite some casualties. But after this, the shinobi didn't use this technique again, as Janus understood that the technique was hard to use and not something that could be constantly repeated. All around the front, enemy shinobi were using ranged jutsus to fight the Romans and causing unnecessary casualties, while the soldiers were like sitting ducks. The shinobi were good with their chakra abilities, but once they had to engage in direct melee combat they were easily beaten by the Romans, who had more experience, training, physique, and weapons for it. Their armor and weapons were also of a far superior quality as compared to anything locally produced in the shinobi continent. Recognizing this, Janus ordered a direct charge against the enemy, to all his soldiers. Trumpets blared and the order was passed down to each centurion, but it took a while to do so. Suddenly, the Romans disengaged from the shinobi and orderly retreated about ten meters. All remained quiet for some time as the Roman soldiers had disengaged and the shinobi too wanted to take a breath after the fierce fighting, only the groans and cries of those injured and wounded could be heard. After this short period of quietness, the trumpets on the Roman side loudly blared again, and the Romans suddenly charged forward with all their strength, shouting and giving battle cries. The Romans didn't even stop when they had engaged in combat with their foes and kept up the momentum and charged forward, partly because they were also being pushed forward by their comrades. This strategy did work, as the shinobi were overwhelmed and opted to retreat to the island, but one section of the enemy force finally collapsed, and the Roman soldiers there charged forward with all their might and broke through, flanking the other shinobi still fighting and massacring them. The soldiers were carried away by the spirit of battle and bloodthirstiness and left the corpses of their enemies unrecognizable. Amidst the battle, Janus confronted the shinobi who had created the lighting spheres earlier. The commander raised forward his shield and put his spatha in the striking position, and surged forwards towards his foe. The two engaged in a sword duel, Janus having an advantage with his tall cylindrical shield and almost impenetrable armor. The enemy ninja was also very talented and managed to land a few hits on Janus, but all except one ever managed to pierce the Roman commander's armor, such was the skill of Roman smiths and armorers. But seeing the rest of the line collapse, the shinobi left the duel and decided to retreat. That was the last Quintus saw of him amidst the chaos of the battle, and his fate remained unknown. Either he was chopped up into pieces by the zealous Roman soldiers or managed to escape. But overall, the Romans had won the day. Most of the Kumo shinobi were massacred in the battle, while the remaining tried to put up a last stand around the main central building of the island. But their efforts failed as they were out of chakra and were showered with javelins and arrows. The aftermath of the assault in the morning, the Romans on Turtle Island plundered the buildings and corpses they had found, 
They also greatly celebrated their victory over the barbarians with wine and good food. But apart from that they were also mourning and honorably burying their dead fellow soldiers. Janus was waiting on the seashore, for Quintus' ship. The commander of the Roman force had been greatly pleased to know of the victory, and now made his way towards the island. As Janus lay waiting, the ship finally appeared in the distance, sailing with great speed. After some fifteen minutes, the ship finally reached the beach, and out of it stepped Quintus. With a smile on his face, and congratulated Janus. Well well, Lucius Janus Piso, you have today won us essentially the main objective of this campaign. I must congratulate you, and I appreciate your strategic thinking, even though you're quite impatient. Janus was pleased to hear the compliment, and replied with a smile. Thanks, sir. I am greatly pleased to hear this from you. Quintus walked closer to Janus, and the two men started to wander towards the ruined island, talking. So, did you find anything about our secondary objective? Janus looked at Quintus and replied. Well, no corpse that has been found is identified as his. We also uncovered some files there about every shinobi present and discovered that about a dozen were missing during our assault. I speculate that the Eight Tails Jinchuriki, alongside several others, fled the island via ship before the assault. Well, that's not good to hear, but nevertheless, we have won a great victory today over the barbarians, and the credit goes to you, my friend. Let's worry about the campaign later, for now we celebrate. Saying this, the two men walked towards the Roman camp pitched in Turtle Island, specifically to the wine rations. A. The Rakage, sat in his seat, gritting his teeth. He was in the council room, and in front of him were seated the councillors, elders, and other high officials of Kumogakir. The whole room was quiet, and nobody made a single sound. Only the Rakage was grunting in anger and breathing heavily. The reason for this tense situation was that the news of the loss of Turtle Island had finally reached Kumogakir. The Rakage, who had a reputation for being ill tempered and irritable, was unusually calm this time, but his anger could burst out any second. The Rakage's closest advisor and assistant finally broke the silence in a calm voice, but revealed slight hints of fear and worry. S. So, Lord Rakage, how should we handle this situation? The Rakage remained quiet, while another counselor spoke in a low voice. I think we should proceed with the attack on Konoha, it will weaken Konoha and prevent them from any offensive maneuvers against us. Another counselor objected. We should propose a peace treaty with Konoha and Rome. Hiruzen prioritizes peace above everything, so we can settle this conflict without any loss, like how the Third Hokage ended the Third Great Ninja War with such terms even when they were about to win. We can't trust the Romans however, those outsiders will not settle with a mere truce, they won't be content even if we empty our treasury before them. Killer B, who had escaped Turtle Island shortly before its fall, and went back to Kumogakir, sharply objected. We ain't cowards, to be scared so easily we will keep fighting till the last man and the last breath. The Rakage quietly listened, as the council debated the next move, but suddenly, he spoke in a calm but irritated voice. All of you leave, I want to think about this. The councillors looked at each other at first, but this time the Rakage thundered. Didn't you hear me? Leave. This roaring command was enough for the councillors to quickly leave their seats, and hurry outside. The Rakage sat quietly in the empty council room, in thought. The meeting room was on the second floor of the Rakage building, it had windows on three sides, through which came sunshine. There were electric lights in the room, there was a rectangular table in the middle, and chairs around it. Suddenly, the lights in the room went off, and a figure appeared before the Rakage. He was standing at the other end of the room, only his clothes visible, which was a long black cloak with designs of red clouds on it. The Rakage got up from his seat and sternly questioned. Who's there? The figure came forward where its face was now visible in the sunlight coming through the windows. The man wore an orange mask with circular designs, leading down to only one eye hole. The figure slowly walked forward, and spoke in a cold voice. Greetings, Lord Rakage. It seems you aren't in a good mood today. The Rakage asked again, now preparing for an attack. Answer the question, who are you, and how did you get inside? The man slowly walked closer to A, and spoke in a careless voice. You're asking too many questions, Lord Rakage. Let's start with only one. As the masked man spoke, the Rakage suddenly disappeared in front of him, and the next second he was behind the masked man, 
entirely covered with glowing lightning chakra and prepared to land a punch on the masked man's head. A proceeded with his attack, but his fist went right through the masked man's body, and the latter disappeared into what seemed a portal emerging from his eyes. The rakage was puzzled and angry at the same time when the masked man appeared behind A and placed a kanai on his neck and a movement restriction seal on his chest. Immediately, the rakage found himself unable to move. Full of rage, he used all his might to move his hand and managed to get away from the masked man, now face to face with him. The latter chuckled and spoke. It's amusing, how the rakage of Kumogakir could have been neutralized so easily. But don't perceive this as all the strength I have, for I could have performed a clean cut through your neck at that moment, and I can do it again. The rakage calmed down a little and left his battle stance. The masked man spoke again. I came here to discuss something with you. The rakage, still angry and alert, replied. What is it? It is related to the war your village is currently involved in. The masked man now took a few steps back and sat on the edge of the rectangular table. A two, sat back in his seat. The former continued. I mean to propose an offer on behalf of an organization called the Akatsuki, which is made up of powerful ninjas like Itachi Uchiha, Kisame Hoshigaki, Sasori, and Didera. We are willing to help you in this war and destroy Konoha for good. We can also help you acquire the Hyuga blood, which you crave so much. And what are your demands? A question sternly, the masked man spoke in his calm manner. We demand that we receive portions of the two and eight tailed beasts, which are in your possession. A furrowed his eyebrows, he wasn't too keen on the demands. Noticing this, the masked man continued. Come on, Lord Rakage. The process won't harm your brother or the other Jinchuriki. Besides, the tailed beasts already have outstanding amounts of chakra, and remember sharing is caring. Anything else? The rakage demanded in an impatient and angry tone. There was another demand, Lord Rakage. Since our organization is made up of S-tier rogue shinobi, we want your solemn promise that Kumogakure will not partake in any action against the Akatsuki whatsoever. The rakage could sense a grin from under the mask of the man, and he did not give a reply to the offer. Seeing this, the masked man informed. I see, you need time to properly think about this. No worries, you have time to do so until tomorrow sunset. If you agree to the offer meet me in the abandoned mineshaft north of Kumogakir, number 26 to be exact, and come alone. Before the masked man could leave using his teleportation jutsu, however, a questioned him. But, who even are you? The masked man looked straight into the rakage's face, and the latter could see a red glow through the orange mosque's eyehole, like a sharingan. The masked man finally replied. I am the ghost of the Uchiha, Madara Uchiha. Saying this, the masked man disappeared using his teleportation jutsu. While the rakage sat back in his seat, trying to comprehend this new information. In the Hokage's office the Hokage office looked just as usual, with windows on three sides, electric lights around, and several closets and tables stuffed with files. The Hokage sat in his usual seat, with some paperwork on his desk, and in front of him was seated Marcus Julius Brutus, the Roman governor. Hiruzen casually smoked his cigar and spoke. Well, Lord Governor, how has your campaign been going on? Marcus gave a smile of satisfaction, and replied. It has proceeded well. Our men have captured Turtle Island, and also destroyed and plundered many towns and villages of the enemy, crippling their economy. Hiruzen wasn't so keen on the destruction of villages and towns, but it was pleasing to hear that their allies were winning. Marcus continued speaking. There was another matter I wished to talk to you about, Lord Hokage. Yes, what shall we discuss? Marcus leaned back on his seat, in a more eased posture, and started speaking. The thing is that we Romans have been winning this war, and any conflict we engaged in that included shinobi. Our advantages were in advanced battle technology, equipment of far superior quality, discipline, and sheer numbers. However, during these conflicts, we have incurred outstanding casualties in ratio to that of our foes. Not that it affects our military much, but every life matters. That is why we've come to a decision. You see Lord Hokage, Rome has survived as a sovereign and thriving state for so long because we adapt to every challenge. In the same way, we are trying to adapt to the shinobi continent as well. The Roman military has a wing known as the Auxiliary, which is a force of non-Roman soldiers who are skilled in the traditional warfare of their culture. 
So, we are going to recruit auxiliary units of shinobi from our territories here in the shinobi continent, and we require your help with that. Hiruzen raised an eyebrow. What sort of assistance? Marcus continued, You see, we have noticed that Konoha has produced excellent shinobi throughout its history, ensuring its position as the most powerful political entity in this continent. We will need the help of your shinobi mentors to train an auxiliary force of ninjas. We are ready to pay for it. Hiruzen lowered his eyes to the desk and thought for a moment. He spoke after a brief pause. Of course, we are ready to help you without taking anything in return. Take this as a gesture of goodwill as allies. But obviously after the war. Brutus smiled, and replied. We're grateful to you, Lord Hokage, I'm sure we can repay the favor sometime in the future. Hiruzen's curiosity had been aroused, and he inquired further. So, can you tell me a little more about this new policy of yours? Marcus began to speak. Well, we will first heavily advertise this policy, spreading the news in the entire territory. The second step will be to establish training camps around the province with the help of the mentors you provide, and after the training, we must assimilate them into the Roman military structure. Our main goal is to attract former shinobi and mercenaries, and also those with the potential to be ninjas. The rewards are as usual for auxiliaries. Roman citizenship, a decent salary and stipends throughout the year, all their basic needs taken care of, and a chance to increase their social status through military service. After retirement, an honorable discharge, a plot of land, a decade's worth of pay as a pension, for their position before retirement, and their social status are elevated forever. That is if they survive until retirement. Both men gave a small chuckle, but then Hiruzen questioned again. What is the matter with this citizenship you speak of? Oh well, it is just a legal document proving you're a Roman and a citizen of Rome. Citizenship has many benefits, as you will have benefits in court, be able to vote, get public offices, own property, marriage rights, inheritance rights, be eligible for subsidies, stand for elections, and enlist in the legions. Hiruzen was surprised. So, who are non-citizens? In the eyes of the Roman law, they're just people who inhabit our territory. They have basic rights of freedom, but not on the same level as citizens. But you needn't worry, citizenship can be acquired through any form of loyal service to the Roman state. Engineers get citizenship for consistently helping in public projects, merchants for helping in supplying our legions, etc. other than military service. Citizenship officially grants you the status of being a Roman, despite your original roots. So once your paperwork is completed you'll suddenly know Latin, be wearing a toga, drinking wine, worshipping our gods, and become descendants of Romulus. Don't be surprised, Lord Hokage. Rome was established by the Romans, for the Romans. Society has always been unequal, but ours allows you to climb the ladder if you're talented. The two men sat in silence for some time, Hiruzen thinking about the information he had learned just now, and Marcus glancing around Konohagakir through the office windows. The silence was broken by a knock on the door, Hiruzen ordered the man to come in. Marcus turned his seat to see a butler in formal clothes, a bald head, mild stubble, and slightly overweight, bringing a drink on a tray. The butler walked towards the desk, quietly served the Hokage and Marcus a white drink in glasses, and left after bowing to both of them. Hiruzen smiled and raised his glass. This is sake, an intoxicating beverage of our land. How about a toast to our alliance? Marcus also chuckled. No offense, Lord Hokage. You're old but haven't lost the spirit of youth. The glasses clanked, and the two men drank from their glasses, chatting a bit more. After the meeting had ended, turning into what seemed to be a conversation between two long lost friends, the two slightly drunk men bid each other farewell, and Marcus left the Hokage building for the residence he had been provided for his time in Konoha. It was almost sunset now, and darkness had started to cover the entire village, and the streets were lit up by electric lights. The sun was seemingly setting behind the Hokage monuments, creating a wonderful sight. Marcus, who was in his usual black suit, walked down the streets of Konoha alone, slightly drunk after the meeting with the Hokage. His bodyguard of 200 men was assisting the already stationed Roman cohort in preparing the village's defenses. He was getting a few stares and looks, but nothing out of the ordinary, it was probably because of his odd clothing and slight drunkenness. As Marcus was walking down a broad street, he noticed that people were suddenly avoiding him, and giving him stares. Their eyes speaking of disgust and hatred. Marcus looked around, 
he had a slightly bent posture and hands in his pockets, unlike his usually straight and disciplined manner. He soon realized that the civilians weren't avoiding him, but a little boy. The boy had spiky, blonde hair, a small body, cerulean blue eyes, and three whisker marks on either of his cheeks, like those of a fox. The boy wore a pale yellow tunic with a swirly red symbol on it and green pants. The boy was quietly walking down the street, his face lowered down to the ground, and clear sadness on it. Marcus approaches the boy. Hey, young man, what seems to be the matter? The boy seems slightly scared, and speaks after a few seconds, without looking up. The people hate me, without any reason. The boy spoke in a sad, childish, and straightforward manner, Marcus raised an eyebrow. Well, that's not nice to hear. By the way, are you hungry? I am. The boy finally looked up at Marcus, his face now with a face and some shine on it. Marcus took this as a yes and told the kid to follow him. Twenty minutes later Marcus and the child were sitting in a food stall, eating ramen from a bowl, and chatting. It was dark now, probably seven o'clock, and the street was starting to become quiet, as the people went back to their homes. The boy slurped the noodles with delight, while Marcus used a fork that he always carried. So, you say this is your favorite place? The boy gave a nod while eating, Marcus continued questioning. Oh, I forgot to ask your name. What is it? The boy looked at Marcus and replied. I am Naruto Uzumaki. Marcus nodded and continued eating while looking at the fish cake in the ramen. Who named their kid after fish cake? Marcus inquired further, still curious about the boy. So, Naruto, where do you live? Naruto kept on eating while speaking, he had become quite open with the governor by now. In an apartment near the Hokage building, I live with my elder sister. Marcus wondered, why only his sister? Should he ask the boy about his parents? But that didn't seem right to ask if what Marcus thought was true. So he kept us his usual questions and chatting. The boy had been despised and bullied by the villagers ever since he had started venturing out of his house, but he knew not the reason. By now, the governor had also become quite sober. He wished to talk a bit more, but noticed the dark outside, spoke. Well then, Naruto Uzumaki, it was a nice time with you. You should go home now, it is getting dark. Saying this, Marcus got up from his seat, paid the bill for their orders, and walked out of the stall, followed by the way. The two went separate ways after a goodbye and walked towards opposite streets. As Marcus finally reached his guest house, the guards questioned him worriedly. Where have you been sir? We were about to start looking for you. Nothing, just exploring the village and making new friends. Marcus waved him off and walked toward his room, lying down on his bed. He thought about the boy, and decided to inquire about him from the Hokage out of pure curiosity. But soon, sleep got the better of him. Asahi quietly watched his students practice in the training field. It was early morning and the weather was cloudy and cold, and the sun's rays were very light. The training field was on the outskirts and had very uneven and forested terrain. Asahi's three students were sparring with all they've got, as they had been told by Asahi, who watched them from a distance. Sitting on a rock and a notebook in his hands. The sparring rules for today were simple, all three of them had been given scrolls, and they must snatch the other's scroll while protecting theirs. Asahi was making notes in his notebook, which he used to keep track of his team's missions, progress, and skills. This system was not necessary, only optional. But something like this helped when registering for the Chunin exams. Asahi scribbled on his notebook with every action he observed. Out of the three, Maximus and Hayato were having an open fight, trying to get each other's scrolls but with enough caution to protect theirs, and their duel seemed to be a stalemate. Naruko was hiding somewhere in the woods, completely forgotten by the other two. Maximus leapt into the air, throwing several kanai at Hayato, the latter dodged them and made his counterattack by rushing toward his foe with a kanai in hand. The two again engaged in a fistfight, but no clear victor. Both boys punched each other with all their might, getting bruised and battered but not seeming to care. By now they had completely forgotten the original goal of the sparring session, the scrolls, and were adamant about defeating each other. But as the two boys were at each other's throats, Maximus on top of Hayato now, Naruko suddenly came out in a flash and snatched the scrolls of the two, which hung by their waists. Maximus and Hayato soon realized what had happened, and in one moment were de facto allied, to get their scrolls back, and prepared for a deadly attack. But the two were stopped, 
as in an instant Asahi was between the two and Naruko, calling for a halt. Stop, you two. You've already failed with your objectives. Hayato and Maximus paused and stood back to listen to their John and Captain, Asahi continued. You two were so busy fighting amongst yourselves, that you even forgot about the scrolls. Naruko is the least powerful in this team as compared to you two, yet she managed to win, why? Think about it yourselves. Maximus and Hayato looked at each other, while Naruko triumphantly waved the scrolls. The team now settled down on a fallen tree trunk and Asahi began to explain. You see, strategy is equally important in warfare as is brute force. For example, you might have heard how the 4th Hokage managed to annihilate a force of 1000 enemy shinobi alone. The students nodded, they knew about it. It was a legendary event that was spoken of with pride in Konoha and scorn in Iwagakure. Asahi continued. The Iwa shinobi were overconfident with their numbers, and Minato Namikaze too couldn't have defeated them, but he used his brain. In the same way, you should first think about how you can defeat your foe before entering a battle. Moreover, a cool head is also necessary while fighting. As in your case, you two boys were so engaged in trying to defeat each other that you forgot about your main objective, you won't survive a year in your shinobi career if you engage in unnecessary battles like this. As Asahi was thus speaking to the two boys, Naruko suddenly pointed out. Look there, the civilians are running towards the inner village. Hearing this, Asahi looked back, and his face suddenly turned dead serious. He got up and blankly looked at the people going by for a moment, there was a long column of civilians hurriedly walking towards the inner village, with Konoha Shinobi at the rear and front. Asahi commanded his students. This is an emergency evacuation, an attack has taken place. I must go and help, you three go back to your homes. But, Naruko was interrupted by Asahi, who now spoke sternly. You will go, it's an order from your captain. Saying this, Asahi suddenly vanished and his figure could be seen running towards the village. It took the three students some time to comprehend the information, but they soon realized what was going on after a loud explosion was heard in the distance. There's an attack? Hayato murmured, and he started to slightly panic, Naruko spoke. We should go and help with the attack, we can't sit idly by, Hayato spoke again, in a low voice. But, Asahi-sensei told us to go away, what will that do? We should rather help defend our village. Hearing this, Maximus finally spoke in a strong voice. Our sensei has been a janin for four years, and a shinobi for more than a decade, and he has much more experience and knowledge than us. If he is telling us not to, it must mean something. Saying this, Maximus started running towards the main village, followed by Hayato. Naruko too decided to go after a moment. The three genins ran fast through the streets of Konoha which were now bustling with people also looking for shelter, but the situation was controlled. This attack had been anticipated, and all necessary defenses and preparations that could be made in a few days had been done, and shinobi were escorting the civilians to bunkers and emergency shelters. Maximus, Hayato, and Naruko pushed and squeezed their way through the crowd, trying to make their way to a bunker. Naruko parted from her teammates to fetch her younger brother, while Maximus and Hayato proceeded on their way. The other side of Konoha there was fierce combat outside the walls of Konoha, as Kumo Shinobi fought their leaf counterparts. There were loud explosions and the clanging sounds of blades meeting each other. Kanai and Shuriken were flying around, while a seemingly endless stream of Konoha and Kumo ninjas poured into the battlefield with the single intent of killing each other, and even in these 15 minutes there were quite some corpses lying around. The Roman cohort, combined with Marcus's guard, was holding out its own on the front. Over the last few days, they had successfully constructed several mini forts and fortifications in a perimeter around Konoha, and this was what helped them the most. The Romans maintained a defensive stance, and as the first wave of enemy shinobi was that of the weakest, they easily repelled it while relentlessly defending these tight fortifications. Asahi jumped from one building to another, sweating pouring from his body, as he made his way to the battlefield. Many other janins were also similarly arriving from all across the village to assist in the defense. Upon reaching the section of the walls under assault, Asahi immediately formed several dozen clones, and they charged into the fray with swords in their hands. Asahi was renowned as a skilled swordsman, and his skills were proven unmatched as he cut through the Kumo ninja with ease. The shinobi were commanded to stay back and fight defensively around the village, and Asahi followed the order. By now, 
There were over a hundred janin gathered, on the walls or the field below, and many other anbu. Shikaku Nara also arrived at the scene, with the heads of the Akamichi and Yamanaka clans as well, as the head of the anbu. Shikaku ran his eyes around the area, his tactical mind trying to come up with a strategy for this situation. The Kumo Shinobi had also stopped, and prepared for one grand charge and break through the defenses. Shikaku suddenly started giving orders to the Anbu head. The Janin shall stay here and defend the walls, earth style users at the front, fire and wind style users behind, and any other chakra users at the wings. F tell the Anbu to try and flank the enemy, and spread out their formation. Tell the Roman soldiers to brace themselves and defend their positions, they must attack from behind once we've pinned down the enemy in one place. The Anbu captain nodded and went around the front line issuing the orders, tasking different squads to go around the enemy and try to flank them. Suddenly, the Kumo Shinobi charged forward again, this time in larger numbers. As the ninja got close, a destructive volley of ranged jutsu came from both sides. The Kumo Shinobi sent lightning chakra at the Konoha Shinobi, it was so strong it could go right through several layers of walls. The Konoha Shinobi were able to counter this, as the earth style users Shikaku had placed at the front formed a thick wall of earth chakra in front of them, to block the enemy attack. After exchanging projectiles and ranged jutsus for a while, the Kumo Shinobi resumed their charge. The enemy ninjas were very skilled and used lightning chakra to speed up themselves, and in no more than a few moments were on top of the walls formed by the Konoha ninja. Their sheer speed surprised the leaf ninjas, and they jumped down on the ladder with swords in hand. The Kumo ninja were using the lightning chakra to increase their speed substantially and thus had an advantage over the Konoha shinobi. The attack had been sudden, and the forces of Konoha, which were spread out around the village's borders, were taking time to mobilize and assemble to defend this one place. If the Kumo shinobi successfully broke into the village, they would have a significant advantage as the Konoha shinobi might hesitate to use very destructive jutsu and would have no sort of defenses. Wave after wave of Kumo shinobi seemed to come crashing down on the Konoha ninja, the latter's defenses crumbling. But as more and more shinobi started arriving, Konoha started regaining ground. The different clans were fighting separately in one column, the Serutobi behind Asuma, and the Hyuga under Hiyashi used their fire-style ninjutsu and gentle fist technique and were the foremost on the battlefield. The Yamanaka, Nara, and Akamichi were on the flanks, supporting the main force, and as such. This was one big advantage Konoha had over Kumo, and possibly the other villages, it was that they possessed the most clans and Keke Jenkes. The fighting raged on, and the corpses were piling up. It was a bloody business, as literal streams of lightning and fire ran through the battlefield. While many shinobi were bending the earth itself, the explosions were almost deafening. Shikaku, who was at the back of the line, smiled to himself. The battle was fierce, but Konoha was winning, they just needed to grind through the enemy waves a bit longer until it broke and they retreat. Suddenly, a thousand blades came flying from the sky at almost lightning speed and took out more than twenty of both Konoha and Kumo shinobi. Then more than a hundred wooden and metal puppets entered the battlefield, cutting through anything they saw while others shot poison darts with deadly accuracy. Shikaku Nara immediately recognized who it was, the infamous rogue puppet master of Suna, Sasori. But as Shikaku wondered how to deal with this new menace, a giant blue skeleton appeared behind him. The Nara clan head looked back, to see Fugaku Uchiha, coated by his Suzano, and a vast number of skilled Uchiha behind him. They were comparatively small in numbers, as a year ago the traitor Itachi had unsuccessfully tried to massacre his entire clan to test his strength, but was stopped and forced to flee by Fugaku and several other highly skilled Uchiha. But still, Shikaku could see three incomplete Suzano behind him. It seems you need help, Lord Nara. Saying this, the Uchiha charged into the battle with their Sharingan. Shikaku gave a familiar grin to Fugaku, and the latter also went into battle with his Suzano. The battle was bloody, as both sides of Shinobi used all they had in this one fight. The battlefield was now littered with the corpses of fallen ninjas, from both Kumogakure and Konoha. It was late morning now, and the sun shone brightly in the sky. The fight was so destructive that already, there were vast deformations in the terrain of the battlefield due to the jutsus and paper bombs. The Roman cohort was narrowly holding out its own against the skilled Shinobi but was effective and skilled enough to divert attention from Konoha itself. 
In this fight, Sasori, the puppet master, was the most aggressive and ruthless warrior. He hid away somewhere in the woods, not seen by the rest, but his wooden puppets went around the battlefield with blades, cutting through anything moving they saw. Whether from Kumo or Konoha, the puppets moved at great speed and had many modifications and enough flexibility to make them unpredictable, and through this, they caused the most amount of casualties. But then suddenly, as the fight was raging on, three giant Suzano appeared behind the Konoha line, as well as many other shinobi behind them. The Kumogakir force disengaged and retreated to a safe distance, followed by Konoha. Only three squads of Kumo shinobi stayed at the front. They were standing on the fallen trees, and each of them wore a mask imitating a demon. Their armor consisted of small shoulder pads and forearm guards, a cuirass that covered almost the entire torso, and shin guards and military boots, the rest of the body was covered by completely black clothes. They also had the symbol of a lightning bolt on their arm, burnt in with hot iron, and all of them were equipped with swords. As Fugaku Uchiha came forward with his Suzano and two others at his back, two of the masked Kumo Shinobi came forward and put their hands on the ground after some hand signs. In an instant, smoke covered the entire area. When it cleared, everyone was struck with awe and fear, as the Shinobi was standing atop a giant snow leopard, almost the size of the Suzano. The snow leopard had white fur and dark patches all over, he had fiery eyes and snarled with rage and hatred at the Uchiha in front of him. Fugaku squinted his eyes and stood in battle stance with a serious look on his face, as well as the Suzano. The three other Uchiha, who had only managed to perfect the skeletal torso of their Suzano, stood at his sides. The two large creatures charged at each other, engaging in a fight. The summoned leopard was ferocious, his teeth nearly managing to pierce Fugaku's Suzano. But the three Uchiha stood their ground, but the beast didn't budge. Suddenly, two of the eleven shinobi appeared behind the Suzano and also performed a summoning jutsu, spawning a similar beast. The numbers were now even, but Fugaku and the other two were surrounded and were thus at a disadvantage. This had become a battle between six gigantic creatures, and Shikaku ordered several Anbu squads into the fray to take down the enemy summoners, but they were intercepted, and the rest of the nine enemy shinobi. The battle was in a stalemate again, the Uchiha were losing ground but wouldn't be defeated, while the Kumo shinobi had an advantage but struggled to go through the Suzano. The rest of the shinobi on the two sides stayed back, waiting for the fighting shinobi to earn an advantage, and only then strike. None of the two sides decided to interfere in the battle, fearing the other would do so as well. While this was going on, Hiruzen finally appeared beside Shikaku in full battle gear. What is the situation, Lord Nara? Hiruzen asked the squatted Shikaku in front of him, keenly observing the fight. The enemy hasn't been able to breach our defenses, some skilled Kumo shinobi are currently fighting Fugaku and two other Uchiha. What shall we do? Shikaku finally looked back at the Hokage and spoke. We must not make a move. If we do so, the other side will send a greater force to deal with it, followed by us. This will continue until the battle has started again in full heat and the casualties and friendly fire would now be outstanding, considering we'll get between the fight of those leopard summons and the Uchiha. Hiruzen nodded, and both men looked over the fight between the Uchiha and the Kumo shinobi with dead serious faces, Hiruzen spoke after a brief pause. We should send several squads to assist the Roman cohort, they are probably having a hard time. Shikaku let out a yes, and a dozen Konoha Anbu were ordered to sneak their way to the Roman fortifications and help them repel the enemy. Inside the village most of the citizens had been safely escorted to bunkers and emergency shelters, guarded by shinobi. The streets were quiet except for the noises of the battle in the north side, the village felt deserted. There were some shinobi positioned inside the village, mostly Chunin and Jenin, to look after the civilians and prevent any flanking maneuvers on the enemy's behalf. Danzo and Brutus sat in the latter's guesthouse, on the balcony to be precise, discussing. We should go, there is an attack on the village. Brutus spoke in a slightly worried tone. Danzo replied in his usual calm manner. Sit back, Lord Governor, we can't do much even if we wanted to. I am a crippled veteran and you are too vulnerable to shinobi. After this, both of them were quiet for a while. The fight between the Uchiha and the Kumo shinobi could be seen from the balcony, while the streets below were lonely. Danzo leaned back on his chair and took up the tea he was served. I have been alive for a long time, since the time of the second Hokage. I know them, 
the Kumo ninja fighting Fugaku and the two others. Brutus turned his eyes at Danzo, showing interest. Noticing this, the latter continued speaking. They are like special forces of Kumo, similar to the seven swordsmen of the mist. Ever since the founding of the five great nations, Kumo had always been in a cold war with the other villages, a never-ending arms race. These men are called lightning spirits, referring to a local myth of their country about thunder spirits that serve Kami. Every academy student is monitored from his first day, up till he is a chunin. Those who show promise and potential are taken in to be trained under a rigorous program, to produce the toughest, strongest shinobi in the village with a cold heart. Like your Anbu, Brutus replied, no, our Anbu is a special force trained for sabotage, spying, assassination, etc. These, thunder spirits, are trained only for open combat. As Danzo had finished speaking, an Anbu from the root, one of several tasked with protecting Danzo and Marcus, entered the balcony. He formally bowed to the two men, and spoke in a worried manner. Lord Danzo, four squads of enemy shinobi have managed to infiltrate the village. Danzo's eyes finally showed worry and tension, two things that had been absent from his face from the first day Marcus saw him. He got up and picked up his walking stick, ordering the Anbu. Gather every other Anbu and Chunin you can find, we must deal with this quickly. Recognizing the significance of the matter, Marcus also got up and started walking downstairs. I'll lead my 80 personal bodyguards to deal with them, you needn't worry much. Marcus was stopped by Danzo, who spoke in a serious voice. Please, Lord Marcus, you are our guest here and an ally. We can't allow you to risk your life. In truth, Danzo didn't care if these foreigners died or lived, but the man in front of him was the key to Konoha's victory in this conflict, and without his support, Rome may withdraw from this conflict completely. Danzo needed a man like Marcus, contained but equally zealous for war. Do not worry, Lord Danzo. My bodyguards are one of the finest warriors you'll find in all of Rome. Believe me, this is our duty as allies. Thus, Marcus waved off Danzo and walked out of the guesthouse, followed by Danzo. Outside of which were standing eighty warriors. They wore a lamellar cuirass over a long coat of mail armor, metal strips on their forearm and legs, and a metal helmet connected to mail that covered their entire face, only leaving eye holes. The men were equipped with large, round shields with iron buckles and rims, the rest made of wood and designs painted on them. They also carried a two-handed axe with wooden handles and steel axe heads, and a one-handed sword alongside its scabbard. The men slightly bowed at Brutus, the latter commanded their attention and spoke to them in a language Danzo didn't know, probably Latin. Danzo looked intently at the warriors before him, and commented. If these are the finest warriors you can offer, then I don't think how you will fight those ninjas. Brutus turned back to look at Danzo, and smirked. Don't speak before you see. Lord Danzo. These are Varangians, the finest soldiers available to Rome. I have also taken the liberty of making their armor chakra insulated and teaching them how to enhance their abilities through chakra, with help from the land of iron. I have full confidence they can drive out the barbarians. Danzo didn't speak, Brutus equipped a plumed helmet brought to him by one of the soldiers, took a spatha, and led the eighty men towards Konoha. Do you sense the nine tails? A masked Kumo shinobi asked his comrade, as the sixteen shinobi jumped from roof to roof of Konoha's buildings. The sensory type ninja answered in an irritated tone. This village is huge so it takes time okay? You've been asking the same question four times now. The shinobi continued sprinting through the village, the sensory type spoke again after a while. Wait, I do sense a very large chakra signature, it's huge, dwarfing all others in its vicinity, I. Just tell us where it is. The ninja was interrupted by his comrade and seemed upset about it, but directed the shinobi at one point near the Hokage monuments, where he spoke. I can sense a lot of chakra signatures alongside the nine tails inside those rocks, there must be a bunker there. The other Kumo shinobi needed no further telling, and in a second were near the monuments. One of them performed a few hand signs, the others got back. The shinobi pointed forward the palms of his hands, and a second later destructive lightning bolts came out which easily destroyed a section of the walls, revealing a large number of civilians inside a large room. Several Konoha shinobi, several chunin, and a janin appeared at the fallen section of the walls, to face the Kumo shinobi. Shall we spare the civilians? One of the Kumo shinobi, who had a menacing look in his eyes and covered face, asked. 
Another shinobi, who seemed the captain of the platoon, answered. No, it will only waste our time. Take care of these Konoha shinobi and then find the Nine Tails. There must be reinforcements arriving, so we need to make this quick. Saying this, the captain drew out his sword from its sheath and prepared to face the Konoha ninja, who did the same. A bloody melee ensued. Both sides at each other's throats. The Konoha shinobi refrained from using destructive jutsu, but their Kumo counterparts did not. This caused the former to lose. After a bloody fight and a heroic stand by the Konoha shinobi, the Kumo platoon appeared before the crowd of civilians, scared out of their wits. The captain of the platoon put his bloodied blade back into its sheath and commanded the men. Search for the nine tails, and make it quick. Cut down anyone who gets in your path. Hearing this, the Kumo ninja quickly spread in the crowd, pushing their way through, the scared civilians easily making way. Hayato, Maximus, and Naruko hid in an isolated spot in the hall, the latter gripping her brother tightly by the shoulders. All of them had stern and serious look on their faces, Maximus and Hayato with Kanai prepared behind their backs. As they hid, they could hear the sensory type ninja speak loudly mockingly. Be careful, I can also sense three genins here judging from their chakra. There were a few laughs here and there from the Kumo shinobi, but the mood remained tense. Hayato whispered to his teammates in a worried manner. We need to escape, Maximus whispered back, but how, do we dig a tunnel through the wall and escape? As the teammates whispered among themselves, they suddenly heard a voice behind them. Found them, the four quickly looked back, to see a Kumo ninja behind them. The civilians were a fair distance away and had made a path for the ninja. Naruto got back, as Hayato and Maximus stood to face the shinobi with kanai in their hands. The Kumo shinobi chuckled. Cute. Saying this, he walked towards Naruto. Hayato got in his way, trying to shove his kanai into the Kumo shinobi's chest. But the latter caught the hand of the former and sent him flying to one corner of the hall. Similarly, Maximus and Naruko also tried to resist but put up a better fight. Naruko formed a few shadow clones and charged at the shinobi, while Maximus used dozens of projectiles. They managed to stall the ninja, but their attempts were futile. The enemy shinobi easily dispelled all the clones and dodged the projectiles. In one swoop, he punched Maximus out of his path and snatched Naruto away from Naruko, forcefully carrying him outside. Having managed to obtain their target, the Kumo platoon took Naruto out of the hall. The captain commented mockingly. As this how Konoha defends its Jinchuriki, it is no surprise they experienced the Nine Tails rampage seven years ago, and still, they haven't learned their lesson. But as the Kumo shinobi prepared to escape with the Nine Tails, a kanai flew by the captain's face at lightning speed, scratching his cloth mask. The captain looked back, to see two squads of Konoha Anbu standing before them blades drawn and in battle stance standing on the roofs of the buildings but apart from that something else also caught the kumo ninja's eye there were approximately 80 foreign warriors in front of them blocking all the streets that led out the enemy shinobi also prepared for battle and the one holding naruto stayed back seriously this is the best konoha can offer two squads of shinobi and a mob of civilians one of the masked shinobi scoffed but he was proven wrong a moment later Brutus, who was at the front of his men in his armor, ordered the men to charge. The Varangians, who till now were in a tight formation with their round shield walls, charged forward with lightning speed. They had been taught how to use chakra to enhance their physical capabilities greatly and used it to their full advantage. They rushed forward, their two-handed battle axes ready to strike, and in an instant had surrounded the shinobi. The shinobi were surprised and shocked by this sudden and quick charge as they had greatly underestimated these foreign warriors and their capabilities. Two of the enemy shinobi were then and they're cut to pieces, but the rest managed to get together and climbed the rooftops of the building behind them and prepared for a counter maneuver. But the Anbu squads that were previously in front of them took advantage of the shock caused by the Varangians and got behind the Kumo shinobi. The axe-wielding foreigners also soon climbed the rooftops with chakra and surrounded the Kumo shinobi. The 14 remaining Kumo ninjas got into a tight circular formation, with the captain, the sensory type ninja, and the hostage held nine tails in the middle. We must escape quickly, it will be impossible to fight off them and survive. The captain of the platoon murmured to his men, who were in a tense mood now. The shinobi must carve a path through the enemy forces to escape with their hostage, alive. 
Thus seeing the situation, the Kumo Shinobi prepared for one big attack to escape. Seeing this, the Romans and Konoha Anbu also braced for an attack. Two of the Shinobi got down on one knee and joined their hands. Immediately, the earth began to deform as the Shinobi raised a wall and pillars around them. Their foes also rushed forward to engage in combat. One of the Anbu bounced up in the air and sent a fireball jutsu down on the enemy platoon, which in turn covered itself with a dome using chakra. Four of the Anbu, who knew lightning-style jutsus, surrounded the dome, after which they sent destructive lightning chakra flying towards the dome, creating large gaps in it. The gaps were quickly filled by the Varangians, who poured in to slay their foes. They enhanced their stamina, the sharpness of their weapons, and the durability and toughness of their armor and shield using chakra. As they charged in, the shinobi attempted to fight them head-on with their blades, as using big jutsus in this enclosed space and in such proximity may backfire and cause a lot of friendly fire. The Kumo Shinobi infused their blades with lightning chakra and fought back. But their blades were unable to even pierce the armor of the Varangians, let alone wound them, and they had to use very powerful techniques with their swords to defeat them which drained their chakra quite a bit. This was because the Varangians already had top-class armor prior, better than any steel locally produced in the Shinobi continent. Moreover, they had been taught by the samurai of the Land of Iron how to strengthen their equipment beyond limits using chakra, in exchange for a hefty payment of course. Seeing the situation, the captain ordered the Kumo Shinobi to dismantle the dome and try to flee, but their attempts failed as the Varangians had them engaged while the Anbu squads made sure none escaped. The Kumo platoon was now stuck fighting in a tight circular formation, trying to escape, many of them already had their chakra reserves drained profoundly after taking part in the main attack, sneaking into Konoha, and the last fight with a Konoha squad. This made it impossible for them to use any large-scale ninjutsu or genjutsu. While blood spattered and the blades clanged, the captain of the platoon was lost in thought. The world went slow around him, as he tried to read the situation and create a strategy. His remaining seven men were fighting with all they had, vastly outnumbered but not ready to give up. The captain was taken back to reality after one of the axe-wielding Varangians cut clean through one of his men's neck, and the blood sputtered on his face. He suddenly turned to the sensory-type ninja, who was tightly holding Naruto and trying to ward off attacks at the same time, and commanded him. Kill the Jinchuriki, release the Nine Tails. The shinobi holding Naruto turned around and looked in disbelief, unsure of what he heard. Sir? The captain repeated himself, I said kill the Jinchuriki and release the Nine Tails. There's no way we can escape with our hostage now, so it would be best to kill him and release as much carnage on the enemy as possible. The shinobi looked doubtful and looked down at their hostage, but after thinking for a few seconds, he took out his kanai and held it with a tight hand. It was not like he was feeling guilty for killing a child, that was something he'd done countless times while fighting little genins. But the thing was that, if he killed this child a monster would be released, and that would seal their fate. But after this moment of hesitation, he got ready to slit the throat of this blonde kid. But before he could proceed with the order, a sudden strike landed on his back, almost cutting through his ribcage. The shinobi let out a painful scream and fell on the ground. Behind him stood one of the Varangians, his battle axe reddened with the blood of its most recent target. For a moment, both the captain and his enemy looked blankly into each other's eyes. But soon the Varangian quickly dragged the blonde child in front of him and pushed through the crowd of fighting men, getting out. The captain of the platoon got hold of his blade, and he got into a battle stance with rage in his eyes. One by one, his men fell, but he stood till the last, and suddenly, as the enemy Anbu finally came down to fight him, lightning chakra began to cover his blade. In a flash he was in the sky, and from there he swung his blade in the air, in the direction of the enemy. Destructive lightning chakra came out in a wave, and cut through anything in front of it, taking down several of the Varangians and an Anbu. But this was the last great attack from him, he had been drained completely of his stamina, and just now his chakra. As he began to come down to the ground after his leap, an Anbu appeared behind, it appeared at such great speed that the captain had no time to respond, and in a flash, he dropped down to the ground, dead, blood flowing from his chest, he had been impaled through the heart. It was suddenly very quiet now, as the fighting ended with the final enemy shinobi dead. There was silence for a while, as the Anbu checked Naruto and the Varangians muttered amongst themselves in their tongue. 
Maximus and Naruto also came to the rooftop, scuffling through the cloud. There they saw Naruto among the Anbu. Naruto gripped her brother tightly, tears welling from her eyes. After a while, however, one of the Anbu separated the siblings and directly spoke to them. Sorry, but we'll be taking him to the Anbu headquarters for the duration of this attack to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Saying this, the Anbu politely got the blonde child on its back and jumped toward a large building near the Hokage Tower. On the other end of Konoha, another battle was taking place between a dozen Kumo Shinobi, three Uchiha, and several Anbu. The fight had been going on for a while, and the Kumo Shinobi were losing. Two of their summons had already been dispelled, and the third was struggling to maintain itself. The reason was that summons were also technically animals and could be wounded or even killed, but a Suzano can be kept up as long as the user has Chakra and the Eternal Mangeku Sharingan. As the fight went on, the final summon was dispelled as well and the Kumo Shinobi retreated. This time, it remained quiet for some time. But after a while, a figure appeared before the three Suzano. It was a masked man, with a hunch that made him lower almost to the ground, as if he was on all fours. He had a bald head, keen eyes, and a masked face, and his entire body was covered with a cloak with red clouds on it. The man came forward and seemed to smirk upon seeing his opponents. The man didn't say anything but merely raised his hands a little. Immediately, hundreds of wooden dolls appeared on the battlefield, all equipped with blades, darts, or weaponized machinery, and were creepily styled to resemble human faces. Seeing the horde of dolls and puppets, Hiruzen spoke while squinting his eyes. That's Sasori, the rogue puppet master from Suna. Shikaku also had his gaze fixed on the hunched figure, and agreed. Indeed it is, Sasori of the Red Sand. They say he destroyed an entire shinobi village using his puppets. Some of the Jonin gulped at hearing this, Hiruzen noticed. Don't be afraid, men. That village was nothing like ours, have faith in your strength, and that of our allies. Saying this Hiruzen looked back at the streets of Konoha inside, through which were arriving some eighty armed warriors alongside an Enbu squad. Shikaku drew the attention of Hiruzen and suggested. Perhaps it will be best if we deploy Yamato. Hearing this, the Hokage raised an eyebrow. You mean the Anbu who can use wood release? Yes, although his abilities are nothing close to that of Lord Firsts, we can still trust them enough to earn us a victory. Hiruzen closed his eyes, thinking for a moment, but soon he ordered one of the Anbu beside him to call Yamato, who had been stationed at the other side of the village, alone, to deal with any unexpected maneuvers, but before he arrived, the Hokage and his advisor must trust the Sharingan wielders, as the puppet master finally made his move. In a split second, the puppets were almost flying toward the Uchiha. Only Fugaku had his Suzano partially activated while the two others had deactivated theirs due to chakra exhaustion and the strain on their bodies. The three Konoha ninjas prepared to face the puppets. The puppets rushed forward at great speed, but that was no problem with someone who possessed the Sharingan. Fugaku nodded at the other two beside him, who returned it. The Uchiha clan had activated the torso of his Suzano and covered the other two, while the latter weaved hand signs in quick succession. When the puppets got near, the two Uchiha used a giant fireball jutsu that charred the puppets, and even destroyed some, but it didn't make much difference, as the puppets' charge didn't stop. When they got near they suddenly halted, and each of them launched thousands of poisonous darts through weapons implemented in their design but these were easily blocked by Fugaku's Suzano, which he deactivated after this due to chakra exhaustion. The puppets encircled their three enemies and attacked at once from all sides. They had some sort of weapon implemented in almost all of their body parts, from blades in the limbs and legs to poisonous darts in their mouths, to explosives on their backs. They leapt toward the Uchiha but were easily cut down by their blades. Soon, almost a dozen broken puppets had piled up around Fugaku and the two Uchiha but suddenly the puppets disengaged and got away from them. The Konoha ninja could now take a breath, but Fugaku's experience told him something was off. As he looked around with keen eyes, the cover plate at one of the puppets' backs fell off, and it revealed more than a dozen paper bombs stuffed inside and set to explode. Fugaku's eyes widened in shock and slight panic, he shouted to warn the others and tried to activate his Suzano again. But it was too late, as only a split second later they exploded. Everything went blank for a moment, and loud sounds of an explosion hit Fugaku's eardrums, smoke covered his surroundings and blocked his side, 
but he was still in perfect condition and wasn't harmed. As the smoke finally cleared, Fugaku could see giant wooden walls surrounding him and the other Uchiha. He looked behind him, to see a young lad in anbu gear and hands joined on top of the wooden wall, he had odd looking eyes, a sharp jawline, and wore a forehead protector that covered his forehead and the sides at the front of his head, like the second Hokage. You all right, Lord Uchiha? Fugaku looked at Yamato and nodded, Fanaki instructed. You cover us, boy. Yamato nods and gets ready. Fugaku performs several hand signs in quick succession, and a steady flow of what seems to be dark smoke begins leaving his mouth. The smoke is thick and clouds nearly all vision, it covers Fugaku's surroundings and the puppets. Sasori also makes a move, as mechanical tentacles appear from the back of several of his puppets, and move toward the Uchiha. As the tentacles were near Fugaku, the latter shot out a small amount of fire chakra from his finger, that touched the black smoke. Immediately, the entire area burst up in flames, as the black smoke had caught fire and encompassed a large area. The flames stick to many of the puppets, burning some to ashes while deeming others unusable. The hunched Sasori looked with shock and surprise, this jutsu had taken out almost half of his puppets. Fugaku looked at him and smirked. Now it's your turn, puppeteer. Sasori grinned under his mask and replied. Well, let's see if you can live up to your reputation, wicked eye Fugaku. Saying this, the puppet master moved his hands, and a dozen puppets were onto Fugaku. The Uchiha took out his sword and attempted to fight back, the other two Uchiha also came to his aid. They were excellent swordsmen and easily cut down the wooden puppets. One of them, a puppet with a large torso and six arms, had mechanical tentacles with blades prodding out of its back. The puppet attacked with great speed, none could follow its movements, but that was no problem to a Sharingan wielder. Yamato also joined in, attempting to attack Sasori himself. The fight was intense and fast, but the puppets were disadvantaged. In no time, all the puppets Sasori had summoned were lying on the ground, in broken pieces. Fugaku was grunting and breathing heavily, in a battle stance with his katana. The puppet master in front of him was awed and shocked by the Uchiha's abilities, and spoke. You all are truly remarkable opponents, but now, brace yourselves for my masterwork. As he said this, one large puppet appeared in front of him. The puppet was tall, wore a black cloak, and had a black wig for hair, and floated in the air. Do any of you recognize this man? Lord Hokage probably does. He's met him. All stayed quiet for a while, as Fugaku and the others glared at the puppet. Only Sasori's voice could be heard. Well, if you don't, then let me introduce you. This is the third case cage, the famed shinobi with magnet release. Shikaku and Hiruzen's eyes widened, this was shocking and unbelievable. Is he right? Hiruzen asked with visible worry and surprise in his voice. Shikaku remained calm. We can only see. Saying this, he directed his attention back to the fight. Sasori smiled from under his mask, and there was movement in the third case cage's puppet. The puppet opened its mouth, and a black element came out. But everyone present was aware of what it was, it was the famed magnet release, the third case cage's chakra molded in such a way to manipulate any nearby magnetic objects. The black chakra spread around the battlefield, attaching itself to all the darts, blades, and weapons of the fallen puppets. The iron sand of the third case cage latched itself onto the metallic weapons, and the blades started floating. Once all those weapons were up in the air, the puppet sent them rapidly towards his opponents. Yamato was quick, and immediately raised a giant wooden wall, the weapons almost pierced the wood but failed. The iron sand returned, and this time shaped into arrows and spears, flew towards the Konoha shinobi. This time, Yamato's wood release was unable to stop the iron sand as it went right through and in the direction of Fugaku. The Uchiha's hand was forced, and he activated the rib cage of his Suzano to save himself and the others, but this further strained Fugaku. Noticing this, Shikaku spoke to Hiruzen in a worried manner that betrayed his stoic attitude. We must send others in, Fugaku and the others wouldn't last long after the last fight's strain. Hiruzen agreed. But whom shall we send? Shikaku was silent for a moment as if judging the abilities of the puppet and the best counter to it, and then spoke. I suggest we should send Might Guy and Kakashi Hitaki. Hiruzen nods, and signals a nearby Anbu to do so while replying. 
But, what about the axe-wielding Romans we saw? They were also able to defeat 16 Kumo ninja. Shikaku answers in an uninterested tone. The third case cage's magnet release renders any metallic weapon useless against him. So if we send in our Roman allies it will be a mere slaughter. Besides, there. Oh there they are. As Nara finished his sentence, loud noises and battle cries could be heard from the back of the enemy line. Hiruzen was still puzzled. What? Shikaku turned his eyes toward the Hokage and explained. Well, they went all the way round to flank the enemy and help their besieged comrades. Send all our forces in once the puppet has been taken care of. As Shikaku looked back, he could see Kakashi and Might Guy on the battlefield, fighting Sasori's puppet. Might Guy was fast, too fast, and the puppet could not keep up with him. Moreover, the other four shinobi must face. Sasori was in peril. The puppet master grew desperate, as he summoned the last remaining puppets he had left. From the back, one of the Kumo shinobi, who was the captain of the invasion force, approached him. Shall we help, Sasori? The puppet master looked back to meet the gaze of the commander and replied coldly. No, your men stay back. I will finish this myself, and I don't want to put any restraint on my puppets. In truth, Sasori needed help. The third case cage puppet, although strong, wasn't enough to equalize the power balance. It did all it could, trying to impale the Uchiha, dodge the wood release, and parry the attacks from Kakashi and Guy. But in the end, it was defeated and smashed into pieces by one of Might Guy's kicks. Sasori was taken aback, he had not expected this from his best puppet, but as he thought of his next move, a shadow appeared over him. He looked up, to find Might Guy ready to land another kick on him, he seemed to have activated his second gate, as Chakra covered his body. He was too fast to be perceived, and Sasori too only got a hint of what was happening, when the next moment Guy landed his kick right on Sasori's skull, cracking it open. The puppet master fell, his skull in pieces. But then, a mechanical object like a scorpion's tail came out of his back and tried to hit Might Guy, but he was fast enough to dodge it. After this, a figure started appearing out of Sasori's body, like a butterfly leaving its cocoon. The human that came out was young, had bright red hair, and a small smile on his face. The former body of Sasori lay on the ground, seeming like an old broken shell. The Konoha shinobi got back ready for another trick Sasori may have. You see this? This is the real me, and the thing laying there used to be a friend of mine, but now it was my shell. He was cut short by Kakashi, who appeared right in front of him with a Chidori in his left hand. He attempted to strike at his opponent's heart, but he missed, as Sasori dodged the Chidori. Kakashi was pulled forward by the momentum of his attack, and Sasori took the opportunity. His forearm folded back like paper, and a blade appeared from where his elbow joint should have been, and he tried to stab the masked ninja. Kakashi looked back in time and saved himself from the blade using the metal forearm guards he wore. From behind, Yamato also sent elemental wood to crush the puppet master, but a large blade appeared out of the latter's back and blocked the attack. Fugaku and the other two Uchiha were out of chakra and stamina after the fight, so they backed out. But Might Guy was still on the battlefield, with the second gate unlocked. As Sasori was in this deadlock position with Kakashi on one side, and Yamato on the other, Might Guy went for another kick from the top. But as he was about to proceed with his attack, Sasori's head mechanically dislocated from his torso, turning sideways but not severed, and from inside his throat Yamato could see a complex system of wires and mechanisms. But there was another thing. A small blade projecting upwards. The puppet master had some sort of weapon fitted in all parts of his body. As Might Guy was coming down upon Sasori, Kakashi could see it all, even the blade that was pointing upwards, ready to strike. This puppet master was crazy, Kakashi thought, first his previous body was just a puppet shell made out of a human. And now, it seems that he isn't alive at all, but just a robot with weapons in his body, and the consciousness of a puppet master. Kakashi had to act quickly, the blade was now elevated, ready to pierce Guy's Achilles ankle, maybe even go right through. At this moment, Kakashi went out of his way and sent a wave of lightning chakra to break the blade, but this in turn broke the deadlock in Sasori's favor. The puppet master's blade pierced into Kakashi's forearm, and blood began dripping. But the wound was worth it, as the blade broke and a devastating kick landed on Sasori's body, almost going right through downwards, since Sasori's body was made of metal and wires, something Guy could easily break. 
The kick proved effective, as the next moment Sasori's body began to act odd, and drop the blades that were currently struggling against Kakashi and Yamato's elemental wood. Then, as Kakashi groaned in pain, he quickly took out a knife and with it pierced Sasori's chest. The puppet master's entire body was just a puppet fitted with all sorts of weapons, only a core in his chest was the living thing that kept him alive. Kakashi wasn't aware of this, but he attacked there instinctively, as something like the heart being damaged can end any life. This guess had proven fateful, as the single thing keeping Sasori alive was pierced, and the puppet master's body fell dead. Kakashi breathed heavily and sighed in relief. Blood was dripping from his wrist, he was in great pain and groaned, and the wound was probably deep. Sasori's defeat had also shocked the Kumo ninjas, who were shocked, but a moment later, they also gave battle cries and charged to meet their opponents. Might Guy and Yamato appeared in front of Kakashi, ready to face their foes. All the other Konoha shinobi also charged forward. Guy looked back at Kakashi who was tightly holding his wrist and gasping for air, and spoke with a wide smile familiar to Kakashi. You go and heal, Kakashi. We will handle this. Kakashi nodded and jumped behind the lines and back inside the village. Might Guy be prepared for the fight ahead, and in a few seconds Kakashi could hear Guy cracking skulls and the screams of enemy ninjas. The ninja was energetic but deadly, he had probably awakened his third gate to face such a large host of enemies. On the other side of the enemy lines, the Varangian guard had flanked the enemy. Over the last few days before the attack, the Roman cohort had built a series of small but tight fortifications in the forest surrounding Konoha, manned by a few dozen experienced soldiers each. These, mini forts, were small but very hard to breach, as Konoha had helped by putting chakra restriction seals around them, forcing the shinobi to fight hand to hand. Something the Romans had proved themselves deadly proficient in. These forts did the trick to halt the enemy advance to some extent, and not let the entire brunt of their forces fall upon Konoha. But as the fight was going on, the Kumo ninja had diverted their attention from these fortifications to Konoha itself. This allowed the Varangians to easily come to the aid of their comrades. They went to each fortification, clearing any Kumo shinobi that might be there fighting. Finally, as the Konoha shinobi battled their Kumo counterparts at the front, in the rear of the enemy lines Brutus had assembled all the forces here. The cohort had been reduced to 400 men but was still strong, while his guard of 200 Varangians, only 80 of each Brutus had led inside Konoha while the rest manned the fortifications, were also deadly. They assembled on the rear of the enemy line, as the shinobi were busy with their Konoha counterparts. The Romans were in a tight formation, with the Roman cohort in the middle with their shields drawn, and the Varangians in the flanks. The company of the knights had remained back at the fortifications. Brutus himself was at the back of the line, urging his men forward. The Romans and the Varangians charged forward, their equipment and stamina greatly enhanced with the help of chakra. As they crashed into the Kumo shinobi from the rear, the latter was put in a precarious position. From the front, the Konoha shinobi were pounding them and pushing them back, while now on the rear the Romans slaughtered through them. Why were they failing? Because the Kumo ninja was employing a simple strategy of sending waves of shinobi to tire the enemy. As one wave began losing its chakra and stamina, it retreated to the rear while a fresh wave of shinobi entered the battlefield. This way, while the ablest shinobi were busy with their Konoha counterparts, the already exhausted ninjas had to deal with the Romans who were now also reinforced with chakra. The Romans charged forward, giving battle cries and shouting, they fell like a storm on the tired Kumo ninjas. The impetus of their charge almost immediately broke the enemy line, which was spread thin around the front and also tired. The Varangians cut through their opponents, their axes reddened with blood, and giving war cries that sent chills down one's spine. The actual Romans were fighting in a more defensive and contained manner after the initial charge, grinding slowly through the enemy and wearing them down with their tight formations. It didn't help either that the Romans' armor was seemingly impenetrable with normal weapons and jutsu, and that they could now chase the shinobi and were very flexible. As the battle continued, the Kumo shinobi were losing. Their morale had already suffered after Sasori's defeat, and now they were being pushed from both sides. The battle was fierce, with much bloodshed. At this time, the commander of the invasion forces ordered a retreat. They had already lost about half of their forces, and couldn't continue fighting. But the discipline and cohesion of the Kumo forces were lost a while ago, as each squad now fended for itself to survive the battle. 
What little fighting spirit was left shattered as soon as the order to retreat was passed down the squads and platoons, and they all fled desperately, only causing more casualties. But at the end of the day, the Allied powers had won, and Konoha was saved. In the evening of the same day the sun was beginning to set, the sky appeared orange, and the disappearing sun appeared a light shade of red like the blood that was shed today. The forest around Konoha was desolated, with many trees having fallen, and corpses scattered around. And in this forest, Marcus was wandering with a handful of his soldiers. The governor wore decorated cuirass, leg, and forearm guards, and carried a short sword, he wasn't wearing his helmet. There were a dozen soldiers, who casually went around the forest, they were searching for any survivors and finishing them off. These shinobi were talented so not even a single one could be let go if possible. The enemy force had been 2,000 strong, but only about 300 had survived. Brutus was walking around the forest with a stern look, as he saw one of the young Kumo shinobi lying on the support of a tree, breathing heavily. The shinobi was tightly holding his left thigh and groaning, this was a serious wound as any cut on the thighs can cause serious blood loss. Brutus walked close to the shinobi, who looked up with terrified but stern eyes. Brutus' face was cold and emotionless, he merely readied his short sword, and in a moment planted the blade into the shinobi's chest. The latter merely groaned and grunted, he didn't even have enough energy to scream, and in a few seconds, he was dead. Marcus pulled out his blade from the man's chest and shook the blood off with a jerk. As he put the sword back in its scabbard, a figure approached Marcus from behind. A bloody day this was. Marcus recognized the voice, it was the lame counselor Danzo. The man had an unusual calmness in his voice, that seemed unlikely as compared to his political beliefs and ideology. Indeed, Lord Danzo, but we won. Marcus looked back, and he was right. There was the same crippled veteran with bandages over half of his body and a walking stick in his hands. The man continued in his calm voice. Yes, our victory was surely worthy and hard earned. And you were right about those bodyguards of yours, they're fine warriors. Brutus smirked at hearing this, and answered. I told you, sir, those men are one of the best warriors you'll find in all of Rome, even though they aren't Romans. Danzo gave a nod of acknowledgement and turned his head back towards the village. Hirazan has requested for you, they're holding a meeting. Marcus sighed and started walking toward the village at a slow pace. I'll come after I've rested a little, Danzo didn't say anything, and he didn't seem to mind. The old man too made his way back to the village, with the same intention in mind. It was a very foggy morning in Kumogakure, as it always was. The sun hadn't risen yet, but it wasn't dark either. The entire village was asleep, but there was restlessness in the mind. News of the campaign's failure had reached back home, and the survivors who came limping back were instead punished for inability to attain a victory. The wreckage was sitting atop a mountain a few kilometers away from the village. The mountain was rocky and barren, but its summit was plain, from there they could even see the wreckage tower, the tallest structure in Kumogakure. The same building in which the wreckage had attended a meeting late into the night the previous day. That same meeting had caused his face to bear a frustrated expression, and come to this mountain. The masked man who claimed to be Madara had agreed to come to this very spot, to collect his own due of the agreement. Portions of the eight and two tailed beasts. The wreckage was only wearing a woolen cloak despite the biting cold and sat on a rock. As he waited quietly, the teleportation jutsu of the masked man appeared, and then he. The man wore a long black cloak with red clouds and the same orange mask with one eye hole. The man looked up at the seated rakage and began in a calm voice. Good morning, Lord Rakage. I hope you will fulfill your part of the agreement? The rakage looked up with a stern face, and replied. Listen, we must talk. About what? The rakage removed his hood, looked up completely to meet the eyes of Toby, and spoke firmly. I am breaking this alliance, and refuse the payment. Toby chuckled under his mask, and spoke. Stop joking around Lord Rakage, and hand over the scrolls. I ignored what the masked man said and continued. That man you sent, Sasori of the Red Sand. What sort of idiot was he? The puppet master, couldn't even kill a single Konoha shinobi, and he died and caused our entire attack to collapse. Toby also became serious and spoke. Well, we are ready to send more of our skilled shinobi, like Kisame or Hidan. The masked ninja was cut short by the rakage, who spoke sharply. 
I attended an emergency meeting with the council last night, they have voted to end this conflict. We've already lost many in Turtle Island, those axe-wielding Romans they call, Varangians, are constantly raiding our coastal territories, disappearing as soon as we can muster any resistance, and their cavalry is destroying our countryside. We don't have the support of our people to continue the war. I can do nothing now, and since you were also of no help during the attack I refuse the payment. Toby remained persuasive but calm. Well, you can tell them about us. Tell them what? That I've made a secret alliance with a group of S-tier rogue shinobi at the top of the bingo book. I had to act of hiring Sasori as an independent mercenary to gain acceptance from the council. If word gets out that I'm dealing with missing Nin, it will greatly tarnish my standing in the village and that of Kumovikar on a global scale. Toba's voice now grew stern and demanding as he replied. Whatever your excuses may be rakage, we've lost a skilled shinobi because of this and I want my dues. The rakage now get up and prepared to leave. Shut up, this is my final decision and I don't think you can do anything about it. There was now clear anger in Toba's manner and voice as he answered. Do as you want, rakage, but I will extract the tailed beasts. Whether by a treaty or by force. As he said this, several kanai came flying towards the rakage at great speed. The latter easily blocked the projectiles with the big golden bambraces on his wrist and spoke with slight hints of anger and annoyance in his voice. I am trying to remain calm boy, do not attempt to rouse my anger or you'll regret it. Saying this, the rakage jumped into the air and quickly disappeared. Toby could only fume under his mask, he had lost a good shinobi in this war and didn't get anything in return. But it would be very rash to attack Kumo or the rakage now. Akatsuki is made up of rogue shinobi, but they're viewed with a neutral stance by the ninja villages in Rome, and act like attacking a village will make shinobi villages more active in pursuing the end of this band of missing nin. Toby will get his revenge, but not now. In Konoha it was a busy day, as people hurriedly went about and the entire village was bustling with activity. It was late morning and the sun now shone in the sky, but it wasn't hot. The bustle was because the citizens were busy repairing the village and treating those wounded during the attack, and the Roman garrison was also leaving today alongside the governor. Marcus himself was currently in his nephew's apartment, chatting with him. The apartment was peaceful and quiet, quiet enough to feel odd. There was only the governor dressed in complete black and his twelve-year-old nephew Maximus in the living room, where an LED lit the entire hall. The furniture and overall look of the room hadn't changed much over the years, there was a new table in the living room and sofas, but the walls felt empty. Marcus had a glass of water in front of him on the table, and he seemed in a good mood, he had been here for the past hour. Both men were usually quiet and contained, but it would be surprising to know how talkative they could be. But as Marcus sipped from his cup while talking, a Roman soldier came inside and slightly bowed to the governor, Marcus looked back and spoke calmly. Yes, the soldier was wearing standard Roman armor, and spoke. All preparations for the departure are made, sir, we only await your arrival. Marcus nodded and waved the soldier off. Yes, I will be coming in a moment. The soldier slightly bowed again and then left, Marcus looked back at Maximus and smiled. It seems our little meeting is over now. It is, it seems. Marcus got up from his seat, adjusted his coat, and spoke. By the way, I had something to give you. Maximus also got up, while Brutus took out something from his coat's side pocket. It was a shiny locket, with a chain made of gold. Attached to the chain was a symbol, a large P with a horizontal X over it, there was also the alphabet, A, on the left of the symbol, inside the two lines of the X, and the letter Omega on the right, in such a way as it seemed that they were floating there. Marcus handed over the locket to Maximus, who looked at it with curiosity and excitement. Marcus smiled and spoke. This is the Liberum, the symbol of Constantine and the Roman Empire. You know its tale right? Maximus took the locket and didn't speak, Marcus continued. Just before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a dream during his sleep. He was presented in a heavenly abode, where he was introduced to the one truth. The God of the Christians, Yahweh of the Jews, Woden of the Germans, and Saul Invictus, were all different aspects of the same ultimate divine being. Constantine was presented with this symbol and commanded to adopt it as the symbol of his army. Later that day, he won the battle and thus became emperor. This symbol represents Roman pride and the Republic, which our civilization stands for, to bring order where there is chaos. 
take this as a parting gift. Maximus was fascinated and smiled, replying, I'll make sure to live up to Rome's greatness. Marcus chuckled and turned to leave while speaking. I hope you do the same for Konoha and this continent, make the world of men a better plane. But for now, let's say goodbye. Saying this, Marcus walked out of the apartment. Maximus merely gazed at the locket with fascination. Brutus approached the main entrance of Konoha with the guard who had entered the apartment earlier beside him. The Romans, knights, and Varangians were outside, ready to march away. Hirazan with his three advisors and the heads of the various clans in Konoha stood near the giant gates to see the governor off. There was also his retinue of mounted soldiers, with a black horse in their midst ready for his use. The governor passed by the high ranking men of Konoha, giving them a slight bow of respect, and mounted the saddle. The horse was big and well fed, and Marcus took a moment to adjust himself on the saddle. Then, with his head held high, he spoke to the Hokage. Well, Lord Hokage, it seems we must depart, Hirazan smiled and replied. Yes, Lord Marcus, it was a pleasure meeting you. Rome was of great help during the attack. Marcus returned the smile and looked at the advisors and clan heads to the right, giving a nod of acknowledgement. Then he lashed on the whip and directed his horse in the direction of the rest of the army and trotted away with the mounted soldiers at his back. Hirazan and the others stayed there for a while, watching the Romans march away in a column. They talked amongst themselves for a while, but then they dispersed. The Hokage and his advisors went back to the Hokage building while the clan heads returned to their compounds. The Hokage's office looked just as usual, with Hirazan seated on his desk and some files piled up on the table. It was midday outside and the sun shone brightly, intensifying the summer heat. On another end of the room was standing Maximus, the lad had grown well in the past four years. He was sixteen years old, with thick white hair, blue eyes, a tall height, and a lean but fit body. Maximus had a clean-shaven face, a sharp jawline, and a handsome face. He wore the standard chunin equipment of Konoha but also carried a katana. Maximus had been called there for a mission alongside the new Team 7, and Maximus and Hirazan were just waiting for the fresh graduates and their captain to arrive. I am asking you again, Lord Hokage, will you tell me anything about this mission? Maximus asked in a calm, but slightly impatient tone. He had his arms crossed. Hirazan calmly replied while signaling at the noises coming from outside. Wait, Maximus, let the others arrive as well. Oh, it seems they have. As Hirazan said so, the door opened wide, and four people entered the office. Maximus knew three of them. Naruto was the brother of his teammate while Kakashi and Sasuke were well known around the village, the latter being the son of Fugaku Uchiha. But the other girl, a pink-haired Kunoichi with long hair and clothes of the same color was a stranger to him. But she must be skilled if she could graduate from her class full of clan children. Hirazan smiled at the genins before him, good day, Kakashi and you three as well. I hope your newly started shinobi career has been going well." Hirazan quickly got a reply from Naruto, who spoke loudly and impatiently. Enough of that old man, we have had no shinobi career. All we've been doing is catching animals and helping civilians at their jobs. Give us a real mission will ya? Naruto was immediately scolded by Sakura, who was even louder, while Sasuke and Kakashi only glared at Naruto. None, not even Asuma the Hokage's son, had the guts to talk to him like that. The blonde boy was surely skilled, but his hot-headed and direct manner was the opposite of that of his calm sister, Maximus thought. Hirazan only chuckled while puffing his cigar and replied. It's okay, I don't mind, and besides, I have called you here just to give you a proper mission. The room went quiet again, as everyone's attention was caught. Hirazan continued. An engineer from the Land of Waves has hired us for an escort mission to accompany him back home. It can be ranked somewhere between C and B rank, so I have chosen you all for this task. Kakashi's reputation goes before him and Maximus is a prodigy, and you kids will also be able to gather experience. Naruto's face beamed at hearing this, Sasuke and Sakura also seemed excited. You can find the engineer at the reception. Kakashi and Maximus may stay, I wish to talk to them alone. The three genins left the room and now only the Hokage, Kakashi, and Maximus were left in the office. Kakashi looked at Hirazan completely uninterested in whatever the old veteran may say, and asked. So, what is it, Lord Hokage? 
Hirazan cleared his throat and began to speak, Maximus listened attentively. This task that I am assigning you is not a mere escort but is involved in a political matter. You see, the Land of Waves is a small island nation ruled by a daimyo, but the island has been recently under the iron grip of a criminal boss and businessman named Gato. He has hundreds of thugs and non-shinobi mercenaries on his wages and even Zabuza Momochi of Kirigakure. Kakashi's attention was also caught, and the masked ninja closed his book and began listening closely, Hirazan continued. The Romans are planning to acquire the Whirlpool Island and the Land of Waves, but for now they don't have an effective shinobi force. That's why our allies have paid us for some help, your task there is to take care of Zabuza and his sidekick, as well as any other shinobi under Gato. The Romans will take care of everything else, they have also sent a few hundred men for that. The Hokage finished speaking, Kakashi replied in a soft voice. But what is the need of all this, escort mission, thing? Can't you just send someone directly and be done? Hirazan smiled and answered. The engineer is threatened by Gato, so your job is to protect him. This will justify any actions we take against the Yakuza boss and fight him. It is all politics, Kakashi. I have done this for years, so I know. Kakashi seemed to be satisfied and went back to his book. Maximus seemed more interested but only nodded, and both men left the office. In the reception room, they both met the three new genins as well as their employer the engineer. He was an old man with a short beard, eyeglasses, a straw hat, and casual clothes. The man carried a bottle of beer and seemed to be slightly drunk and ignorant. It hadn't been ten minutes that the engineer met the shinobi he was arguing with Naruto. Stop it Naruto, we have to protect the man not fight him, Maximus spoke calmly but he was stern. The engineer turned to look at the Roman and spoke irritably. Sorry but I didn't pay 30,000 Ryo just for three children and a teenager. Naruto seemed to be angered by this remark, as well as Sasuke and Sakura who didn't speak, it must have been the root cause of the initial argument. Maximus remained calm and asked. What might be your name sir? Tazuna. The engineer took a sip from his bottle, Maximus continued calmly but in a taunting manner. Well, Tazuna, the masked shinobi you see here is Kakashi of the Sharingan. But you probably don't know about him living in your Tinu poor island so I'll summarize that he is an above excellent shinobi. This kid you see here is an Uchiha, I am a candidate for Jonin rank, and this blondie is the Nine Tails. Maximus received a short glare from Kakashi, and realized what he was about to say and didn't continue. Tazuna ignored it and replied while walking towards the exit. Alright then young man, but I better get my money's worth. Tazuna walked out towards the village's main entrance. Naruto only muttered to himself. Maximus looked at the blonde, the boy surely was the polar opposite of his sister. Several hours later the four shinobi and Tazuna had been walking for a long time through the rough roads and forests of the land of fire, the nation lacked even basic infrastructure. It wouldn't have been so if the daimyos weren't so busy filling their coffers, but now's not the time to discuss that. They had traversed a good distance and were quite close to the land of waves, as Tazuna said. Everyone walked on silently, Kakashi engrossed in his book and the rest gazing at their surroundings, Tazuna wasn't interested in anything and carried a slightly anxious face. The forest was a tranquil place, with a variety of birds perched on the trees and a canopy of leaves covering the path. It was summer and the day was slightly humid. As Kakashi walked on his eyes fell upon a small muddle on the path, this was odd. The rainy season was still two months away and he hadn't seen any pools or muddles up till now. Kakashi closed his book and looked at Maximus, catching his attention. The masked ninja motioned towards the muddle, and Maximus understood, putting his hand on his katana's handle in anticipation. As everyone in the party walked onwards and the muddle was left behind, Kakashi sensed movement behind him and quickly looked back. But as he did so, he felt something wrap around him. In a second, Kakashi was chained and bound up by two shinobi who wore kirigakure headbands with a scratch on them. The two shinobi tightened the bind and Kakashi lightly groaned. Naruto looked back and in a straightforward but stupid manner charged at the shinobi with a punch, but one of them flung a kanai at the blonde genin that hit his palm and made him get back. However Maximus was quick to react, and in a moment he was missing from his original position. As the two shinobi looked around, a volley of shuriken and kanai rushed at them from the top, but as they dodged the projectiles two clones of the roman charged them with swords even managing to cut off the thumb of one rogue in the melee. At the same time, 
Sasuke also rushed forward and landed a kick on another rogue's head. Kakashi also freed himself from the chains using lightning chakra and joined the fight, landing a devastating kick at one of the ninja's stomachs. Both rogues fell in agony and shock from the pain. Kakashi was quick to bind them to a tree using the same chains. Tazuna was standing a few paces away from the fighting, his eyes widened. After Kakashi was finished chaining up the two rogues, he looked back at the engineer and spoke lightheartedly. You okay sir, it's good they didn't attack you. Tazuna remained quiet but smiled and gave a nod. Maximus looked at the Naruto behind him and spoke. I don't think Naruto is after all the kanais of these shinobi are always laced with poison so we must get him to a physician quickly. Naruto had only sustained a cut on the top of his palm which wasn't substantial on its own, but the poison that entered was. But suddenly, in a daring and knuckle-headed manner, the blonde took out another kanai and stabbed it into his palm, essentially bleeding out the poison. Now everything is okay right Maximus? Naruto spoke with a smile, Maximus chuckled and replied. Well, now you must worry about fighting with that hand and bandaging it. But you're probably good now. Naruto again gave a grin and then looked back at the path forward. Maximus pulled out his blade and spoke to everyone. You guys go forward, I'll take care of them. Kakashi nodded and began walking, followed by everyone else. Maximus will easily catch up. They could have reached the land of waves by now, but it was only the old engineer who was slowing them down. As the rest of the group walked away, Naruto, who was at the back of the party, could hear a few groans and slicing sounds from his back. But the pain in his palm made him concentrate forward and reach the land of waves as soon as possible. It was midday and the sun shone brightly in the sky, its rays hitting the warm ocean currents. The ocean was peaceful for now, and a ship could be seen sailing through the water. It was large, with a giant mast and many oars below the deck. It could house about 500 people by the size of it and sailed with great speed. The winds were calm, and on the deck of the ship, there was a lot of activity. Since there was no wind, many soldiers below the deck were pulling the oars, while above the men chatted and spent their time leisurely. There was not much to do in the middle of the sea except for eating, drinking, and pulling the oars. Marcus was sitting in his quarters, the man didn't seem to have aged even a bit. The ship was large so there was plenty of space for rooms. His quarters weren't luxurious, only a single bed, a desk, a lamp, and two chairs. There was a window that provided a lookout at sea. Marcus was seated in one of the chairs, a wine glass in his hands, but he wasn't alone. Before he was seated another man, middle-aged but fit, with short grayish curly hair, a circle beard, and a stern face. The man had few wrinkles on his face, keen eyes, and wore normal armor but a decorated cuirass. The room was quiet for a while, as both men silently sipped on their glasses. Marcus began. So, how do you like this continent, Severus? The man looked up met the governor's eyes, and answered calmly. The language, culture, and the people here are certainly interesting, especially those shinobi. Marcus sipped some wine and replied. Yeah, they truly are sir. You know about them? Of course, it's been all over the nation ever since the soldiers and merchants returned with tales and stories of magical warriors. You probably know better Marcus, you've been here for more than a decade now. Marcus smiled for a second, but then continued. This is like a fantasy land with magical creatures and people, but a fantasy land you didn't want to live in, up till now. Severus raised an eyebrow, his attention was caught. Marcus emptied his glass set it aside on the table, and continued. I'll start with some history. Before the establishment of shinobi villages, all ninjas in this continent were divided into various mercenary clans linked by blood. At that time this land was divided into countless smaller kingdoms, fiefdoms, etc all wrestling for power. But these lords didn't fight their battles themselves, most instead hired a shinobi clan to fight for them, causing their opponent to do the same. It was an era of constant warfare and blood flowed like water, and in this tussle, entire populations of a settlement were killed or enslaved. But then one day the Uchiha and the Senju, two of the strongest clans in existence, decided to merge and form one political entity they named, Village Hidden in the Leaves. This tipped the power balance as now the two strongest clans were united as one force, so quite a few other clans also opted to join Konoha, while others decided to band together and form their hidden villages. 
These villages took missions but were no longer mercenaries, in a war they would only fight for the country they lived in or their allies. This way, the bloodshed of the previous era was reduced quite a lot, even though there have been three world wars here in the past 80 years. Pompey nodded and closed his eyes, sipping the wine, and then spoke. Quite a bloody history indeed, but nowhere close to ours. Both men lightly chuckled, and then Marcus changed the topic. By the way, what has been going on back home? Well, a ton of shit has been going back home. The Germans tried another attack across the Rhine but failed, as always. The Christians have been causing a bit of trouble, riots and burning stuff. The Persians have blocked the shipping of spices from the east so there's probably gonna be a conflict, or tensions. But most of all, there is a ton of gunpowder now, and new weapons. Marcus nodded and replied. Yes, I was seeing the new arquebuses you brought with you. Severus laughed lightly and spoke. No, no, those aren't arquebuses. Long pieces of stick were put on a tripod and the gunpowder was lit with a matchlock. These are an evolved version called muskets. These aren't as cumbersome as arquebuses, instead, they're easy to carry and shoot. It can pierce almost any armor, and it can turn the tide of battle if in large numbers and trained well. There are also new smaller cannons called, serpentines, that are designed to target troops. Brutus raised an eyebrow. Well if these weapons are so capable, I can see the end of the old system of warfare. Severus refilled his glass and spoke. However these weapons take five minutes to reload, five enough minutes for any horseman to reach them and cut them into pieces. These are also expensive and hard to make, so I see them limited to just a few cohorts of excellently trained users. It will take another century for these long sticks even to get a chance to replace the old ways, but when they do it will turn combat upside down. Brutus nodded and was satisfied, glancing out at the sea he spoke. Reckon how much time till we hit land? Severus also looked through the window and replied. Probably another hour or so, near the land of waves. Tazuna and the squad of Shinobi walked on, and now the island of waves and the bridge under construction were visible. We're close, Maximus commented, looking forward, but as they walked on, a hail of Kanai and Shuriken flew toward Tazuna. Kakashi was quick and saved him, everyone became alert and drew out their weapons, but then suddenly out of nowhere, a giant blade flew toward Kakashi's head. But the masked ninja saved himself by dodging it in time, the blade flew forward and hit a tree, sticking to it. As Kakashi looked back at the giant blade, he could see a tall shinobi wearing a mask and brownish clothing, with straight hair and a kirigakure headband on his head with a scratch, notifying him of his rogue status. The rogue ninja stood atop the blade and looked forward at the ninja before him. Maximus was quick and in a moment was behind the man, and attempted to strike at the man's legs with his sword. But the shinobi was fast, and before Maximus could land his blow he was up in the air, doing a 360 midair and flung more kanai at Maximus, one of which inflicted a cut on the Roman's cheek. Maximus got back and held his cheek tight, closing his eyes for a second. When he opened them the blade and the man were gone. Kakashi had now become serious and instructed his students to guard the engineer while they dealt with the rogue. Kakashi ran his eyes around the area, it was a forest with a lake nearby. As he was searching for the man, he detected a small movement at the corner of his eye towards the lake. By instinct he rushed towards the direction in an alert manner, followed by Maximus. Now Kakashi could see the figure of the shinobi running away towards the lake, Kakashi pursued. But suddenly, the shinobi vanished from where he had been, and Kakashi sensed someone behind him. He hastily turned back while jumping to see the same shinobi with a kanai in hand, ready to stab Kakashi. The masked ninja was quick, blocking the kanai stab with his forearm guards pulling out his kanai, and shoving it through the man's throat. As Kakashi landed the stab, the shinobi's figure turned into water and fell to the ground. A water clone, Kakashi thought for a while, and then his face shot up with tension. How could he have done such a grave blunder? The enemy ninja wanted Kakashi to pursue him, and get him away from the engineer. The three new genins were talented but would be no match for a rogue, especially one from Kiri. Kakashi immediately turned back and bid Maximus follow him, the two men rushed back towards Tazuna with great speed. As both men got back, Kakashi had been right. The ninja was making his way towards Tazuna who froze in fear, while Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke desperately tried to put up a fight. But there was still time, and Kakashi was quick to utilize it. 
he formed several hand signs in a few seconds and shot out several bolts of sharp wind chakra towards the rogue at great speed. Zabuza quickly turned back, and blocked most of the attacks with his giant blade, although one managed to grease his forearm, going through the skin and exposing a tiny bit of muscle tissue. Zabuza flinched for a second out of pain, but then looked Kakashi directly in the eye and spoke. Kakashi of the Sharingan, you'll be a worthy opponent. Kakashi pulled up his headband to reveal his Sharingan and replied. Zabuza Momochi of the Seven Swordsmen, I didn't expect you to be here. And indeed, Kakashi was surprised to find out who his opponent was. It wasn't that he was scared or intimidated. Zabuza had escaped Kirigakir and the Land of Water after heading a failed coup against the fourth Mizukage, but Kakashi hadn't expected him to be here. Kakashi and Maximus rushed at Zabuza with a kanai and katana in their hands respectively, and engaged in a melee. Zabuza was outnumbered but skilled, but his heavy blade put him at a disadvantage as compared to the quick Kakashi and Maximus. Zabuza got back after a few minutes of fighting and put his blade back in its scabbard on his back. He then performed many hand signs, and in a moment several dozen water clones of him were made. These clones fought with their hands and were quick, while Zabuza used his blade. Kakashi and Maximus responded by also making two shadow clones each. However, water clones are fragile as they're not meant for open combat. Because of this, as the fight goes on most of Zabuza's clones are easily dispelled. The ninja himself was fighting Kakashi while Maximus handled the clones. As both men were engaged in a melee, Zabuza got a lucky shot and kicked Kakashi in the stomach. The masked ninja gasped from under his mask and got a few paces away, leaving his guard open. Zabuza took this opportunity to make another clone that rushed towards Kakashi from behind. Kakashi was able to dodge in time and dispelled the clone, but as he did so the real Zabuza lunged forward and was near the Hitaki in a second. But he did not attack, instead, he performed a few hand signs before Kakashi could react, and formed a water cage around the Konoha Shinobi. Suddenly, Kakashi found himself unable to move in this water cage, not even a slight movement of the finger as he was being bogged down on his knees by the jutsu's pressure. Zabuza grinned under his mask and looked around. Maximus had dealt with most of the clones while the three genins were protecting Tazuna. He again created six clones and sent them after Tazuna, while concentrating on Maximus and keeping Kakashi trapped. Dispelling the rest of the clones, Maximus faced Zabuza with his sword. The latter made hand signs with one hand in quick succession, and before Maximus could reach him he shot out a burst of chakra water from his mouth, its force strong enough to pierce a tree's stem. Maximus was quick and made four shadow clones, while narrowly missing the water jutsu. His clones surrounded Zabuza and did a few hand signs to create a dome of earth chakra around the rogue with small open spaces. Then they weaved a few more hand signs, and Zabuza recognized them. Whatever it was, it was a fire jutsu, the Roman was thinking of burning him alive. Kakashi will be safe because of the mere density of the water prison he was in. Knowing Zabuza let go of the prison, which only disperses in six seconds if not supported, and made for the roof of the dome. Zabuza's right leg glowed with chakra, and in the next moment the Kiri rogue landed a devastating kick on the dome's top. The structure still stood but only needed another strike. Zabuza punched it again and it broke, revealing it from the top. Kakashi also got out of the water prison and escaped just in time before Maximus clones performed the fire jutsu. Only a few seconds later all four of the clones shot out fireball jutsus from their mouths, which were essentially smaller in size compared to the average. The flames engulfed the insides of the dome and even rippled out of the hole on the top that Zabuza had created giving the impression of a burning furnace. As the flames subsided, combat resumed. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura had surprisingly been able to defeat the clones despite being outnumbered two to one. Maximus and Kakashi fought Zabuza, the latter losing. Finally, as the fight continued, Kakashi kicked Zabuza's stomach hard enough that blood came gushing out of his mouth and reddened the mask. The Kiri rogue backed to a safe distance, leaning on a tree and holding his stomach. He was in pain and exhausted, both his chakra and stamina were almost completely used up. As Kakashi prepared for one last attack to finish the fight, lightning chakra began to gather in his palm. But before he could do so three very thin needles hit Zabuza's neck from the side. The latter's expression gave out sudden shock and pain, and he fell to the ground. Suddenly, a shinobi appeared on a nearby tree, 
wearing Kirigakir Anbu gear and the mask of the tracking unit. The shinobi came down and surprisingly lifted Zabuza on his shoulders with ease, despite his lean and thin physique. Kakashi and Maximus prepared to face him, but the shinobi spoke calmly. I'm not here to fight, Konoha shinobis. I am a member of the tracking unit from Kirigakir, tasked with eliminating rogue ninjas. You have made my work easy so I'll thank you for that, but I must get going. Hearing this, Maximus and Kakashi eased their battle stances, while the Kiri ninja took off with Zabuza. As Maximus and Kakashi walked back towards their party, Naruto asked timidly. Who was that guy? Maximus kept walking and didn't look up, his clothes were a bit roughed up because of the fighting but he wasn't injured, and spoke. Kirigakir ninja, from the tracking unit, but I highly doubt that. Sasuke looked at him and asked. Why? Kakashi answered from the back, the party had unconsciously resumed their journey. First of all, a tracker ninja destroys the body of the rogue on the spot so that information about the village cannot be spilled, but this guy took the body off with him. Tracker ninjas also don't stop to have a chat with other shinobi, they should instead be ready to fight if they suspect others are here to take the corpse. So he was a suspicious guy, Sakura spoke while looking back from the front of the party. Maximus nodded, and after this, nobody spoke. They quietly resumed their journey until they reached the land of waves. Inside the town it was late afternoon now. The party walked forward on the main road of the town, which was not well maintained. Maximus looked around the market, this was a poor town. The shops and stalls were either low or out of stock, there wasn't even enough food. There weren't a lot of people on the road, this place was scarcely populated. It made sense, who wants to live in a place where there is always a shortage of food and necessities? Tazuna led the four shinobi through the road, and into a secluded street on the outskirts of the town. The engineer stopped in front of a decent two-story house made of primarily wood, near the coast, and invited them inside. All of them took off their footwear and sat down on the ground in what seemed the living room, composed of green carpeting, wooden walls with a few pictures, and a large wooden table. From one corner of the house, a young woman came into the chamber, she wore common apparel and had long black flowing hair. Are you okay father? I hope the journey was easy. The woman was the old engineer's daughter it seemed, and the man replied in a calm and low voice. Yes, it was. These Konoha shinobi protected me throughout the journey, prepare some food for them as well. The woman gave a nod and returned to the room she had come from after giving a nod of acknowledgement to the shinobi. There wasn't a need to trouble yourself with cooking more food, sir. Maximus calmly spoke, Tazuna looked at him with what seemed a friendly look. It's okay, a friend of mine is coming over today so it won't be much trouble. Maximus nodded, and got up while informing everyone. I'll be taking a stroll around the town. Don't worry, I'll be back in time. Saying this he walked towards the door and put on his sandals, while Kakashi also remembered about training and decided to teach his students chakra control in the nearby woods. Maximus was walking around the streets and roads of the town aimlessly, looking around. There was nothing special to see in the town itself, so he just kept walking on the road that led out of the settlement. On the outskirts, he could see a better standard of living, with good houses and even a few small farms with paddy. Although this area was quiet and secluded, there were only one or two people on the road now, which had degraded into a dirt path as he exited the main town. But as Maximus walked on, he was met with an interesting sight. At the end of the town, beyond which there were only farms, he could see a tall stone tower. The design was simple, with even simpler carving and decorations, but it looked quite old. The tower was tall and covered a decent area, there was moss on its walls and it was damaged in several places. But it must have been a majestic structure back in its day. Maximus' attention was caught, and he decided to investigate. The wooden door of the tower was run down and it was just a board of rotten wood now. The insides of the tower must have been glamorous at some point, but now it was just a ruinous building with pieces of furniture lying here and there, and image frames fallen to the ground. As the man continued investigating out of interest, he ascended to the upper floors. The first floor must have served as a small armory, with rusted blades and swords lying around, and rotting weapon stands. The second floor was empty with pieces of bedding furniture lying around. The topmost floor was the most interesting, with racks and shelves full of scrolls, and a few lying on the ground and rotting. The floor was dirty and the walls discolored. 
There was a desk in the middle with spots of dry blood. But Maximus didn't pay much heed to that, his interest lay in the scrolls. He opened the drawers of the desk, which were surprisingly intact, and found several scrolls and books. He took out the first one he saw and lay it open on the table. It was a record, and ran. The 17th of June, the siege of Uzushiogakir continues, with the forces of Kiri, Iwa, and Kumo attempting to assault the village. The village persists, but help is required. The land of waves remains safe and won't be a target for enemy attacks, requesting reinforcements. At the bottom of the scroll, a seal was stamped, with a whirly symbol. A whirly symbol on the back of Maximus' flak jacket, the Uzumaki symbol. By the format of this document, it must have been an official letter. The scroll was pretty old and discolored, so not all the contents were readable. Maximus' eyes lit up, this was not an abandoned property. It was a treasure trove of history. But as Maximus looked outside, the sun was beginning to set. It was almost time and he must return. Maximus opened a basic sealing scroll and stored all the records he could inside it. He needed to tell this to the Hokage when they got back, it could shed light on some of the events that remained in the dark. Perhaps even lay their hands on some seals of the Uzumaki? Naruto woke up in his bed. It was morning and the sun was shining brightly outside. They had been provided two spare rooms in Tazuna's house to stay and slept on the floor with bedding. The rest of the bedding was empty, everyone was already awake and probably having meals. Naruto also quickly got up and rushed toward the dining table of the house. He was right, everyone was seated at the table and eating food silently, while Maximus was having a brief conversation with Tazuna. As Naruto entered the room, the Roman turned to look at him and spoke. You finally woke up. Kakashi dismissed him and replied. It's okay, yesterday's training went hard on them. They needed rest. Naruto seated himself on the table while Maximus' attention went back to Tazuna. So, doesn't your daimyo do anything about these thugs? Tazuna kept on eating while speaking without looking up. He would have, but he's essentially powerless. I remember that life on this island was better before the Second Ninja World War when Shinobi from Uzu maintained order here. But after the village's destruction, this was just a poor, lawless land. Even the few samurai on the payroll of the daimyo are too corrupt to care. And besides, he is yet to look into these matters after taxing the hell out of us. Maximus gave a nod of understanding, the man liked such talks related to politics as Naruto knew. He had visited the Roman's apartment a few times and had seen only books covering a quarter of the house. About the Second Ninja World War, what happened to the Whirlpool Daimyo after Uzu's fall? Maximus kept questioning out of curiosity, the scrolls he had found hosted plentiful knowledge but still weren't enough. Kakashi and Sasuke also showed slight hints of interest in the topic, only they had the brains to understand all this. Tazuna again replied, I am not certain of it, he was either taken prisoner or killed himself by seppuku, honorable suicide. But whatever happened to him, it is certain that his young son was installed on the throne and became a puppet of Kirigakir. So that's how Kiri acquired so many sealing techniques, Kakashi commented, Maximus nodded in agreement. After this, everyone ate in silence and quickly finished their meals. Kakashi got up and started walking towards the door. Maximus and Team 7, follow me. We've got to meet with someone. Maximus and the others also quickly got up and followed Kakashi outside. In the street Maximus and Team 7 followed Kakashi, who led them toward the coast of the town. I still don't understand Kakashi-sensei, who are we to meet? Naruto asked impatiently. Kakashi turned his eyes and replied while walking. The Romans. They're here to help us. Sasuke looked up. But why? Well, they want to acquire this island. We will help them in dealing with the shinobi on Gato's payroll. Everyone was satisfied and kept on walking. After walking for a few minutes, the shinobi spotted the Roman soldiers and a lot of activity in the distance. As they got near, they saw that the Roman soldiers were handing out rations of grain and vegetables to the people. A good strategy to earn the support of the masses. Kakashi approached a group of soldiers talking amongst themselves. Can you tell us where your commander is? The soldiers looked at Kakashi, they seemed puzzled. The masked ninja repeated his question but again got no answer. Maximus sighed and gently pushed Kakashi back. He approached the soldiers. He pointed toward his Konoha headband wrapped around his arm and spoke. UBIS Dukes 2s. 
The soldiers nodded and pointed towards a place near the outskirts of the town and spoke a few words in Latin to Maximus. The latter gave them a friendly smile and then looked back towards his team. There on the outskirts of the town, near the woods, he started walking towards where the soldiers had pointed, and the others followed him. What are they doing in the forest? Sakura asked sheepishly. We can only know once we get there, Maximus replied. There was silence for a brief while, Kakashi looked back toward the group of Roman soldiers and spoke. Communication is gonna be hard with the Romans. Maximus noticed this and replied. All the higher officials and commanders can speak our language, but most common soldiers can't, so you'll need me around. Seems like it, Kakashi commented and continued walking. As the group neared their destination, they could see several large tents pitched near the forest. As they kept walking, they were intercepted by a legionary who questioned them. Maximus talked to him for a while and then the situation seemed to clear. We can proceed. Maximus spoke and bid the others follow him. Just then, they heard a loud sound, like a small explosion coming from the direction they were heading. The shinobi quickened their pace, concerned and curious about the sound. But as they came closer, the sounds kept coming after short intervals and ever louder. But when they reached the place, they only found Marcus, Severus, and several other soldiers with odd-looking wooden pipes in their hands. In front of them, a dozen thugs were chained to wooden poles and their mouths also bound. Behind them were also targets made of sacks stuffed with sand, and the governor was pointing the wooden pipes towards the target. He pulled the trigger, and half a second later there was a clear and deep hole in the target and the same loud noise came, which they had heard while coming here. One of the thugs shrieked, as the projectile narrowly missed him and hit the target behind. Team 7 looked at the pipe, with awe and curiosity, while Kakashi and Maximus approached the two commanders. The former spoke first. Greetings. Lord Governor, we are the Konoha Shinobi sent to assist you. Marcus smiled while looking at Kakashi and replied. Kakashi of the Sharingan, it's good to see you again, as well as you, Maximus. The governor looked at Maximus, who greeted him with a smile. Marcus now turned to face Severus while pointing his hands toward the Shinobi. These are the Konoha Ninja who are here to assist us. Severus tilted his head to look at Kakashi, who gave a slight bow of respect. Severus nodded in acknowledgement and then walked toward the two. I have no doubts you'll be helpful here in dealing with the rogue shinobi. Saying this, Severus turned back and slowly started walking back towards the pipe like weapon. Brutus informed Kakashi and Maximus. Well then, now that I have introduced you to Severus the first should get going, Maximus asked. Where? Brutus crossed his arms and replied, Well, I just need to inform the daimyo of this land that he isn't the one in charge anymore. Commander Severus will be the one directing affairs here for the time, as my assistant. Brutus intentionally spoke the last sentence loudly enough for Severus to hear, and slightly rotated his head to see the old commander. The latter turned back to look at the governor with the pipe-like weapon in hand, his face told that he would have surely shot Marcus then and there if they had been alone. Marcus turned back and chuckled lightly while continuing. Don't mind him, he simply can't swallow the fact that someone younger than him will be his superior. But he's friendly enough and decisive as a commander, you'll get used to him like I did. Saying this the governor departed toward the place where the horses were tied, and in five minutes he set off with a hundred elite soldiers inland. Kakashi and Maximus now got near Severus, and Maximus asked, Who are these guys tied to the poles? Severus put aside the weapon he was using and took up another one. Swiping its barrel with a piece of cloth, he replied without looking up. Gatto's thugs, we caught them early in the morning, trying to extort the townsfolk for money. However, Kakashi's interest lies elsewhere. He pointed towards the gun Severus was polishing and asked. What's this weapon? Severus turned his eyes to meet Kakashi's for a moment, then turned back while speaking. It's hard to explain plainly how this thing works, but I'll explain what it does. This is called a musket. It uses gunpowder to shoot projectiles at great speed and can pierce through almost anything. The best thing? No real skills are needed to use it, you just need a good shoulder. Kakashi and Maximus examined the rack nearby, with the same weapons called, muskets, placed on it. Severus noticed this and spoke to them. You may try them, but first send the children away. By, children, Severus meant Team 7. Kakashi approached them and briefly told them that he needed to talk with Severus about some important matters and that they should go back to Tazuna who was overseeing the construction of the bridge. 
The Genins were disappointed but still obeyed their captain. The first to go was Maximus who took the weapon Severus had been polishing and had loaded and aimed it. But before he could shoot at anything or anyone, Severus spoke calmly. Why don't we conduct our interrogation at the same time? I'll ask them questions, and if they refuse you'll shoot them. Got a problem with that boy? Maximus smiled and replied. Don't worry, I've already vanquished dozens of bandits and rogues on missions. This won't be hard for me. Severus laughed. Ah yes, vanquished will be the decent term, but now we should start our interrogation. Severus walked up to the first man and untied his mouth. So, where is this Gatto currently? The man, a thin guy with a small stubble and cropped hair, didn't speak. It couldn't be said whether it was out of loyalty for his boss or fear. But whatever the case, Maximus pulled the musket's trigger and a second later blood was flowing from the man's chest. The thug gave a small scream but said nothing more. Severus walked up to the next one. Will you talk? The man gave a desperate nod and Severus untied his mouth. The tied man first took a deep breath, he was a more or less fat person with a bald head and mild stubble. Boss is in a coastal town in the land of fire, not far from here. How much exactly? Severus spoke coldly, about four kilometers. He went there yesterday. Severus closed his eyes in thought and then moved on to the next. How many shinobi do you have? The man didn't speak, he simply didn't know. But before Severus could say anything, a bullet flew by him and hit the tied man in the chest. Severus turned to look at Maximus. I hadn't ordered yet. Maximus relaxed his stance and replied. It wasn't me. Severus' mood turned to light, and he spoke. Then it must be Narzas. Who? Maximus slightly turned his head to see the figure of a man briskly jogging towards them. In a minute, he was standing beside Maximus. He had straight brunette hair, a clean-shaven face with a sharp jawline brown eyes, and an undeniable Caucasian look. The man had approximately the same height as Maximus, was lean, and was about 19 years old. He wore light armor held a musket in his hand, and was the one who'd shot the man. That was an excellent shot from that distance. Severus looked at the man and smiled while clasping his hands. The man also smiled and replied. I am still testing the weapon, to see if it suits me. The range is very long but the reload time is too long as compared to a bow. Severus nodded and pointed towards Maximus and Kakashi. I'd like to introduce you to the shinobi who's here to assist us. The young man turned to face Maximus, and gave a friendly smile. Name's Narzas, good to see you. Narzas protruded his arm. Maximus took it and both men shook hands. My name's Julius Maximus, good to see you too. Narzas raised an eyebrow. So you're the governor's nephew. Well, it's good that I didn't decide to shoot you. Maximus chuckled. Yeah, by the way, what's up with your armor? Narzas got back and examined himself. What? It isn't proper legionary armor, not even complete armor. I'm sure they provide all the equipment in the military garrisons. Narzas showed the musket he was holding and began to explain. Well, I'm not a legionary. I am an archer a sharpshooter to be precise, one of the best you'll find. Soldiers the likes of me stay behind the lines, or snipe the enemy from a distance, so we're not given heavy armor as we're not gonna engage in direct combat. And besides, it hinders my mobility. That explains it, as the two men thus conversed, a soldier came running towards the four men. He first bowed to Severus then spoke hurriedly while out of breath. Sir, Gatto's men have attacked the engineer and the workers. The three shinobi present there are not enough to stop them. Severus' mood turned serious, he looked at Kakashi and spoke to him. You and Maximus go help the shinobi, I'll be coming with the rest of the soldiers in a few minutes. Kakashi nodded and bid Maximus follow him, and in a moment both shinobi were out of Severus' sight. The commander himself went around the camp, gathering soldiers to follow him. Kakashi and Maximus appeared at the construction site, to see Tazuna behind his students. While Gatto stood on the other side, with more than a hundred crooks, thugs, and non-shinobi mercenaries behind him. They held the construction workers captive, not so keen to let them go. Gatto, a short man in a black suit, gray hair, and a balding head, wearing black glasses and carrying a stick, grinned. He looked up at Tazuna and spoke. Look bridge builder, I am in a good mood today so I am not so keen on killing these poor workers. 
If you turn yourself in, you can save the others. Chizuna stayed quiet. Naruto gritted his teeth. Gato grinned again. So it's a no, huh? Well, the blood of these workers and yourself will be on your hands. Saying this, Gato motioned some of his thugs. Seeing this, Kakashi and Maximus rushed forward. In a second, Maximus was in front of Gato and ready to cut the tiny man into pieces, but as he swung his blade, the katana halted midair with a clang. Maximus looked forward and saw Zabuza, who had blocked Maximus' attack with his giant blade. The Roman glared at Zabuza for a while and then got back beside Kakashi. Zabuza slowly walked towards the two Konoha ninjas, his blade sliding over the bridge's concrete and leaving marks. He stopped when he was face to face with Kakashi and Maximus and got back into a battle stance. He then rushed at Kakashi with the blade, almost hitting him. The masked ninja got behind the tall Zabuza and punched him on the side of his stomach. Zabuza gave a light groan but didn't stop, his cumbersome weapon wasn't so good against these quick men. Zabuza went for clones again and created more than a dozen. The fight went on fiercely, with Zabuza's clones almost overwhelming the Konoha ninjas. Zabuza sent wave after wave of clones, who didn't make much difference to the fight but were slowly tiring Kakashi and Maximus. Team 7 stayed back with Tazuna, surrounding him. But as the fight went on, Kakashi spotted his Sharingan a shinobi speeding toward the engineer and his students. Kakashi looked back in an attempt to warn his students, but he was too late. The ninja flew forward with almost imperceptible speed, and flung several sharp needles at Sasuke and Naruto in midair. Two of which hit Sasuke on the back of the palm. The Uchiha groaned and held his hand. The shinobi also appeared. He was the same guy who had supposedly taken Zabuza's corpse. In his quite usual manner, Naruto rushed at him. He went for a punch, but Haku easily dodged it and flung Naruto upside down with one hand. Sasuke, who had carefully removed the needles in great pain, also lunged forward with his one Tomo Sharingan. He was met with some success, as his dojutsu allowed him to predict the opponent's moves and he could put up a fight. But in the end, one miscalculated kick also landed him next to Naruto. Haku now turned to Tazuna. The engineer was now truly afraid and worried. But Sasuke and Naruto got up, the latter creating a dozen shadow clones, and tried to fight Haku. Haku easily dispelled the clones, but Naruto kept creating more and trying to fight. By now, these two boys were only an annoyance to Haku, not trouble keeping him from killing Tazuna. You two are irritating. If you want to fight so hard, you can be test subjects for my most recent jutsu. Haku spoke in a cold voice. As he did so, Naruto went for another attack. This time, Haku punched him hard in the face and sent him flying to one end of the bridge, same with Sasuke. The punch was hard enough to dislocate their jaws, but fortunately couldn't. The two boys lay there for a brief moment, in shock at the pain. But that was enough time for Haku, who arrived before them and promptly made a few quick hand signs. Immediately, blue chakra surrounded the two genins. In a few seconds, the chakra started, crystallizing, around them and forming into large rectangular mirrors. In a few minutes, there were more than two dozen of these mirrors now surrounding the two boys in multiple layers. The sun's rays were almost completely blocked by these mirrors, and in all of them was the image of Haku. As both Naruto and Sasuke got up, they were shocked and alerted by this jutsu. More than two dozen mirrors flowed around them in multiple layers, almost completely blocking off the sunlight, and Haku's figure in each one of them hit Sasuke and Naruto in the arms and back respectively. The wound was painful, but hadn't pierced deep and thus not lethal. Naruto gasps in pain, while Sasuke musters his strength and plucks out the senbons in a painful process. Sasuke got ready, gritting his teeth and activating his one Tomo Sharingan. He went for a strike and kicked through two of the mirrors hard. For a slight moment, he could see the outside, but the area was covered with mirrors as soon as it opened. Haku threw several more senbons at Sasuke who couldn't decipher where the projectiles were coming from. Haku's figure seemed to be constantly moving across the mirrors, striking from unexpected directions. This went on for a while, with Naruto and Sasuke trying to break out by shattering the mirrors, in the end only tiring themselves. Haku didn't even attempt an attack but instead patiently watched them wear themselves down, and after a few minutes, now that both Sasuke and Naruto were panting, he calmly spoke to them. Just surrender, you don't stand a chance. 
I am only here for the engineer, so I'll spare you. Naruto growled in between his heavy breathing, and replied aggressively. As if that will happen. Saying this, he spotted the figure of Haku in the corner of his eye and decided to attack. He was successful in shattering the mirrors, but they again regenerated and Haku appeared in another mirror. Naruto hurriedly went for another attack but was stopped by Sasuke. Stop it, idiot, you're doing just what he wants, wearing yourself down, Haku's voice came again, as calm and cold as before. The Uchiha seems smarter than you, but that doesn't make a difference when you two will be lying down dead. As Haku finished speaking, more than a dozen senbons flew towards Naruto from three sides. Naruto covered himself with his hands out of instinct and closed his eyes. But there was no stinging pain anywhere on his body, the senbons didn't hit him. Naruto opened his eyes to see Sasuke standing in front of him, his torso and arms riddled with senbons and little blood trickling down his arm and falling to the ground. Sasuke slightly turned his head back and gave a grin of satisfaction. I told you, you're weak. Saying this he dropped down, his face going blank. Naruto hurriedly picked him up in his lap and checked him, the Uchiha was still breathing. But the pulse was going ever slower. Meanwhile, Haku's voice reappeared. From which direction Naruto could no longer decipher. Now it's your turn, but as he said so, many small explosion sounds came from the outside. In a split second, more than half of the mirrors shattered as projectiles went through them with almost imperceptible speed. The mirrors did regenerate, but as they did another volley came. Then another. Suddenly, several pillars of earth chakra barged inside the jutsu from the ground and outside. It was sudden, and nearly shook the entire bridge. The earthen pillars came from all sides and covered Naruto, while the mirrors were shattered completely. Haku removed the jutsu and safely retreated to Gato's side. As he appeared, he could see that Zabuza had been beaten back and was standing beside him, panting. He was pretty roughed up with cuts and bruises all over his body. Kakashi also seemed in a similar state. Haku realized who had performed the earth jutsu, it was Maximus, who was currently over the earthen pillars he had created, and helping Naruto and the unconscious Sasuke out. Haku could now also see who had fired those projectiles, it was the Romans. About half of them held strange wooden pipe-like weapons, while the rest were the usual heavily armored infantry, holding their javelins and ready to attack. As the smoke cleared, the scene became clear to everyone. There were about 400 of the Romans, and Severus standing at the front, a wine flask in his hand. Maximus helped Sasuke out, who was sent back to the Roman camp for medical attention alongside some soldiers. Naruto got back near Kakashi. Now, the hundreds of Gato's thugs and mercenaries, non shinobi, were standing face to face with the Roman soldiers. Gato lightly chuckled, seeing the Romans with the pipe like weapons. Do you foreigners expect to beat M.E. with those wooden sticks of yours? Aiming it like a crossbow won't make it one. Severus said nothing, he only took a sip of the wine and smiled. Gatto noticed this and signaled to some of his men. Two swordsmen came forward, but upon seeing them Tazuna's face turned extremely scared and worried. The two thugs were holding Tsunami and Inari, their hands bound behind their backs. Gatto noticed Tazuna's expressions and smiled. Surprised. Are you an engineer? I already gave you an offer before, but you refused it. Tazuna's eyes were full of worry, and he almost came to tears, he ran forward. No please, spare them. I am ready to accept the offer now. But Tazuna was stopped by Severus, who put a hand on his chest and stopped the man from going forward. Why are you stopping him, commander? Gato chuckled, almost tyrannically. Severus remained silent, but then spoke softly to Tazuna. Trust me. Your family will be okay. Tazuna seemed a bit contained now and backed off, but still extremely worried. Severus remained calm and spoke to Gatto with a smile. You're right, Gatto. What can these wooden poles possibly do? Severus smiled and raised his flask in the air, then proceeded to pour it all down on the concrete floor of the bridge. Immediately, a loud sound rang on the bridge. The next moment, the two men holding Inari and Tsunami dropped down dead, a hole in their heads. Recognizing the opportunity, Tsunami grabbed Inari quickly and jumped down into the water. She knew how to swim, living on an island. Maximus immediately dropped down into the water and helped the two out. As soon as two swordsmen dropped dead, Severus shouted, Fire! Immediately, the Romans holding the muskets fired. 
there was an uproar among Gato's thugs, as in the first volley more than fifty immediately dropped dead. After this, the musketeers got back to reload their weapons, while the heavy infantry charged forward in a shield wall. Kakashi took the opportunity and used a Chidori to finally end Haku, while Zabuza who was wounded from the last fight and tired, succumbed to the musket shots. The Roman soldiers threw their javelins, which took out a great lot of the enemy and then charged forward in formation. Of course, the thugs and mercenaries were no match for the killing machine they were facing, and many were killed, blood covered the bridge's floor as the mutilated bodies of the thugs piled up. Some tried to escape by jumping off the bridge but were shot down by the muskets, their blood mixing with the water. As soon as Zabuza and Haku fell the battle turned into a massacre, as the fleeing thugs and mercenaries were, hunted, and killed by the Roman soldiers. Gatto himself was captured amid the battle, getting a black eye from one of the soldiers. As the battle now subsided, and the corpses of Gatto's men were strewn around. It appeared clearly that the Romans or the shinobi hadn't lost a single man. By this time, most of the town's populace had also gathered near the bridge to witness the battle. This was good, Severus thought. As the townsfolk are witnessing this, Rome's image might increase in their mind and they support our rule here. But that wasn't of concern, for now, they must punish those who were captured and clean up this bloody mess on the bridge. The next morning the previous day after the battle was spent by the Romans permanently establishing themselves on the island. Sasuke hadn't incurred any serious injuries and was quickly out of bed, thanks to the Roman physicians who were best at treating wounds and injuries. After spending another night in Tazuna's home, they were ready to leave. Currently, Maximus and Team 7 were briskly walking towards the exit after meeting Tazuna's family and some other townsfolk who came to see them. Kakashi was ahead of everyone else. It was currently about 8 in the morning, if they traveled at a fast pace they could get back to Konoha before the evening. As the squad passed through the town square, they could see a lot of activity was going on. People were crowding the square, all cheering and shouting at what was happening. What's going on? Naruto casually asked with his arms crossed behind his head. Kakashi tried to glance over the crowd and then spoke. We've got a lot of time, let's see what's going on. Sasuke, Sakura, and Maximus were also curious and happy to oblige. As the team squeezed its way through the crowd, they reached a certain distance from where they could see the proceedings. A wooden platform was built in the middle, with two large wooden pillars in the center. The old Yakuza boss Gato was tied there his hands bound with chains tied to the poles, while his old and frail body seemed to hang on the chains. There were also two Roman soldiers on the platform, as well as Severus. The people were booing at the Yakuza and throwing insults, while some even tried to hurl pebbles and stones in his direction. The Roman commander let it all slide, and after a while as the crowd had calmed down a bit, he acted. Severus raised a hand in the air, commanding the people to be silent. Perhaps it was the authoritative manner that emitted from his character, or it was the soldiers. But whatever the reason, the crowd obeyed and there was almost complete silence. As everything went silent, Severus cleared his throat and prepared to speak. He spoke calmly but loudly to the crowd gathered around the platform. People of the land of waves, witness how the Roman Republic looks after you people. Here we have detained the criminal, thug, and mafia boss Gatto, who has tormented the people of this island for long enough. So now, I ask you, what shall be done with him? There was a brief moment of complete silence. Then, a voice was raised from among the crowd. Crucify him. As the words rang out throughout the crowd, other people also started shouting. Yes, crucify him. Then more, and more, and all of a sudden the entire mass of people was shouting the same thing in a chorus. Gatto had a helpless look on his face, knowing that death was now imminent. Severus commanded the people to be silent one more time, then spoke calmly. Crucifixion it is then. Loud cheers came from the crowd as the two soldiers on the platform unbuckled Gatto's chains, and roughly dragged him by the arms down the platform, toward another place. As this was going on, Maximus whispered something in Kakashi's ear. The latter gave a nod and spoke to his students. We should get going now. The Genin's faces were somewhat disappointed, as they wanted to see more but still obeyed. Twenty minutes later the team was walking down the dirt forest path, the island of waves and the bridge were still visible. On the path itself, signs of the battle with Zabuza the other day were still visible. The sun was shining brightly now, and it was hot. Even Naruto took off his warm jumpsuit and was carrying it in his arms. 
As the squad continued, Sasuke curiously asked Maximus. What is this, crucifixion? Maximus first glanced at Sasuke and the others, then at Kakashi, seemingly asking for permission. The masked ninja gave a slight nod while walking, Maximus began to explain. It is a form of execution, punishment. A smaller wooden pole is first tied to a larger pole horizontally to resemble a cross. Then the victim is laid on the cross, both his hands are, nailed, to either side of the horizontal pole, while his legs are also nailed to the pole. Then, the cross is raised and planted vertically on the ground with the victim still nailed to it. The person suffers a painful death, either perishing because of blood loss or thirst. All the while, soldiers occasionally impale him with a spear or hit at his legs with a club. Sasuke seemed a bit intrigued by this, while his teammates were surprised. But, isn't that painful? Sakura asked sheepishly, Maximus replied in an obvious manner, of course, that's the whole point of execution. It is a punishment for the gravest of crimes. After this, the journey was mostly uneventful, with the squad walking and resting alternately until they reached Kona. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.